Welcome to our comprehensive course on learning HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, where you'll gain the skills you need to build modern and responsive web applications by creating fun and engaging projects. Our course is designed to provide you with hands-on experience, teaching you how to code web applications from scratch using the latest web technologies, HTML5, CSS3, and vanilla JavaScript. This way, you'll fully understand each concept and be able to practice your newly acquired skills without resorting to copy-pasting. No prior knowledge of HTML, CSS, or JavaScript is required, as we will guide you through each syntax and explain every step in detail. Our course is suitable for both beginners and experienced programmers. If you are new to coding or want to brush up on your skills, our course is perfect for you. We believe that learning should be fun and engaging, which is why we've created a set of modern, super cool and engaging projects that you'll build throughout the course. Each project is independently created from scratch and you can choose which ones to work on based on your interests. Our course includes separate videos for each technology so you can easily learn and focus on the areas that interest you the most. For example, if you're primarily interested in JavaScript, you can skip the HTML and CSS sections and dive right into the JavaScript videos. To help you practice and review the projects you'll be building, we've included a valuable resource, the 100JS Projects website. This website features both the source code and live demos of all the projects covered in this course, serving as an excellent reference point that will help you compare your work with the final website. I'm Sehan, and I'm a web developer with over 16 years of experience. Throughout the course, I'll be your guide, answering any questions you may have and providing valuable feedback to help you become a proficient web developer. Are you ready to dive into the exciting world of web development? Join us today and start building super amazing websites. Welcome back to another project. In this project, we are going to create a weather app. As you can see from the final version of the project, we have an input and a button saying get weather. If we write down a name of the uh, city that we want to check the weather, for example, I write down London. When we click on the get weather or press enter, we are going to get the data related to this city, including the icon related to the, for example, the forecast of the weather, which can be cloudy, sunny, or etc. We get the temperature and we also get the description overcast clouds in particular for the London. And then we get some other data like the, the temperature for feels like, humidity, speed, and the wind speed. For example, we can test for another city like Sydney. So as you can see, the Sydney, the city's temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. And also the other things uh, I've added to this project is the error handling. For example, if you write down a city that is not existed, for example, you make uh, some a spelling mistake and click the get weather you get an error saying an error happened please try again later so we're gonna use JavaScript to first fetch data from an open weather API to get the data related to the cities and then we're going to uh, check if the data is okay we're gonna show it otherwise we're gonna uh, pass an error saying that an error occurred. So we're going to learn how to try and catch and fetch data and catch the error. In the next section, we're going to start working on the project's HTML file. So see in the next section. All right, let's start our project. I have put the final version here for our comparison. Uh, as you can see, we have a weather app 
with the input for the city and the button here. The first things we need to do to create this application in this section is to create an HTML file. So we need to go and open the Visual Studio Code. This is my uh, favorite text editor. But you, you are free to use any text editor you are familiar with. And here we click on the file to create a new folder. I would like to create the project in my desktop, so I, I'm going to click on desktop here. I create a new folder and I call it weather app, which is the name of our application. So weather dash app, we press enter and here we can click on the select folder to select the folder. This is going to create a new, open a new web Visual Studio code. Let me close the previous, the extra one here. So this is good. Now our project is in this folder, weather dash app. Then now uh, it's completely empty, but we can start creating our HTML file by clicking on this icon to create a new file, or you can right click and click on new file to create a new file and we call it index.html. And here we can close the uh, welcome tab as well. We have the HTML file now, but it is completely empty, but we can use an exclamation mark like this to get a boilerplate suggestion from Emmet abbreviations. As you can see, we are getting this suggestion by just clicking on the uh, exclamation mark. So as you can see, now we have the boilerplate, which includes the doc time at the top, which uh, actually tells the browser which version of HTML the code is written in. For example, if you want to, because we are using HTML5, we just need to leave HTML here inside the tag. Then everything else is covered by an HTML tag. And here the length attribute defines the language of the page. And as we are using English, we're going to keep it EN, but you can change it based on your local language and the language that you're going to use inside your uh, website. Inside the HTML tag, we have two tags, which includes the head tag and the body tag. The head tags contains the metadata, uh, metadata and the title. The first metadata tag is for the chart set attribute, which uh, sets the characteristics of the website. UTF-8 is recommended by HTML5 because it nearly contains all the characters and symbols. So the users that are using our website won't have any problem seeing the symbols and characters in our website because this one nearly contains all of them. Then we have a uh, compatibility metadata tag which is for users who are still using Internet Explorer. So this is going to tell the browser to use the recent rendering engine for the Microsoft Edge for the Internet Explorer browsers. And the next metadata tag is a viewport metadata tag, which sets the width of the screen to be the device's width. For example, the if you're looking at the website by your mobile, you're going to see a different width in the, in the website uh, while 
you're using a different device like a desktop, laptop, or tablet. And here we see the initial scale level, which is the initial zoom level of the browser, and it is set to be 100%. And you can change it, for example, to 80% or anything you prefer. And here we see the title of the page, which is going to be appeared on the top of the tab section of the browser, so which is set to be document. So let's see this one inside the browser. So we can use the extension, a live uh, server. If you haven't installed it, I highly recommend you install this extension live server when you have this one you see a uh, go live under here inside your visual studio code if you press on that this is going to automatically open the this page inside the browser and it is going to refresh this page based on the changes you do inside your application and you need to actually uh, activate the auto save in your um, Visual Studio to see the changes after you do your uh, changes in your in your coding and see it here. As you can see, the title is document now. We can change the this one by changing this title. I'm going to change it to the name of our project, which is Weather App. And now if you check the title, it's, it is changed to weather app. So let's bring this one, uh, our website to the right side. And before going doing that, I'm going to show you what we are doing, what we are going to do here inside the final version. So we're going to have a container here. Let me search for something, for example, I search for London, I press get weather. It is shown the result here. I'm going to show you and break it down. So we have a container. So let me change the color, you can see it better. So we have a div with a class of container that is covering everything inside our application. Then we have a title, an H1 tag here at the top. Then we have a form, which includes two inputs here. One is the London, the input here, and also we have a button. So, and this is a form. And after that, we have a div, another div. There is another div here, which is covering the icon. So let me show you here. So this is the icon section. Then we have the temperature and then we have the description. And finally, we have another div for the details, which includes the different details like a uh, what feels like humidity and wind speed. So we're gonna the ex exactly structure our HTML file based on these divs. So we have a div with a class of container here, and then we have the title form, and then we have another div which includes four other divs, one, two, three, and four. And the last one is going to have three more divs inside it. So let's start doing that. Let's bring the, our website to the right side so we can see the changes in real time. And let's bring the Visual Studio code on the left side so we can see everything. And we close this section. We don't need it for now. So inside the body section, we're going to uh, if whatever we add inside the body section, we're going to see inside the browser. So I'm going to add a div with a class of container. We just need to write dot and we just write down container. 
And this is going to suggest some abbreviation as well, which is a div with a class of container. And here inside this div, we're going to have an h1 tag saying weather app. Okay, now you see the changes here. And then we're going to have a form. So we just write a form. There's, we don't need an action for the form. And for the form, we're going to have two inputs, one with the type of text and one with the type of submit. Because when we want to click on this button, get weather, we want to submit the form. And also we have this input with the type of text, but the inputs it's going to be by default when we press enter after writing down something is going to submit the form as well. So that's why we are using input. So the first input has the type of text. So you can write down input clone text to create that one. And this is going to have an ID of city input. So for adding the ID, you, you can add a hashtag here or pound sign, and you just write down the name of the ID you want to add. For example, city dash input. So if you press enter, this is going to create an input for you with the type of text. With the idea of city input, we don't need a name for that one, but we're going to have a placeholder. The placeholder is a text that is going to be shown if the input is empty. So we got to uh, just write down, for example, enter city. Okay, like this. So after this input, we're going to have our button. So I'm going to create an input with a class of submit, because when we press on this input, we're going to submit it. And then also we want to have some value for that one. So first we press enter and the value for this one is going to be get weather. Okay, as you can see, this is kind of button now. We can add a button here, but for adding the functionality to the button, we need to add some events listener or something like that. But when you add an input with the type of submit, when we click on it, this is going to submit the form. As you can see, we are refreshing the page. Okay. So we have the form here. Now it's time to add the result section, the weather data. So after the form, I'm going to add another div. This time we just want to add an ID. As you can see, we are getting some suggestion here, which is coming from the extension copilot, GitHub copilot. But uh, it is not free, but it gives you some suggestion. For beginners, I don't recommend you use this uh, extension uh, because it's better to remember the basics of the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript before using. So I'm going to deactivate this one for now so we don't get any results from there. So I'm going to just add an ID of weather data. So you just write down a pound sign weather data, and this is going to create a div for you with the ID of weather data. And here inside this one, we're going to have the icon. We're going to have the temperature, description, and also the details. But for now, I want to add some hard-coded data. So when, 
in the next section when we are using CSS, we can simply style our projects, but we're going to delete them when we are using JavaScript because we want to create this data dynamically using, using JavaScript later. So now after that, we're going to create a div with a class of icon. So we just write down dot icon and inside this icon, we're going to have an image for now. The source of the image, now we're going to hard code some icon from the open API, openweathermap.org. So the address for this one is HTTP clone two forward slash open weather map dot org and forward slash img forward slash wn forward slash zero one d which is the image for the sun and dot png So let's refresh the page. Uh, let's see that if we put it correctly, open weather map dot org uh, forward slash image forward slash WN. And now we can see the sun icon. And for the alternative text, we're going to have weather icon. So if the image is not going to shown, we see this alternative text inside the text. For example, if we, we just uh, make it, for example, this URL is broken, we see the weather icon instead. Okay. So we have the IMG here. We have the image. Now we're going to have the temperature. So I'm going to create a div with a class of temperature. And inside that, I'm going to just hard code some values, for example, 22 uh, centigrade. So we need to add some. We just write down 22 C for now. We need to add a degree as well. We can have the degree symbol. For example, we can just in Google, we search degree Celsius symbol to copy. If you search on Google, you can just copy it from here and then you can just paste it here. Okay. If you don't have it inside, you can, you cannot find it. Okay. So we have the 20, uh, uh, two degrees centigrade hard coded. As I mentioned before, we're going to get these data dynamically using JavaScript and open API uh, website. So after this div, you're going to have another div for the description. So I'm going to just add description here. And for the cont uh, for having something inside, we just write down sunny for now. After that, we're going to have another div for the details. So the class for this one is going to say details. And finally, inside this div, we're going to have three more divs. We just write there, we don't need a class for this one. And then this, the first one is just say feels like, we can just say 20, you copy this one. This is going to be, for example, 23. And let's add another div, which is going to say humidity equals 40%. And the last one is going to be another div just saying 
wind speed and this is going to be for example 5 meter per second so we have hard coded some data here you can see if I zoom it a little bit now we have completed the HTML part of the project so we can use these hard-coded data. So in the next section, we can just install our projects like the final version using CSS. So see you in the next section for the CSS part of the project. All right, in the last section, we have completed the HTML part of the project. In this section, we're going to solve the project using CSS and we make it similar to the final version with the container, with the box shadow. We're going to design this input and a button. And also we make it similar to this, and uh, which is a modern design. The first things we need to do is to create a CSS file inside the Visual Studio Code. I'm going to open the Explorer section using Ctrl Shift E, or you can just go to View and open the Explorer section, Ctrl Shift E. And here we can create a new file and we just call it a style.css. So this is a folder, so uh, let's delete this. We need to create a file. So we just call it style.css. As you can see, it is, it is completely empty, but first, uh, before using the CSS, you need to add a link to the CSS file within the HTML file. So we need to come back to H index.html and inside the hit tag, just after the title, you can add a link tag, you just write down link and you can click on the third auto suggestion, the one with the CSS, which is going to create a relationship between the HTML file and this style sheet, which is the solid CSS. And here the destination of the file, the address href is style.css because both files are located at the same directory. So you just, we, we just say style.css. So now we can use the style.css in our project. So uh, the first things I, I usually do is to uh, start uh, styling the body section of the project. I'm gonna create some background color, some we're going to change uh, the margin and also the font family. So we just need to target the body section. We just say body. We add a set of curly braces. The first things we need to do is to remove the default margin, which is going to help us to easily achieve our styling. So I'm going to set the margin to zero. And this is going to reset the default margin for us. And then we can use some fonts for our alt text inside the website. Uh, the font I want to use is called Mont Serif. So we just write down mon, uh, font family. And we're going to search for Mont Serif if there is no in the suggestion. You can just put a string and just write down mont serif. And if this font is not available, so you, you need to have some backup font as well. So I want to use sense serif if this one is not available. So this is going to check first for your, for the user. If it has this uh, font, it is going to use it, otherwise it's going to use the second one. So now after that, I want to change the background color. 
I want to set a light gray background color. So we just need to have a hash or hashtag or pound sign. And we just write down F7, 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 which is a kind of a light gray color. So let's test and see our website. As you can see, the background color is not white anymore. Let's bring this one to the right side so you can see the changes in real time. Let's bring the VS Code on the left side and let's close the Explorer section so we have more space here. So we have the background color and we have finished styling the body section. We have removed the margin and we don't have any space here. Without this, this actually margin zero, you're going to have some space here as you can see. Okay, so after that, we're going to style the container. Inside the HTML file, we have a div with a class of container, which is covering everything else. We're going to target this one because it is a class. We can just target that one inside CSS using dot container. So we just add a dot with the name of the uh container with the name of the class so simply we can target that div with a class of container so let's change the background color so we can see the changes easier so we set the white background color for this container i'm going to use fff which is which stands for the white as you can see now, the container has a different color here. And uh, after that, I want to add some box shadow for that. So this is going to add some shadow effect to the container. So I'm going to just use box shadow, which has uh, four parameters for us to set. Zero for the x axis and then we have zero for the y axis and then we're going to have 20 pixels blurness so this is going to blur at the top and bottom you can see that the shadow but the shadow is quite dark i want it to be lighter so you can just set the color using rgba which is stands for red, green, blue, and alpha, which is going to create a color from red, green, blue, and alpha values. Alpha means the opacity. So RGBA has four parameters. First, we set the red, blue, and uh, green. I think it was red, blue, and green. And then we set it to be zero which gives us the black color. And then we just set the 0.2 for the opacity, which is 20% opacity. So you can see the nicer shadow here. We're going to have some margin at the top. Margin is a space we can add. So we're going to add some space at the top outside the container, which is going to be 50 pixels. So it's, this is going to push it a little bit down. And uh, we can set everything and bring everything to the center using text align center. This is going to bring the, everything to the center like this. I want to add some margin to the left and right as well. So we just set it margin for the up and down. I want to set it to be zero in the, in a big screen. As you can see, the container is completely covered everything, but I want to have it uh, a 
some a maximum width. So we just add a max dash width actually to set it to be 600 pixels. So this is going to have a maximum of 600 pixels, which is going to um, uh, have this kind of width. But this is actually bring this one to the left side, but we want it to be in the center. What we do here is to set the margin up and down zero, but we can use auto to bring it to the center for the X and Y. So here, this is the top and bottom. This is for the left and right. So for the left and right, we make it auto margin. So this is going to create some margin. And in the mobile size, we're gonna just connect it to the wall. That is fine. The other things I wanted to add is some border radius. We want to add a rounded corners to the container. So we just add a border dash radius, this one. We just want to add some uh, five pixels. So this is going to add some uh, border here, the rounded corner, as you can see. Let's decrease the size again. So after that, we're going to have, so I think that's it for the container part. We don't need to do anything else. Or we can add some padding as well. So we, we're gonna bring it more down. So we're gonna add padding padding is going to add a space inside the container. As you can see, the text is just connected to the top. So we can just add 20 pixels for the padding, which is going to bring it exactly, uh, push them a little bit inside. So this margin top is not working because we have a margin here whatever comes first has the comes next actually later has the priority if you bring up this margin this is going to have the margin top important so this is going to apply this margin top as well otherwise this is going to apply the next one which is margin zero auto all right so now we have the space at the top here you can see this is aligned very well the next things we need to uh, style is this uh, form we have here so after the container i'm going to target the form because the form is just a tag it doesn't have any class or id we can just simply write down form to target that So I want to use the, the flex bus for the layout. So we're going to change the display to flex. This is going to bring these two next to each other. So now we have this actually uh, form. It is flex. They are next to each other. But when we have a, a smaller screen, we want to have it on top of each other. So we're going to have some uh, media query to fix that one later but for now we just uh, set the display to flex we can bring everything to the center now using justified content center for bringing the children horizontally in the center so we center the children horizontally and also we can uh, center the children vertically using align items center. So in the X axis, justify content work for the Y axis, the align items to just bring them next to each other and center them because later we want to change the size of the button. So this is going to be uh, in a different 
position. So we're going to center them using these two lines of code. And then I want to add some margin at the bottom of 20. This is going to add some space at the bottom of the form. So we have installed the form. Now it's time to install the inputs separately. So how we target the input, because both of the inputs have the same tag name. So if we just write down, for example, form input, we're going to target and style both of them similarly. But there is a way, as you can see, the type of this input is text. The type of the other one is submit. We can simply target these two inputs separately we just say form and then we're going to target the first input which has the type of text. So we're going to write down like this. This is going to target that. Uh, this, is, should, this should be an equal sign. And then now whatever is styling we add, this is going to be applied in the first input, which has the type of text. So now I want to add some padding, which is going to add the padding in the alt size, 10 pixels, which is going to push, as you can see now. Now, as you can see, the size of the inputs are different. For example, if you don't have the al align item center, as you can see, it's uh, different. This is going to uh, style the other one too. So it is necessary to uh, have uh, this, uh, make them align and centralize them vertically. And after the padding, we're going to remove the border of the input. We just use border 10 pixels. Sorry, we're going to remove it. So we're going to say border noun. So this uh, most for most of the modern website, they don't use border. And also they don't use this uh, outline. So when we click on it, you see a line around it. So we're going to remove that one as well using outline none too. So now when we click on it, we don't see the line around the input. After that, I want to add some border. Uh, I want to add some font, actually change the font size. So I'm going to increase the size of the font using font size to 18 pixels, which is going to increase the size. And whatever we write here, it's bigger now. And we set the width of this input to be 60%. So we have completed the styling the input section the, with the type of text. Now we can just install the button here, which has, which is an input, which is an input with a type of submit. So we can target that one. Let's first save this one. And then we can just say form with, we want to target the input with a type of submit and this is going to be first thing first I want to change the background color to be zero 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 seven BFF sorry BFF which is going kind of blue color. And then we set the color of the text in a white color, 
which is if, 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 then we can remove the border using border none. And finally, we can just add some padding so we can add some space around the text. So in the top and bottom, I want to have 10 pixels. And for the left and right, I want to have 20 pixels. And let's add some border radius. So we add some uh, corner, uh, rounded corner. So we just say border dash radius. And we're going to set this one to be, for example, 5 pixels. Okay, so you can see the round, rounded corner here. And let's set the font size for the submit button text as well, which is going to be font font dash size. So I will have to bring this one a little bit off to see the suggestion. Font size is going to be 18 pixels. So we make it bigger. We set the cursor to be pointer, which is going to change the cursor to pointer on hover. So we just, for example, we just say cursor to be pointer. When we hover over it, we see a pointing hand. And we set the outline to be none as well. So this is going to help when we click on it. This is not going to show an outline. And uh, so that's it. But when we hover over it, I want to change the color of it. So we can easily target that one. We just say form input with the type of submit. And we're going to target the hover effect. So we're going to add a colon and just say hover. And here we can just change the background color to be different color, which is 0062 and CC. So now when we hover over it, you see a darker color, but this is a kind of fast changing, uh, we can just add some transition here inside this form. We can just add a transition and we're going to uh, have the transition to the background color. With the uh, 0.3 seconds and with the ease effect. So now when we hover over it, you see it, the color change is a kind of smooth, not suddenly. So that was it for the, this input sections, the form section. And uh, we're gonna make them actually on top of each other in the mobile size. But we're going to do the responsiveness at the end. So just uh, we install the other parts like this icon or other parts. And later we're going to make them responsive. So let's target this icon. If you look at the HTML file, the icon is a div with a class of icon. So we can target that one. We just say dot icon. And this is going to, I want to change the image size. So we can target the image inside. So we just say dot icon image. And this is going to, we got to set the width to be 100 pixels. We set the height to be 100 pixels as well. We're going to set 
a margin we're gonna bring it to the center but we don't need it it's actually is inside the center and if the icon is different for example it's a bit different uh, for example this one is completely rounded but some of them are different for example here this is just a cloud so we're gonna add some background for example background size i want to make it contain if for example this one is a bit uh, different size this is going to zoom the level to fit it within the container so actually this one should be inside the, this icon and I think that that is fine the contain and then we just change the background repeat this is going to prevent the repeating of the pay uh, image we just set it to be no repeat and then we're gonna change the background position to be in the center both uh, horizontally and vertically so when we have a different icons you can see the effects but for the uh, sun icon we don't see the effect much so that was it for the icon the next one things we want to style is this temperature so we can target that div with the class of temperature we just say dot temperature I think it's okay. Temperature. And uh, we just make it bigger by changing its font size to be, for example, 48 pixels. And then we want to make it bold. So we just change the font weight to be bold. And also we can just change the margin for that one. So we add a margin, 20 pixels up and bottom and then zero for the left and right. I think it looks, it looks nice. Let's see the final version yet. Yeah, we have the similar one. And then after that, we're going to target the description, which is this sunny word. So this is going to be dot description. The things I want to do first, I want to change the font size. to be for example 24 pixels and let's add some margin at the bottom of 20 pixels this one it looks okay and finally we're gonna have these three sections First thing first, I want to install the div that is surrounding them, which is the div with a class of details. And then we're going to target the divs inside it. So first we target that one. We just say details. We want to bring them next to each other. We just say display. Flex. And then we want to center them like a, we just say justify content center to center them horizontally. And we can use align item center to center them vertically. And then we can use flex wrap, wrap. This is going to allow the children, which is these three divs, to wrap 
onto a new line if needed. For example, if there is no space here, for example, they're, they're going to go to the next line. So this is going to make them responsive. Uh, you cannot see it yet. Let me install this one. Oh, in the final version, maybe you can see. For example, if you zoom a little bit, you can see now we have two div on, on, uh, on the first line and one div in the next one. If you zoom more, you see they are on top of each other. So this is the flex wrap wrap. So this is going to automatically make this one responsive for us. So in a different size, you see them on top of each other or next to each other. So let's uh, install the div. We can target them simply using this technique. So we just say detail, dot details. And we want to target all the divs here. So we're going to add this sign, a uh, great sign greater than sign, and then we just say div. This is going to target all the divs inside these details. And then we're going to have a padding of 20 pixels, so which is going to add some padding inside the div. So now we can see it, see them differently. And Let's change their background color so you can see the changes better. So the changes, uh, the background color is F1, 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 which is kind of uh, similar to the background color we have for the website. And then also we want to add some a space between them, which we can achieve with changing the margin to 10 pixels. We, as you can see, this one didn't just go to the end a space. We can just change the flex to one, which is going to use the remaining available space for the div. So now that they came to next to each other, if you zoom it, you see that these two are next to each other. They have the space, they fill out the space, and also this one is uh, filling the space too. This is kind of nice design. Okay, so this is the flex one. This is going to use the remaining available space for each div, and then we're going to add some border radius, five pixels, which is going to add some rounded corner for them. And then we can just uh, use text align center. So, so we bring the text inside them exactly in the center. And finally, we can set some mean height. I want to just set the mean height to be 45 pixels. So at least they're uh, kind of be in the same position, especially when we have a bigger screen, they have the same size for the height. And so after that, we're going to center everything inside. I think that is not necessary for them because they are already in the center. Okay. Looks fine. Now we want to just, uh, the things we want to do, we want to just add some a styling for the, for example, this. Uh, I think that is fine for everything that we have done. It's completely okay. Now, we want to add some other things like media query. We want to bring these inputs on top of each other in the mobile size. So now we can just target them. We just want to change the size. 
we just uh, write down media here. We just say for the sizes less than 768 pixels. We just say max width of 768 pixels. Do the following. So now this is for the mobile size. So max width, not max width. Okay. Now we want to target the form first. We just say change the flex direction instead of row to column. So bring them on top of each other if the size is less than 768 pixels. So after that, they're going to be next to each other like this. But they are not uh, actually in a good position. We're going to change the other things as well. For example, I want this input to cover all the page. So we can target that input using a form. The input with the type of text. And this one should be equal. And we're going to set the width to be 100%. So this is going to come here. And also I want to have some margin at the bottom of 10 pixels. So we're going to have some space between them this way too. So now after this size, we're going to see them in next to each other. Okay. This is the way you can make a responsive website using media query. Uh, the Flexbox actually helps you to make a responsive website like this one too. So let's check everything. So everything looks okay. So that was it for creating and creating the CSS file and styling the project. In the next section, we're going to add the functionality. So for example, we can just write down the name of the city, get the weather, show it here. The, we get the dynamic result. And we're going to fill these things using JavaScript. So see you in the next section for the JavaScript part of the project. All right, in the last section, we have completed the CSS part of the project. In this section, we're going to work on the functionality and create the JavaScript file of the project. The first thing we need to do is to create a JavaScript file inside the Visual Studio Code. We can open the Explorer section using Ctrl Shift E and here we can cre create a new file and we can call it index or script.js. Before using the JavaScript file, we need to add a link to the this file inside the HTML file. So just after, just before the end of the body section, we need to add it because we need the uh, website to be loaded first in the browser and then we can add functionality to it because otherwise we cannot read the elements inside the JavaScript. So we need to here add a script tag. Here you can see script tag with the SRC and for the source, as both files are located at the same directory, we just need to have index.js for the SRC. This is going to add the JavaScript file here and read that file. So now we can just start creating the JavaScript file. As we are using the open weather API, we need to first get our API key from the open weather 
map API. So we need to go to their website, register and get our API key. It is totally free for the developers and they give you some free tiers. So the things you need to do is to go to uh, weather, open weather, open, you just search open weather map and in the search results we need to go to openweathermap.org current weather and forecast open weather map and then you can check their API here so we just accept their cookie they can and then here you need to sign in with uh, your Gmail or any email account you need to make an account if you don't have an account you need to create it otherwise you can just sign in with your account let me quickly sign in with my account as you can see I have signed in with my account so here you can click on this arrow icon and just click uh, to see your API keys here you click on the my API keys and then here you can see your API keys I have already created some API key for myself before but if you want to create a new one you just put the name of the API key for example you just say weather app or weather or whatever you just write down something and generate it and this is going to generate you a new API key you need to activate it but you have to wait a few minutes until this one get activated so if you just now use it probably doesn't work so you need to wait at least I think half an hour and then test your application so I'm gonna use my uh, one of my old API keys so I'm sure they're working now so I'm gonna copy this one come back to Visual Studio Code and here I'm gonna create a new constant called API key I just equal it to and put it inside the set of code and put it here now we can use it in our application so we need to get some of the elements inside the HTML including this uh, weather data we need to manipulate all the information here and substitute it with the one that we have uh, we were gonna create and get from the API so I'm gonna bring this one the weather data so let's first bring this element here as we know the ID it's very simple we just want to put a name for it we just call it weather it should be camel case weather data you can just say weather data element and this is going to be equal to document we're gonna target all the document and we can use uh, the method called get element by ID and here we're gonna add the ID that we have which is weather data now we have access to this element and we got it and brought it inside the JavaScript the next element that we need is that input this input we want to have the uh, data inside this input city input because we want to get the information inside the input and based on this information we're going to uh, request for the API for example if the city is London we're going to request for London so let's copy this ID as well and we, we bring it here so I'm gonna call this city input element 
and this is going to be equal to document. This is very similar. The document dot get element by ID and the ID is going to be city inputs. All right, so now we have the weather data element, the city input element. The next things we need to have is this form because we want to add an event listener to this form. So anytime we submit the form, we want to trigger a function. We want to trigger a function which is going to get the data from the API. So the form doesn't have any ID or class. We can directly target that one using a method called query selector. So we're just going to create another constant. We call it form element and this is going to be equal to document because we want to target all the document inside the browser and then we can use the method called query selector and the, the query we want to select is the form. So we need to add a quote and we just say form. Okay, now we have the things we need. The first things we need to do is to add the event listener to this form. So we're going to trigger a function based on that. So it's very simple. We need to add a method called add event listener, which is going to be trigger or it's going to trigger a function when the form is submitted. So I'm going to show you how to do it. So first we need to target that form element and then we just add an add event listener. And this one, we the event we want to listen is submit. So we just write down submit here. And when the submit happens, we want to uh, trigger a function. So we're going to create an arrow function here. And this function is going to get the event. Event, what is event? Whatever inside the form submission happened, it, it, we get the data here using this event. For example, all the inputs, for example, the this input, we can get the value of this input, whatever you write down here using, for example, event, uh, for example, event dot, uh, it, it comes with the information, for example, but if the, for example, event comes from the inputs, you can get the value. The, the things you get from here is some, for example, you can use for preventing the submission. So when you for, uh, submit the form here, for example, when you submit the form, you can see the page is refreshed refreshing. This is the default behavior of the form. It's going to refresh the page, but we want, we don't want the page to be refreshed. So we can prevent this one easily using event dot prevent default. So we're going to use this method. Now, when we submit, you see there is no refresh in the page. So now what we want to do is to get the information inside this form. As I mentioned before, we can just get it. We have the input element. We can target its value and get that one. So we create a constant. We call it, for example, city value. And this is going to be equal to the city input element that we got. And we're going to target its value. OK, 
Okay. So we got this value. Let me show you inside the console log. So we're going to console log the CT value. So now, for example, if I go to the website, I open the console using F12. And here you just go to console. And for example, whatever I write down here, for example, I just say London. When I click on get weather, you see the London is logging, it is being logged inside the console. Whatever I write down, it's going to be there. So we have access to the information of the input. Now we can use this input, this city value, we pass it to a function and then from the function we're going to uh, fetch the data from the API. So I'm going to call a function here and I'm going to call it for example get weather data and going to pass this city value. So I'm going to, uh, but we need to f create this function because this function is not existed yet. So we create a function called get weather data, which is going to get this city value, which is coming from here. And then this is going to do some, some things for us. For example, we can get the information from the API or etc. So for uh, fetching from the API, the best way to do it is to use a try and catch method. Try and catch method actually acts as the information from the API. If the request is correct, it's going to get the data. If the data doesn't come in any situation, we, we can understand it by catching the error. That's why we use try and cache. So we can just write down try cache, a statement, we get the suggestion. This is going to try to get the data from the API and then we cache the error if possible error happens. For example, the API is not working or the city we write down is, is not, uh, does not exist. So we, we can easily understand it by catching the error. Now we want to create a request to the open weather API to get the weather data for, for example, a specific city. So what we do here is to create a constant and we're just going to call it response. And this is going to uh, be fetch the data from the API, but as we need to wait, the result comes and then we go to the next line. So we're going to use a wait here. What a wait does, uh, it's going to wait until the response come and then goes to the next line and doesn't pre prevent the code to, to read the next line. So and then we're going to use a fetch method and we're going to use backtick here. Backtick is the one that is located on the top of the tab key on Windows and uh, we're going to create this uh, API request because th this is going to be dynamic based on the city. We need to have a backtick to write down a dynamic URL. So we're going to write down the URL, which is HTTPS clone to forward slash API dot open weather map dot org. So it's going to say open. weather
map.org and then we're going to add forward slash this is going to uh, you have to be careful for the url if you make a mistake you're going to get the, an error so data forward slash 2.5 which is the version of the api and then we're just going to say weather Weather, and then we add a question mark because we want to add the query. The query is going to be Q, and the Q is going to be the city. So you need to add a dollar sign because we want to have a variable here. And the variable we want to use is city value. So we add the city value here. So the query each time it would be different. For example, London, Sydney, or any city you search. So you're going to uh, put it inside the queue now and then after that we need to pass the API ID which is what we got from here. So you need to add a dollar uh, and sign. The first one you need a question mark. After that any parameter you add to the uh, URL should start with the and sign and then you just say API ID uh, sorry a app ID app ID equal and then you're gonna add the another variable using dollar sign a set of curly braces and this one is going to be API key and finally we can just uh, say they use the unit for example, another and, and then for the units, I want to use metric. Metric is going to give you the centigrade instead of Fahrenheit. If you, uh, and then, so now this is completed. As we are using a weight, and a weight I said the reason is because we are fetching data, we need to wait for the response come and then go to the next line. As we are using as a weight, we cannot use a normal function. We need to use a synchronous function. So you need to just say a sync function. So this is going to work. A synchronous function is a function that has some delay in some lines using a weight. So after getting the response, first we check. First we check if the response is okay or you can say like that if the response is not okay the re the meaning of okay means if the response brings back the not error any error for example 404 error if the ch we check the response from the api is not okay if it's not okay we're going to throw an error throw a new error error is a function from the javascript and then this is going to be network response was not okay so we're going to pass this error so if the, the response is not okay, we're going to pass uh, send this error. This is going to show inside your console. And then uh, this is the format it comes, the response. We want to parse this one to JSON that we can use it. This is not a usable uh, information. We need to parse this one from the API as a JSON. So we, what we do here is we create another constant and we call it data. And this is going to be equal to await because we need to wait until the response converted to JSON. So we just say raise a response dot JSON. And we need to pass a parenthesis to call this function, to call this method. 
So this is going to convert the response to data. Now we can just uh, we can just get the data and show it. For example, I can now console log data. So let's go back to Visual Studio Code and we are in the console. Let's refresh the page. Now we just write down London plus get weather. As you can see, we got the data, which includes, if you can see first, the card is 200. It means that the response is okay. 200 means okay. 404 is a, an error. Okay, this is kind of basic. You uh, slowly you understand what is error, what is okay. As you can see, the city name is London, and now we have some information here, which we can get from inside this weather. And the weather inside the weather, we're gonna get the description, which is overcast clouds. We get the icon. If you remember, the icon was sun before. But this one can be cloudy or anything else. The main is cloud. And also we have the wind information, the uh, speed, the degree. And uh, we can use this information to fill out this here. For example, we can get the centigrade. Let me find the centigrade. So the centigrade or the temperature is going to be inside the data uh, here main and here you can see the temperature which is 5.662 uh, centigrade so if you try for a different city for example I try Sydney this is going to give you another data with a different for example the Sydney weather is uh, different now. It's a broken cloud. And uh, this is the icon that is giving us. And also for the temperature, the temperature is 23 centigrade. So max and mean we can get the pressure, humidity. And 66% uh, feels like 24. So all this information that we need to fill our website, it's available inside the response. So now I want to show you how to replace these things with this information. So we can simply uh, fill them. So we got the data here. Now the time is to fill our website with this one. For example, we first we create a constant. We call it temperature, for example. And this is going to be equal to data dot main. As I mentioned, as I show you, this was inside the main and dot temp. But this is like a 26 point something. But I don't want this format. We can make it rounded using a math, a math here. Uh, we just use the round method. And we put this one inside this. And this is going to, for example, if it's 22.1, it's going to be 22. Okay. So after the temperature, I think I made a mistake for the temperature. It's this is A. Yeah. Temperature. Okay. And uh, after that, we're gonna have the uh, description. So we just write down description. It can be anything. This is just a name. Uh, description. This is going to be equal to data we get, and this is inside the weather. 
Um, it's inside the first array. Because uh, it's, it's an array, we need to target the first one. We want this one information. This is inside the description. And finally, we're going to get the icon. which is going to be data. This is similar data that where first array, first element of the array, and then this is going to be icon. So, and then we're gonna have the details. For example, the what feels like the humidity and the wind speed. So we're gonna create another constant, but this constant is going to be an array. So we create an constant and we call it details and this is going to be equal to an array and this array is going to be dynamic so I'm gonna add some backtick here and then we just say feels like and this is going to be equal to a dollar sign because we want to add a variable here and we get the data feels like I can copy this one and then I want to make it rounded too because this is a kind of temperature too but instead of temp we're going to get the feels underline like okay after that the next element of this array is going to be humidity so we add the back tick we just say humidity humidity which is going to be equal to i think we can get this one here we put in the dollar sign curly braces and this is going to be data main and it's inside the humidity. Okay. And the last element is going to be, let me copy this one. The last element is going to be the wind speed. Which is going to be data that main, uh, it's not main data that wind dot a speed so I've, I have shown you that how to see this data and we know which one is which one so now we have temperature description icon and details now we can fill the our website with this information so we need to target that weather data weather data element which is here this weather data element has many things inside it. It has, for example, the icon. We can target this with a class of icon and then we replace it with this image. And then we can just target the temperature, replace this one, target this one, and then finally we target these details and then fill it with these details that we have here. So what we do here, we just tar uh, target that weather data element and then we can use the query selector to target that class here. For example, we want to target this class, this icon. We can simply just say dot query selector and here we're going to select that uh, one using dot because this is a class we need to add a dot and we just say icon and this is going to get that element now we want to substitute the inside with an image tag we can use a method called inner html so this is going to change the html inside this element and this is going to be equal to because this is dynamic, we need to add a back tick and we just create that image. So I'm gonna, uh, we can simply copy this image tag here and put it here. 
and this just changes. So we have the image tag, which is which has the source HTTP openweathermap.org forward slash image WN, but this is going to be dynamic zero uh, one D. So instead of zero one D, we're gonna uh, add a dollar sign instead of curly braces. And this is going to be the icon that we get here, this icon. So I'm going to copy this one, put it here. And the alternative is OK. So now, uh, maybe we can see the results now. So the icon is now sun. Let's change this one to London. And we get the weather. And now the icon is cloud. OK, you see the icon is dynamic now. Let's try another city, for example, with this search for with something easy like a uh, Paris. So as you can see, the Paris is uh, now night and sunny. All right. Now uh, it's moon, actually. I don't know. Okay. So we have created this uh, image tag dynamic the next things we want to do is the temperature that is very similar things we need to do we can just copy this one weather element dot query and instead of the, this icon we just have to say temperature temperature and when we get this element now we want to change the text inside. Instead of saying inner HTML, we can just say text content because we want to change the content of this. We just say text content and this is going to be equal to that uh, temperature. We make it dynamic. We create a variable here which is going to be this temperature we're going to copy this one put it here so the temperature but the, at the end we want to add this uh, centigrade so we can copy this centigrade here so now we have the temperature centigrade so let's see what we get for example london is going to be cloudy so let's try again Let's refresh the page. London. Get the weather. Okay, there's some problem here. I think uh, so. We got this one. Weather data that query selector. Ah, oh, we didn't close this here. Okay. Now we try again. London. Cloudy and six degree centigrade. Okay, it's working. Let's continue and fill other parts, which is this description first. So for the description, it's very similar. Let's copy this one and the query selector we want to target is description. So I'm gonna copy the this description word here. So you know that uh, we're targeting here and then the, this description, temperature, and etc. And we're going to change its uh, text content. Uh, so that text content is going to be equal to the description. So now if we search again for London, this is going to show us the description as well. And the final things we want to do is to completely get and replace all these three. So this is a little bit different because we have an array we want to substitute. We need to map through this array and add it one by one. The first procedure is similar. We need to get the user query selector and target the details. And then here we want to ch uh, change its inner HTML with this 
detail, but we want to one by one put this information inside a div. As you can see from the HTML, each of them is inside a div. So we're going to create, we want to loop through that details using the map method, which is going to give us uh, each detail, each element. So we're going to get each element and this is going to be equal to, we create a backtick and this is going to be a div. So let me copy here. So first I just copy one of these div and put it here. And then instead of just saying fields like 23, we're going to fill this one with this detail that we get. This detail, each detail we get. So now we get each detail and we put it inside the inner HTML. So let's try this. We just say London get as you can see, we got it, but as you can see, we have some problem here, like a comma. Uh, because there we have added that one, we need to join them too. We need to join them because this is just a separate and added by comma. So after this, after creating this, mapping through that, we can join this tree by just uh, nothing in between them because they were joined by the comma we can just join them with nothing so now if you test again we just say sydney and get the weather as you can see it works very well feels like 24 humidity is 67 5 and uh, 3. Point but we don't see that uh, actually. Okay. For the humidity here at the top, you just add uh, the percentage here. So you can get the percentage. And for the wind, we can just add the space here and then we just say meter per second. Okay. Now probably it works better. So let's. For example, test uh, London again. Okay. 33% and then also we get the meter per second. So everything works well, but when we come to the website, we still see these uh, hard code coded data. So we can simply get rid of them. We just go to the HTML file. Uh, Everything inside this app, a uh, weather app, we can just get rid of them. But I want to keep it for your reference. So I just want to comment this one using control forward slash. So now when we come to the website, it is completely empty. But if you search for a city, this is going to. Okay, let's see. Oh, no, sorry. We shouldn't actually comment all of them. We comment. So the things inside, for example, this image, we can just uh, delete these words and actually we can comment all these things inside. So I think this is going to work. So now we just say London and then get better. So as you can see, we get the result correctly, but now there is another thing. So if, for example, if you write down something that doesn't exist, we don't get an, any results, but we don't know what happens here. For example, if we write down a name not correctly, for example, we just say London, doesn't give you the result, but we don't know what happened. So anytime an error happened, we want to show them inside the, this here. As I mentioned here, we are using try and cache. We know that what an error happened. So instead of uh, just showing the previous result, we can just uh, replace them 
and we just give a description saying that, for example, an error happened. Please try again. So, in the error section, we're going to target that weather data uh, element again. We're gonna first target all these things. So I'm gonna copy all of them actually, this is easier. So I'm gonna copy all these things, including icon, uh, temperature, description, and everything here. So I'm gonna clean this one. In case of error, we don't want to show it an icon so we're gonna just say just make this one an empty string and no temperature we just say empty string okay description no description and detail is going to be empty as well not empty for the detail we just want to say Uh, so detail is okay, empty, but for the description, we're just going to say an error happened. We just say, please try again later. So now, instead of just getting nothing, uh, for example, we search for London, we have the result. But if you, for example, you make a mistake of a name, you can see an error happened, please try again later. So that person who is using the website knows, oh, okay, there is something wrong and they're going to fix it. Okay. So even, for example, we just click for the empty we don't get the result. But if you just write down a correct one, we get the result here. So that was it for this project. I hope you enjoyed and learned many things. We have worked how to fetch data from an open API, open weather API. And uh, we have learned how to use try and catch to first get the data. And also we handle the errors using the cache here and I hope you enjoyed and learned many things. See you in the next project. Welcome back to another project. In this project we are going to create an image search app. As you can see from the final version of the project we have and input here with, with a search button. We can search for the images that we want. For example, I search for cat. When I press enter, this is going to show me the images related to cat. As you can see, they, all of them, they have description. And we can, if we click on here, this is going to open the image inside the unsplash.com so we can download this image and see more data from that. And also we have a show more button here at the bottom. So when we click on this button, this is going to fetch more image each time. So up to thousand times you can click on this show more button and get more images. So all the images are unique and you don't, you never get a, a repetitive image. And also the page is completely responsive. You can see that we have two columns in the tablet size. In the mobile size, we have one uh, column. And they are on top of each other. The input and the search button are on top of each other. We have two and then we have three in the bigger size. And uh, so we're going to learn how to work with the Unsplash API and we get the data based on the search that we do here. So it can be anything. For example, you can search dog as well. So, and, and it's very fast uh, website. So as you can see, the results are instant. And we're going to, we're going to use a modern 
design using CSS. In the next section, we're going to start creating the HTML part of the project. So see you in the next section. All right, let's start our project. As you can see, I have put the final version here for our comparison and uh, compare our website with the final version. And also I go I'm gonna show you a preview of the website as well. The first things we need to do is to create an HTML file to start with. And uh, we see that we create the HTML tags and uh, later in the following sections, we're going to work on the CSS and JavaScript parts of the project. So let's uh, open the Visual Studio Code. I'm going to use Visual Studio Code, but you're free to use any text editor that you're familiar with. We can close the Get uh, the Welcome tab, and inside the File menu, we can open the folder and here we can create a new folder and start working on the project. I would like to create the project in my desktop. So I go to my desktop and create a new folder. And I set the name of the folder to be the name of our project, which is image search app. Image dash dash search dash app and as you have created the folder you can click on the select folder this is going to open the folder inside the visual studio code as you can see here the folder is open it is completely empty but we can create our files now let's close the welcome tab again and here we click on the this icon to create a new file and we just call the file index.html and we press enter. It is completely empty, but we can use an exclamation mark to create a, a boilerplate for our projects. So you just need to write down an exclamation mark. The Emmet abbreviation is going to suggest to you some a uh, boilerplate. So now we have our boilerplate, which includes the doc type, which is HTML. And HTML stands for HTML5, actually. In, in, in HTML5, we just write down HTML inside the doc type, which shows the browser which version of HTML we are using. The next tag is the HTML tag, which covers both of the head and the body section. The length attribute here sets the language of the page. And as we're creating a page in English, we just write down EN here. After that, we have a head tag, which covers the metadata tag and also the title tag. The first metadata tag sets the chart set attribute and UTF-8 is recommended by HTML5 which, because it is uh, almost covers all the syntaxes, all the uh, characters and symbols that you can see inside the browser. So the users won't have any problem seeing our website because we are using UTF-8. The next metadata tag tells the Internet Explorer browser to use the most recent rendering engine, which is Microsoft Edge. So this is just for the my users from the Internet Explorer. The next one is just a viewport metadata tag, which sets the width of the screen to devices width. For example, if we have a mobile screen, the width of the screen would be smaller than we are using the tablet screen. So the users won't have any problem in any devices. And then we have the initial zoom level of the browser, which is set to be 100%. Finally, we see the title of the 
uh, website which is now document let's open the browser and we can see the title if you have installed the live server extension you can see this icon here at the bottom of the uh, Visual Studio Code, you can simply click on that and this is going to open the live server ex, uh, live server, and which is going to create a server for us on port 5500 and as you can see the title is document but we can simply change the docu the title here for example I just say uh, image search app so now if you check the browser the title is image search app so what we want to do here we want to create a website like this so I'm going to break down the website so what we have here is an h1 tag saying image search app at the top then we have a form which includes a, an input and also a button so we need to add the h1 tag a form inside the form we have input and button then we have a div which is covering all the results and the is, result is going to be a bunch of images and each image at the bottom of the image we're going to have an anchor tag explaining the image and when we click on this anchor tag it's going to open the image inside the Unsplash website in a full size so you can just download and do kind of these things so we're gonna add so each image uh, here includes the uh, kind of uh, text and also a link and finally after that we have a button here saying show more which we when we click we're gonna see more results okay this is going to fetch more data so now let's create this one and see it inside the, our website. I'm going to bring the website, the browser on the right side and our Visual Studio Code on the left side so can, you can see the changes in real time. Let's close this part so we can have more space. So inside the body section, we're going to start with the H1 tag. So we're going to have an H1 tag saying the title of the website which is image search app. So we can see, the, see it here and after the H1 tag we are going to have more things. So let's make just disable this extension. So after the H1 tag, we're going to have a form and we don't need action for this form and inside the form we're going to have an input which is going to have the type of text and also uh, this input is going to have an ID of search input because we need this ID to track the changes inside the JavaScript and also I think you're gonna see it now let's refresh the page now you can see the input here for the placeholder, we, we're going to show a text when the input is empty. So we're going to add a placeholder. And this placeholder is going to say search for images dot dot dot. 
like this. After the input, we're going to have a button. And uh, for the button, I'm going to add an ID. We can do it by pound sign. We just say search dash button. And this is going to say search. Okay. Looks fine. And after the form, we're going to see the search results. So as I mentioned before, we have a div view that is covering all the images. It's covering all the images and each image has its own div as well, which includes the image and the and the explanation of the image. So we're going to have a div here. So let's create a div with a class of search results. So we just write down dot dash results. This is going to create a div for us with the search result. This is just an empty div. And after that, inside this one, we're going to have uh, another div, but this time instead of saying search results, we want to say search results singular. So we just say search, or you can call it anything, for example, card or anything similar to this one. As long as you understand what is that, it's fine. So this is a singular search result. And inside this div, we're going to have the image and the anchor tag. So the image, for now, we're going to create, just get some random image from unsplash.com. But later, we're going to uh, just change the source of it based on the search result. But for now, we just want to make some images because we need to have something here to style it using CSS in the next section. Uh, so I'm going to go to unsplash dot com for example we can get this image by just uh, so you can search any image here in the search for example you can search for nature and this is just bring you some images uh, I just choose for example the first image you just right click and click on copy image address and just put the paste it inside the source and for alternative, we just say image for now. So let's see what we have. So we have this image. And then uh, this is huge, but we're going to uh, style it using CSS. So after the image, we're going to have that uh, anchor tag which is going to open it in an, in another page. So we're going to change the target to blank. So the target is going to black. When they use the target blank, this is going to open. When you click on the link, it is going to open it in another page. So for example, for this image, if you go inside this image, it has a URL. You can copy the URL and paste it inside the anchor tag, for example. And you just add a text inside the anchor tag. For example, we just write down the explanation of this, which is, uh, I think it's gonna available somewhere. Let me open this. Doesn't have any explanation. So, we just write down something here. For example, we just say an image of a beach. And inside our website, we see the anchor tag here at the bottom. So let me, I don't know if you can see it or not. Here at the bottom, you see an image of a beach. When we click on it, this is going to open this page in a different, uh, in a new tab. So is, this is going to keep our uh, website because we are using the target blank and 
we just uh, set the relationship no opener no ref, ref uh, referer so this is going to this is for search engine optimization you just different types of click you set so we have this image uh, as i want to style it here using css so we're gonna have at least three images. so when in different sizes we see different number of images as you can see for example in a mobile size you see one and then uh, we just see two and then three so i'm gonna at least have three images the things we can do we just we can just copy this search result div for example two more times using alt shift arrow done one two so inside the, our website we're going to have one two three image but we can just change the images as well but it's not necessary because this is just a temporary hard-coded images in the javascript part we're going to show the images based on our uh, image search okay so that was it for the oh sorry it's not completed yet we need to add this show more button too so after this we're going to go outside the div and we just go and create a button this one is going to have an id of show more show more button so we can target it easily using uh, javascript or css and then we just say show more that's it so probably we can see it in our website but just uh, here at the bottom so just uh, bear with me in the next section we are going to use css and we're going to mix our websites like the one in the final version make it more beautiful and with the modern design so see you in the next section for the html uh, for the css part of the project All right, in the last section, we have completed the HTML part of the project. In this section, we're going to style the project using CSS. The first thing we need to do is to create a CSS file inside our Visual Studio code. Let me increase the size and we just open the Explorer section using Ctrl Shift E, or you can just go to the view and click on explorer and here we're going to create another file and just we just call it a style dot css and we need to add a link to this file within the html file in order to use it so inside the html file after the title tag we're going to add a link tag we just write down link and we click on the third auto suggestion the one with the css and here we're going to create a relationship between the html file and the css style sheet and the destination of the file the href is style.css because both files are located at the same directory so now we can use the css in our file in, inside our website so the first things i want to add and the style is the body section i just want to change the background color font family font size and line height so i'm gonna add we just write down body and we open a set of curly braces and we, we we're gonna target the body which is the whole website i just want to change the background color to be a light gray and the hashtag code the pound code for that one is f9 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 
So let's see it inside the website. So now the background color is different. Let's bring the website to the right side. So we can see the changes in real time. I'm going to use the start and arrow right and left to create this kind of windows in inside the windows. So to, for those who want to know how do I bring the this one to the right side. After the background color, I want to change the font family. I want to change the family, the sets the font family of the text inside the body to be Arial. So we're going to choose the Arial and if the Arial is not available, we're going to use these two fonts. And uh, the next one, the next things I want to do, we want to set the line height to be 1.6 which is going to add some space between them and also we want to remove the uh, default margin and we set it to be 0 so we don't have any space between the elements and the browser's wall. So after the body section we're going to style this h1 tag. So inside the HTML we see that Inside the body that we have now styled, then we have an h1 tag saying image search app. So here we can target that one by just targeting the h1 tag. We're going to open the set of curly braces. And here we just, for example, I change the font size to be, for example, 36 pixels. Okay, and after that, we're going to bring it to this. Uh, so we want to make it bold. So I'm just, I just want to change the font weight to be bold, which is going to make it thick. And let's bring it to the center using text align center. So bring it to the center like this. It's very simple to do it. And then we can add some margin at the top, some space at the top. So we bring it a little bit down using, you just say 40 pixels. So, all right. So that's enough space and we can add some space at the bottom as well. We just say margin bottom of 60 pixels. So that's enough for the H1 tag. After that, we're going to target the form. So the form actually doesn't have any ID or class. You can add it, but you can simply target the form here. We just say form because it's just a tag. We just say form and we open a set of curly braces. What I want to do is I want to change the display to flex so these items we can center them easily when you make a display flex everything comes next to each other so let's see what we have so the, this is kind of uh, look messy now but let's just uh, Change the justify content center to bring everything to the center horizontally. And align item center to bring everything to the center vertically. Probably now we can see the button here. So I feel uh, we actually put the put the HTML tag in a wrong order. So this div, this div, it should be outside the form, not inside the form. So this div with the class of search result, we're going to cut this one and put it outside the form. And actually you know, this button, the show more button should be outside the form too. So I made a mistake here. Sorry about that. So after that, uh, after this 
there we're going to add the button so the form we have the form here after that we have a div with this uh, class of search result after that we have the button with the id of show more button so this way you can see the input and the button at the top and then you see the images and finally you see the button so you just fix this one and then you can get the same result for the uh, styling so let's continue styling now so after this uh, adding the justify content and align items center to bring everything to the center we're going to we want to add some margin at a bottom of 60 percent or 60 pixels so we're going to set have some space and after that we're going to target this input and the search uh, search input and the search button so in the in the html this one has uh, so this one should be search input actually not search id so i'm going to fix this one too so the first input has the id of search input and the button has the id of search button so we can target them because they have an id we can add the pound sign here and then we just say search input and then we're going to open a set of curly braces i want to set the width of this one to be 60 percent so it's going to be longer and we just set the maximum width to be 400 pixel this is going to limit it when we have a bigger screen like a 400 pixel and uh, let's keep continue let's add some padding i want to add a padding 10 pixel up and bottom so we just say 10 pixels here for up and bottom and 20 pixels for left and right and uh, this is this is going to make it a little bigger uh, let's remove the border so we want to have a modern design modern design doesn't have border usually so we just set the border to be none but instead we're going to have box shadow which is cooler so we're going to have a box shadow we're going to have zero pixels for the horizontal shadow zero pixel for vertical shadow we have five pixels for blurness and we can set the color to be rgba which is stands for red green blue and alpha and for the red green and blue we're going to set it to be zero because this one gives us a black color for the alpha value i'm going to set it to be 0.2 which is 20 percent transparency so you can see the shadow like that now and then we're going to have a border radius border radius is going to create a rounded corner for us and we set it to be, for example, uh, 5 pixels. That's enough. And finally, we're going to have some... Uh, we can set the font size to be 18 pixels. So make it... Sorry, 18. So make it a little bit bigger. And uh, for the color... I want to have the this color 333 three, three, which is kind of uh, light dark like black is it like a gray dark gray so we have the button as uh, we have the input now ready 
looks okay. So we have just set uh, some width, max width, padding, and border. After that, we're going to target this search button. So I'm going to bring this one at the top. And here we're going to target the search button. As you can see inside the HTML, this button has the idea of, has an idea of search button. So we can just target it using a pound sign. And now we can simply target this button. First, I want to add some padding to it to be similar size of the uh, input we have. 10 pixels for uh, top and bottom and 20 pixels for left and right. We set the background color to be this color, which is kind of green color for CA F50. And then we're going to set the color of the text to be white. We're going to remove the border similar to we have done for the input. We just set the border to be none. We remove the border, but we can just change the font size similar to the input. We make it 18 pixels. This is going to make the button exactly the same size of the this input and then we're gonna have some box shadow too the box shadows is, should be similar we're going to create the same zero for uh, x and y axis five pixel for blurness and also the rgba which is going to be black with 20 percent transparency and finally we're going to have the cursor to be pointer when we hover over it we see a pointing hand we want to have some uh, border radius as well so the border radius we're gonna have five pixels here Okay, and also we're going to have some hover effect. When we hover over it, we want to change the background color to a different color. So in order to do that, we can just say search dash button. We target the hover by just adding a clone saying hover. And this is going to, we're going to change the background color. For example, we set it to be uh, three, three E eight E four one, which is a darker uh, green color. But you see the change is very fast. We can add a transition here. We add a transition to the background color. So you can copy this one, don't type it. So we, we add the transition to the background color for point, uh, point 0.3 seconds with ease in and out effect. So which is going to create kind of this effect. So this is uh, for the button and the input. Now the, what we want to do is to style this uh, image, the results section. But before doing that, I want to just decrease the size of the image first because this is kind of big so we cannot see the changes. Uh, so I want to target the image first. 
the image is inside this div with a class of search result. So we can target that one. We just add the dot for the class. Targeting the class, we just say search result. And then we just target all the images inside here. And then we just set the width to be different. So we just set the width to be 100%. So this is going to force the image to be 100%, but we set the height to be 200 pixels, which is make the image look like this. But as you can see, the image is kind of scratched. In order to prevent this one distort, distorting, it's a as aspect ratio. We can just set the object fit to be cover. So this is going to uh, uh, prevent the image to be uh, scratched, but uh, it's okay. We're gonna make the three images in columns first so now the images looks fine but we're gonna target the div that is covering the both of them the search result this here so this one at the top because it's a class we just say dot search result and we're going to target that one so the things we want to do here we want to set the display to flex to bring everything next to each other like this but we're going to have a different things for example in mobile size we want to have one tablet we want to have two and in the big screen we want to have three so we're gonna uh, change this width as you can see this is a hundred percent but in the mobile size is 100%. In tablet, it's 45%. And it, in, uh, in the big size, we're going to have 30%. Okay. So we're going to have a different things here. But first, uh, we just want to just... Uh, First, I want to check this one is a class, okay? This is class 2. So we have targeted that one. We changed the display to flex. We can change the flex wrap to be wrap. So when we actually, we have a smaller side, they are going to go on top of each other like this. So based on the size of the screen, we're going to have different number of images inside using flex wrap wrap and we can just use justify content uh, we can say a space between to add some space between them for example like this they're not going to connect to each other and then we can just use a maximum width that so we're gonna have a maximum width of 1200 pixels so in the big screen we're gonna limit it they don't we just limit it to 1200 pixels they are not just connected to the wall and for bringing them to the center we can just uh, set the margin to zero for the top and bottom and auto for the left and right, which is going to bring them exactly in the center, like this. So see the, in the uh, different size we have, actually you can increase that 1200 uh, for more, but I think that is fine for now. Let's keep continue.
So uh, we have target the search result. Now we're gonna target the search result singular here. So each of them, we're going to style each of them. So I'm gonna copy this. After this, we're going to target that. I just put everything in order so you know which one comes first. We just uh, style this image because we wanna make them smaller for easier uh, styling. For the M uh, search result, as you can see, it's connected to the bottom one. So I'm gonna add some margin at the bottom of 60 pixels. So we have some space between them. And then we set the width to be 30%. This 30% is just for the Uh, big screen like this we made it 30 percent so they're gonna cover more uh, spaces but in the other places like the tablet and mobile size we're gonna have the different width so diff width this width is 30 percent but in the different sizes i'm gonna show you how to do it using media query so we're gonna see a, a more beautiful design and then we're going to have some border radius of 5 pixels. So after this, you cannot see the border radius yet because we have to add some box shadow here. So we create a box shadow. The box shadow is going to be 0, 0 for the X and Y axis, 5 for five pixels for blurness and finally we have some RGBA which is black with 20% transparency now you can see it and uh, we just need to some of these uh, borders sh uh, sorry border radius is under the, if I zoom it, you can see it better. You can see that this image is covering that border radius. So we can just simply use overflow hidden to hide the extra image. Now you can see it like this. So that was it for this one. And also we want to set the height of this one as well to... Uh, I think the height is fine for the result section. Yeah, because uh, we have added the height before for the image, so we don't need to have the height here. So the next things I want to add is this. We have just created this result. The image we have styled already. But when we hover over the image, like the final version, I want some scale effect. As you can see, when we hover over this container, we see the image zoom in a little bit. So I'm going to target that uh, search result div, its hover effect. And then I just want to add the image uh, these things. I want to just uh, tr use transform to change its size. So we just say transform, use the scale, and then we can increase the size of the scale, for example, 5% like this. So you can see the change, but it's very, f it's very fast change. We need to add some transition. So we can just inside the image that we have here, we can add some transition which is going to add some animation and the transition we want to add is going to be on top of the transform because we want to just apply the transition to this transform this is going to be 0.3 second and with the ease in and out effect so now you can see it's it's much better 
So after the image, we're going to uh, install this anchor tag here. So we can target that one. We just said search result and then we uh, apply all the anchor tags. So first thing first, I want to just change its padding, add some padding to it and I set the padding to be 10 pixels. So we add some space for it. I want to change the display to block. And uh, this is going to, all of them goes inside that. As you can see, they came inside the same column. And after that, you can just change the color. Let me delete this. The color is going to be dark gray, which is 333. And let's remove this uh, underline. So we just make a text decoration. Let me bring this one up. So text decoration is going to be none. Okay. Let's see it inside the big size. It looks okay. We can make it uppercase or something like that. So you can uh, actually work on it, make it your own styling. So for example, for uh, you can just add too many transaction things. Transform. I think you can add okay that's it uh, i think that's fine let's move on and go to the next part so when we hover over this container i want this actually anchor tank has some background color it, it became a little bit gray so when we hover over the search result div like this so we add some hover so all the anchor tag inside is going to have a background color of, we can just make a light gray. The simplest way is to create an RGBA. For example, 20%, 20% is a bit high. We can make it uh, 1%, it's a bit lighter. And also, it's we can add some transition too to so make it uh, subtle and smooth. So we just add a transition here on on top of the background background color. So I'm gonna copy this, and we just uh, 0.3 seconds, and with the ease in and out effects. Okay, this is very, change is similar to this image. So that's very nice. You can see it in a bigger size. Okay, looks okay. But we just have to, let me remove the zoom level so you can see it's like that. So when we click on here, it's going to open the image inside the Unsplash. So let's move on and install this button. For the button, if you remember, for the button, we have added an ID of show more button. So I'm going to copy this ID, the name of ID, and we can target that one using a pound sign show more button and now let's just change the background color to be i want to set it to be blue so hashtag double zero eight c b a this color let's remove the border 
by setting the border to be none and let's uh, change its color to be white and after that we're gonna add some padding in the x x uh, in the top and bottom to be 10 pixels and 20 pixels for left and right so as you can see here we can bring it to the center using text aligned center let's see so we have to change the display to inline block so now we can see so yeah for bring it to the center probably uh, we don't need actually that one we can just use margin zero auto let's see why it doesn't work so we have to say text along center we bring it to the center let's remove this display block okay so text align center we have set the margin to center the button horizontally but it didn't work so let's wait to see Okay, still it's on the left side. Let's see that we have here the button show more. Okay. Okay, for bring it to the center, we just need to add a display block, which is going to make this one complete in a block or to take all the space and when you use margin zero auto it's going to add the same amount of margin to the left and right and text align center actually bring this show more in the center of the button then we want to add some border radius which is going to be five pixels it's it's going to add some corner rounded corner and uh, I think we're gonna add some margin at the top and bottom so we can just uh, set the margin here top and bottom 20 pixels so we're gonna add some space 40 pixels would be better I think 20 is okay that's fine and then uh, we can set the cursor to be pointer so when we hover over it we see a pointing hand and finally we're going to have some hover effect so when we hover over it you want to see a different color so we just uh, target that button again show more button but we're gonna target its hover effect which is going to change the background color to be pound sign 007 B5 seven seven b5 so double seven okay now this one when we hover over we see a different color and we can add a transition here to have a smooth change so we're gonna have a transition on background color with uh, 0 0.3 second and ease in and out effect 
So this is going to be similar to this. Okay. So we have completed the website, the add, added the show more and this one. Now we want to make it responsive. We want to have three here, but when we have a, a, mobile, a mobile size or tablet size, we want to have two or one color. So what we do here, we added media query. First, we're going to target the uh, tablet size. So we're just going to add media query screen and we're going to set another condition. We just say if the maximum maximum width for the maximum width less than 768 pixels do the following which is we're going to target search result and we set the width to be instead of remember we set the width to be 30 percent here search result but for this size under this one we're going to set it to be 45 percent which is going to have some some of the, this size so for the tablet size we're going to have it like this but as you can see they just connected to the wall we can fix this one we just add some uh, margin in the right and left for the search results here that is covering all of them as you can see, the margin was zero for the left and right. Uh, for the left and right is auto, but uh, we can add some padding instead. So we're gonna have some padding, for example, 10 pixels. This is going to push it a little bit in size, so we, we're gonna have some space here, okay? So in the tablet size we have two next to each other we can add this padding more like uh, we can make it 20 even looks better so for the uh, size less than that for the mobile size so let me copy this one using alt shift arrow done and instead of 768 for this one we're going to target sizes 480 and less so instead of 45 percent i'm gonna add this one to 100 percent so for the size of the smaller like uh, this size we're going to have 100% of this, this screen. So I'm going to show you. If you open the, the dev tools and go here in the mobile and choose, for example, iPhone 12 Pro, you can see in the mobile size, we have only one page. We have one uh, image. Okay, so now we have one image. The other things I want to do for this form, I want the input and search to be on top of each other. So we're going to target that one too. So we're going to target the form and we change the flex direction dash direction to instead of row to be column so they're going to be on top of each other like this but here they don't have any space so i'm going to uh, target that search input i want to add some margin I want to add some margin bottom of 20 pixels so we have some space between them and also we can make this 
input to be 100% of the uh, screen. So in, you can just say width to be 100%. See. So 100% is a bit too much. For example, you can just set it to be 85, for example. Okay, now this one looks okay. We have this search. We can make this button to be bigger as well. If you want to work on it, you can work yourself. And... Uh, Looks fine. For the tablet size, let's make this one responsive. So for the mobile, we have like this. For the tablet size, we have two next to each other. For the mobile size, we have only one. And for the big size, we have three next to each other. So that was it for is styling our project using CSS. In the next section, we're going to create this result dynamically, like the one in this final version. For example, if you here search for a search term, for example, I search for dog. This is going to show me all the dog pictures. And uh, we can click here on show more. And this is going to show more results here. Okay, it's a, okay. All right. So in the next section, we're working. We're going to work on the functionality of the websites using JavaScript. So see you in the next section. All right. In the last section, we have completed the CSS part of the project. In this section, we're going to work on the JavaScript part and add more functionality to the website. We want to uh, search something on the, this input, but when we press enter or click on this search button, we're going to fetch data from the, an API, which is called Unsplash API, and we're going to show the results here based on the search term. So Unsplash actually is a free website that gives you some images. But uh, in order to get the API, in, we need to sign in in the website. It's free for demo applications, which needs less than 50 requests per hour. So it is free. So we need to go to unsplash.com and uh, search and get our API key. So let's go to Google and search for Unsplash. In the search results, we need to go to unsplash.com and uh, we need to s uh, sign up to the application. I have already created an account. As you can see my uh, picture here, you just, it's completely free, you can just sign up and when you sign in you just click on this hamburger icon on the right side and here click on the developer forward slash api so as you can see they have a they show you how to use their api and how many requests they have their months and simple integrations and etc here you just need to go to your apps here in this menu and click on your apps. And uh, as you can see, I have already created four apps. Demo apps are free to create and takes no time, but for the production apps, you need to uh, submit your application and they're gonna check and review it and you can get up to 5,000 requests per hour. So here, let's click on the new application. To create a new application, you need to just check everything here. They're 
terms of service, read all of them and then accept uh, terms and create your application. I'm just going to call it image search uh, app. Description, anything you can say, you just say uh, this app can search the images from Unsplash API. Okay. We just click on create application and as you can see the application is created and here you can just get your access key so we need to uh, get this one the first one access key not the second one so you need to just copy this one and put it inside your javascript file but we haven't created our javascript file yet so we need to go back to Visual Studio Code and we open the Explorer section and we can create our JavaScript file by clicking on this new file and we just can call it anything like app.js, script.js or I always call it index.js and before using the JavaScript file we need to add a script tag inside the HTML file in order to be able to use it a script a script file a script tag should be at the end of the body section because all the page should be loaded first and then we can uh, uh, have access to the elements inside the javascript and manipulate the data or replace some data that we need so here you just need to add your script tag so we just write down, for example, SC, and we can click on the second auto suggestion, the one with the SRC. SRC is the address of the JavaScript file. And as both files are located at the same directory, you just need to write down index.js here. Now we can just start working on our JavaScript file. First thing first, I want to create that a constant called a access key and this is going to be equal to the the access key that we have copied uh, we haven't copied it yet so we go back and we just copy this to clipboard and we paste it here. So now we have our access key. So the next things we need to do is to get the elements we need from the HTML file and bring it here so we can manipulate these elements or we can have access to them. So what we need to have is uh, we need this form because when it's the form is submitted, we want to know and do some things here so we want to uh, get the elements of the form the next things we need is this input we want to know what is inside this input and what keyword is written inside the input the third things we need to know is this div because we want to change everything inside this div and add our the images that is coming from the api so we're going to have access to div, this div as well and finally we want to have access to this button because we want to know when the person is clicking on this button so it's very simple to have these things for the form because the form doesn't have any id or class we can have access to this form using a method called query selector so we can just create a constant here and we just call it form element and we just make this one equal to 
we need to tap the document because we want to target all the document and check if there is anything called form there and we can use the method called query selector and the, the selector name is form so I'm gonna put it inside a set of quote and we just write form here after that we want to target that input the input has the ID of search input. So I'm going to copy this search input text and we, we just create a new constant and we call it search input element. And this is going to be equal to document because we want to target all the document. And this time, because we are targeting an ID, we can use a method called get element by ID. And we just open a set of uh, bracket. And here we just paste the ID that we have copied. The next things we need to get is the search result div. The search result div actually it's here and it has a class of search result. In order to get a term, in order to get a, something, an element with the class, we can use query selector as well, but in, instead we can tap to the class name. So we just call this one search result. search results element and this is going to be equal to document we want to target the document and we just say a query selector and this is going to be equal to the id but for id uh, sorry class we need to add a dot here because it's a class we need to select it by adding a dot at the beginning of the name so we got that element as well and the final element is the button saying show more so what was the name of it so this button has the id of show more button so i'm going to copy this and here we just name this one show more as you can see we are using camel case naming convention and uh, show more button and this is going to be equal to document dot because it's an id we can use get element by id and here we just write down the name of the ID, which is show more button. All right. So we have all the elements now. We can have, uh, we can just manipulate them or have access to their data. The first things we need to do is to add an event listener to the form. So when the form is submitted, we want to trigger a function. So this form, we're going to add an add event listener method the method we want to target we want to uh, what event we want to listen we want to listen to event called submit so when the form is submitted we want to trigger a function let's create the function So we want to trigger a function and this function is going to first thing first we want to get the event so this is the things uh, events happen after uh, the form is submitted what we want to do 
is first we prevent the default behavior of the submission. I just want to first show you that this event listener is working. So let's first console log. For example, we just say say the for, uh, the term submitted. I think submitted. I think has two. Yeah, no, two T probably. Okay. After, uh, let's go and check. Now, if we open the console using F12 here, and if we write down something and we press search, uh, let's refresh the page first. As you can see, we have the, the console log, but we cannot see it because the console log submitted, but because this is refreshing the page, this is not going to stay. So before uh, submission, we're going to stop the uh, default behavior of the submission, which is refreshing the page. And we just, we can do events that prevent default to prevent the sub, uh, refreshing the page. Now, if we submit the form, we can see the term submitted inside the uh, browser inside the console but instead of submission we want to search for the image so we want to create a function called search image and we want to call this function or search images that that makes more sense and let's make cre uh, create this function here usually i create the functions after the bringing the elements so this is the best place we just put all the functions here so we're gonna call the function search images okay so this is going to call this function And we need to create the function. And uh, the, th the things the function does is just uh, make a request to the API key. And uh, we get the data from the API. But what we need here, we need this term. Whatever we write down here inside this input, we want to have access to that one too. So based on this, uh, information inside the input we want to submit. So we can get this L, uh, this, uh, this input data and uh, I just want to call it input data and this is going to be equal to first we need to create it and make it an empty so we just create a because this is a variable and this is going to change, we need, instead of constant, we need to create a let. Let is just a variable that can be, have multiple uh, change inside after. For example, we just write first is empty and then it gets the value here. But constant, uh, the value of constant cannot be changed through, through the, your app, uh, uh, code. So now we have the this one, we just call it input data. First, we set it to be an empty string. Okay. And here we just want to get the data from the search input element dot value. So we want to get the value inside the this input. So let's console log and see if we can get it. So now we console log input data. Now let's refresh the page. Okay.
So we are getting an error, but I don't think it's related to us because these images we are getting is not available. Oh, sorry, I, I think I'm offline. Let me connect to the internet first. All right, so I've connected to the internet. Now let's refresh the page. Now we can see that we don't have any error. This error actually is not related to the application. I have just have some extension that makes these errors is not related to us. And here now, for example, I search something like nice. When I press enter, you see the term nice here logged inside the console. Let's search for something else. For example, dog, we can see dog. So now we have access to the input and now we can just uh, request to the API and get the results related to that search term. So the, the URL that we use for the API is going to be dynamic because we want to have a different value for it. And also we want to pass this access key as well. So we're going to create a constant and we call it URL. And this is going to be dynamic. So we need to add backticks instead of the quote. This is a quote. This is a backtick. So for uh, using a dynamic URL, you need to have backticks, which is located on top of the tab key inside the keyboard. So here we just write down the URL, which is HTTPS. Uh, uh, you need to add a clone to forward slash API dot unsplash dot com forward slash search forward slash photos. And then we add a question mark because we want to have our first query. Uh, the query we want to use is page because we want to get the first page first. And then we, when we click on show more, we want to have the second page, third page. So this is going to be variable as well. So we're going to use dollar sign and set of curly braces to have the variable page. But page, we haven't defined it yet. So here, we, I'm going to just create another variable called page, which is going to be equal to one first. And then we're going to increase it when we click on show more button. So after page, uh, let's add our next uh, parameter by adding an end sign. So first you add question mark. After that, you just need to add amper, ampersand, sorry, and sign or whatever we call it. And then this is going to be query. The next one is query. And this is going to be equal to, this is dynamic as well. And whatever we have here, this input data, we put here, this is our query. It can be dog, cat, or anything you search. And after that, we have the access key, which we're gonna call it client underline ID. So these are very important, actually the same uh, things you write down, because if you write down something else, it doesn't work. This is the way you ask for the API, and this is going to be equal to the access key that we have got from the us we copy it and put it here we got it from the unsplash api so three variables we have here the page the input data and access key so we're going to request for the page one first and then by pressing on show more we're going to increase this page i'm going to show you how to do it and uh, now we, we got the URL. So let me console log the URL. You see that 
we are doing it correctly or not. So URL, let's check the browser. Now, for example, if you search for dog and click on search or press enter, we get this URL, which is api.unsplash.com forward slash search forward slash photo page one, query is dog, and the client ID is this one is our access key. And if you click on here, this is going to give us the data based on the search term dog. And if you don't see it like this, you need to uh, uh, install an extension on Chrome called JSON Formatter. So you install this one to see it like that. And you, you probably, if you don't have that extension, you see it like this. Okay. This is going to parse it. As you can see, we get the total result, which is 10,000. We have 10,000 pages. And uh, for the result, we get the first 10. Okay. The first 10 we get, it, each of them has an ID. So let me close this. Each of them has an ID created at the width, height, color, blur, and we have the URL. So if you check the first one, for example, if you click here, you see the pay, uh, the dog's picture. We can have a full one, regular, a small size. So this is going to be a smaller size. So if you want to make an application, you, you, for example, you need only the thumbnail. You just get the thumb. So, which is the small one. Uh, so, and also very small, I think it's this one. You can, that's is a different format. All right, so, and also we have the links. So when we click on the link, you go to this uh, page related to this uh, image, all right? So uh, for the result, you get 10 items, as you can see here. I, mean, I cannot zoom it here, but let me show. No, I cannot zoom it here. So you can have the 10 items here. So we need to show these 10 items in our, inside our application. But uh, the things we get here is not, uh, we just get the res uh, we need to now fetch the data to get it. Now I just paste it inside the URL. The, the browser actually fetch the data for us and convert it to JSON and show it for us. What we do here, we, we wanna just do this process in our application. We need to uh, get the response. So we just write down response equal to we need to add a wait here. A wait is going to wait until the result comes from the API and then goes to the next line of the code. So we're gonna use a method called fetch and we wanna fetch this URL. And as we are using a wait, as you can see, we are getting an error because when you are using await, you need to change the function to asynchronous. So what the await does, when you reach the code reach to this line, and until the result comes, wait and doesn't go to the next line. So this is going to prevent an error happening inside our application. Then we need to parse it and convert the data to a JSON file. So we need to create another constant and we call it data, which is going to be equal to response dot and we convert it to JSON by a method from the JavaScript using JSON. So now we can simply console log this. So we just log this data
So now if you come back our application and search for, for example, dog, we get the first, uh, as you can see, we got the URL and we got back the promise actually. Oh, sorry. We need to add it await here as well because this one takes time to do it. If you don't add await here, this is you don't get the results. You just get the promise. So now let's try again. We just do dog, and now it gives us the result. We we are we want the result with the ten items. Each of them is a different image with the URL, color, and everything else. So we have the description here, we have the height, we have uh, all the information we need to fill these cards. Okay, so it was successful. So now what we do here, uh, first we just check if the page the number of page is equal to one. We want to set whatever inside the search results element. We want to make this one inside this, whatever the HTML is, we want to make it empty. So we just write down, for example, the dog, we're going to make this one empty. First, we want to make it empty, but based on the result, we want to fill it again, if the page is equal to one. And why we want to set it to one? Because first someone search, we want to set, see the first result. And then when we press on the show more button, we want to see the next one. And here too, we want to uh, set the page to be one when we submit the form. So when we submit the form, we want to set the page to be one and then we want to get the results. So after this, so as I mentioned, we got the data, but the 10 data there is, is inside the something called results. So we're going to create another variable constant called results. And this is going to be equal to data dot results, which is uh, an array of 10 results. So if we now console log results, we should just get these 10 items. So I'm going to open the uh, console using F12. If you, for example, search for cat, you're going to get the only the 10 results, not the extra data. Okay. And also we can see this show button. We want, we don't want to see this show more button first, uh, when we come to the website, but when we search and see the first result, we want to see it. So what we do, we go to a solid CSS and this button show more button here, we style it. First, we set the display to none. Okay. Now we don't see the button, but uh, in the, where is it? Uh, inside the index.js, we create a, a a statement and we just say if the page number is greater than uh, greater than zero greater than one sorry the first result comes if the page is this greater than one we want to see the show more button so let's see so we just get uh, we just say show more button dot style we want to change its style dot display we want to set this one to block instead so 
So let's see. So first we shouldn't see the uh, the show more button. But when we actually get the result and show it, we want to increase the number of uh, this uh, page. But now it's uh, imagine that is just uh, less. Okay. So now we want to manipulate this div based on this result. So let's delete this console log. So let's do it now. We want to create a div. So we're going to create a div and we call it image wrapper. And this is going to be equal to document dot. We want to create an element using create element method. And the element we want to create is a div. Okay. This div is going to have the search result. Uh, this one should have two P's. Okay. So we want to create this div. The div with the class of result. Because we want to finally delete all these things and create it by JavaScript. So we're going to create a div with a class of search results. So first we have this div. And uh, we create this div. And then we're going to add a class list. And the class list is going to have the name search dash result. So when we create this one and add this class name, we want to uh, add it to our uh, this this search result element. Okay. So when we have created, we want to create an image inside it. So we're going to create another constant and we call it image and this is going to be equal to document dot create element again and this element is going to be an image this image is has uh, it has the src which is the address of the image src which is going to be that one that we get from the result. But we here we get the 10 results. We cannot set the image SRC to 10. We can we need to uh, set it to each one. So we need to loop through these results using a method called map. We just map through this result and we get each result singular. And this is going to, and then we do, we need to do all these things inside here. So we're going to create a div here. We're going to add the class list of search results to this div. And then we're going to create an image. The SRC is going to be result dot URLs dot we want to get the a small image so we just write down a small if you remember we have console log it has many as uh, uh, many uh, like a uh, spec ratios like a raw a speak a small we we get the small one and then uh, the image alternative text is going to be result dot alt underline description okay and so we created the image we created first the div see so this div search result and then we have created the image now we want to create this anchor tag so the anchor tag we want to call it, for example, we, I just create a constant and just call it image 
link and this is going to be equal to document we want to create this one so we just use document dot create element and the elements we want to create is anchor tag we just write a here so for this one the we're gonna have the href target and text content so we change its href first and this is going to be equal to result dot links as I'm showing you before the links and inside it we have HTML then we have image link target as we want to open it in a new window so we, we have to set the dar target to underline blank which is going to open it inside a new page and finally we have the image link dot text content which is the content inside the anchor tag and which is going to be equal to result we can use this alt description but you can use the, uh, something else as well so uh, let me console log and check again let me console log the results So let's search something, for example, dog. So each of them, now we are constantly logging each result. They have alt description we can use. That is a one way, but they have a description too. Black pog with the greatest one. And this one is Toshi wearing a snake. The description is actually more beautiful. So the next one, alt is this but actually this uh, the alt description makes more sense than the description this one for example say happy woman's day it's not related to dog at all okay the next one yeah and the description is not related to the image so let's uh, instead of the, that instead of the description we're going to have this image link dot text content and we set it to be equal to this alternative description which is inside result dot alternative description okay now we have created three things the wrap image and image link now we want to just put them uh, now we have just created them now we want to append them to the existing one so the image this div that we have created image wrapper we want to put the image and the image link inside that so we're going to say dot append child we want to first append the image and then we want to let's copy this one up, and then we want to append the image link as well so we're going to append these two it means add them inside this div this image and anchor tag like here we have image and anchor tag inside this div so we ha we, we we have to append these two inside this div and then we're going to append this image wrapper inside the upper one. So we want to append this div inside the search results. We have the search result. We have imported the search result here and it's called search results element. So we just say search results element and we want to append a child to it, which is image wrapper this one now we should see the results for example if we search for dog as you can see 
all the images and the description is added uh, very fast to here. For example, we just search for cat, we see the cat. Okay, so that was so simple. So we have created this image, the link. We have created a div. We put the image and the link inside the div, and then we put this div, all this div inside the another div called search results. Okay, so that was for this one. Now after this one, we want to add a page number. So we want to increase the page number one. Uh, so the page number first is one, and then we want to increase it to two here. So now if we search for dog, the page number is going to be two. After that, so let's refresh the page. For example, cat, but we don't see this button again. So let me see. Uh, it's we haven't saved this one yet. So if you search for dog now, now we should see the show more button, but we haven't we cannot see it yet. Let's console log this page. We check the number here. So let's search again for dog. And we check the console using F12. As you can see, the page number is two actually now. If we refresh the page, uh, we, and then we just search for cat, and uh, this is two, but we have an error. The search images, the block is not defined. Okay, so that's a problem. We need to put this block inside the so we make it a string actually because this is not a variable now if we search again for cat we sh the page is two and then we can see the show more button as well so that is working but we want to have the functionality to the add the functionality to this show more button so here at the end when we have added the add event listener to the form, we want to add the event listen, add the event listener, add event listener to the button. So we just say show more button. This show more button here that we have, let's call this one show more button element actually. And then we just say show more button element dot add event listener and the event we want to add, listen to it is uh, click actually not submit so when we click on this button we want to trigger a function and this function is just going to call the search images function that we have created at the top and when we call this one we're gonna uh, actually call this function again and we're gonna actually uh, if because the page is now two we're not gonna clean this one so we're gonna add the data to it and here actually we need to change the show more button to show more button elements so in order to to it to work okay so let's test this one now we just search for dog we get the dog, the page is two here inside the console. When we click on show more, we get more results and the page number is three. Click more, we get more results with page number is four and so on. We can just for, uh, I think thousand times we can click on show more. So we can just uh, limit it as well here. We just say page more than one and less than thousand. We can just, if you want, you can fix this one too. But I'm 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 not sure someone gonna click on this thousand times. Okay, so uh, 
let's a little bit clean this one. Let's delete some console log that we have. Let's delete this console log URL. Let's delete this console log page. And inside the HTML, we're going to delete everything inside the search result. Or we just, uh, for your reference, I'm going to just keep them and just make them a uh, comment using contour forward slash. Now the page is completely empty when we come to first time. And when we search something, for example, cat, dog, or nice, we get the results and we have the show more. You can see here. Right. So that was it for creating our image search app based on the Unsplash API. I hope you enjoyed and learned many things. So see you in the next project. Welcome back to another project. In this project, we are going to create a basic calculator. As you can see from the final version of the project, we have a modern designed calculator with the numbers, operators, the equal sign, and the C clear button. So we can just uh, write down our uh, arithmetic equations. An expression we just write down for example 45 plus 42 and we get the results we can just multiply them to another number so and also we can clear the screen so this is very simple calculator we're going to use some a built-in functions of JavaScript called eval to evaluate the expression inside the input we're going to learn how to add an events listener to these uh, buttons using for loop and uh, we're going to learn how to design this one with a modern uh, styling using css as you can see we have some hovering effect and also we have some shadow effect inside and outside some elements in the next section, we're going to start with the HTML part of the project. So see you in the next section. All right, let's start our project. I have put the final version here for our comparison. So we can just compare our design with, our, with the one that is already completed. So as you can see, we can just use a, this design. And the first things we want to do is to create the HTML part of the project. So we just need to have these numbers, these letters, and uh, this equal sign. And also we want to create a div here that is covering all of them. And, and then we, we also need to add some input here. So what we want to do here, first, we want to create an HTML file. So uh, first we go and open our Visual Studio Code. I would like to use Visual Studio Code as my text editor, but you can create anything you want. Uh, you can create it in any text editor that you are familiar with. So first thing first, you just click on File and go to open folder so we're gonna create a new folder for our projects i want to create it inside my desktop so let's create a new folder and we're gonna call the name of the projects and set the uh, name of the folder to be basic calculator so i'm gonna write down basic calculator here basic dash calculator and after creating the folder we're going to click on the select folder to select this folder and this is going to open the visual studio code again but 
the ex in the explorer section we see that uh, the basic calculated folder is open and we can just create our files here so all the files goes inside this folder let's close the welcome tab and here we just create a new file by clicking on this file new file or you can do it by just right click and click on new file we just need to call our html file the extension should be html but the name can be anything but we just call it index.html so this file is now empty but we can use an exclamation mark to have a boilerplate so when you have an exclamation mark, the emit abbreviation is going to suggest you this boilerplate, which uh, gives you the first template for your website, including a title. So just click on the first auto suggestion, and this is going to have our boilerplate, which includes the doc type. Doc types tells the browser which version of HTML we are using. We write down here HTML. If you're using HTML5, you need to just write down HTML here. After that, we have the HTML tag, which includes the head tag and the body tag. The lang attribute here defines the language of the page and tells the browser which language the page is written in. Uh, in our case, is English. And after that, we have the head tag, which sets the metadata tags and the title tag. The first metadata tag sets the charset attribute, which is UTF-8 in our case. UTF-8 is recommended by HTML5 which, because it nearly contains all the characters and symbols, and the users of our website won't have any problem seeing the website and reading our contents. The, the next metadata uh, data tag is for the compatibility and especially is for Internet Explorer users. So it tells the Internet Explorer to use the recent rendering engine, which is Edge. So Microsoft Edge is not supporting Internet Explorer anymore. So the Internet, Internet Explorer is going to use the, Mar uh, the Microsoft Edge engine instead. Then we have the viewport metadata tag, which sets the width of the screen to device's width. So what that means is uh, when you have a user which is using, for example, a mobile phone, the width of the browser is going to be smaller than the, another user is using the desktop or laptop screen, which is a bigger screen. So this is going, going to automatically adjust the width of the browser. Then we have the initial scale, which is initial zoom level of the browser. And here it is set to be 100% by we can just set it to be 1, which is equal to 100%. And then we have the title tag, which is going to set the title of the browser. So now let's uh, open the our website inside the browser so we can see that this title where I'm going to use a, an extension called live server which is going to create a server for us so if you have this extension you're going to see this go live here at the bottom so we can click on this button and uh, this is going to open the website inside a server called 5000 500 with the port 5500 and the page is open index.html and the title is document here at the top you can see it is document but we can change the title here to the name of our project which is the basic calculator 
and when we change this one this this extension is going to automatically change the everything inside the website which is now you can see this is basic calculator so what we want to do here like the final version we're going to have a div here input and and some buttons okay so let me show you here so we we're going to have one container here which is a which is a div with a class of for example calculator then we have a input then we have another div with a class of buttons let me show you with a different color so this div is the with the class of buttons and we're gonna have these buttons inside this calculator each of them is a button and they have a different class for example the number has the class of number the operator has a class of operator then we have equals and finally we have the clear so let's do this one. Let's bring the website to the right side so we can see the changes in real time. Then let's bring the Visual Studio Code on the left side using the window and the left arrow button. Let's close the Explorer section. And here inside the body section, we're going to create our HTML tags. The first one, as I mentioned, it's a div with a class of calculator. So we just write down dot calculator so when you write down dot calculator this is going to suggest you the a div with a class of calculator if you press enter you can accept this suggestion now we have that div and then inside the div, we're going to have an input. So we're going to have an input. The type of the input is text. And we're going to have an ID for that one, which is going to be result because we want to later target this one using JavaScript. So we need this ID. And also we can, what I want to do here, I want to make this one read only. So when this one is read only, what it does, the read only should be outside as a, so this is a result and outside we have read only. Read only makes this one just a display. You cannot type anything inside this. If you don't have read only, you can type inside the input. So we want to prevent typing inside the input. We just write down read only here because we want to have just write down here using the keyboards. Okay. So after that, we're going to have a div. Inside this, we're going to have a div with a class of buttons, which all the buttons is going to be inside this div. So the first button is going to have the class of clear. And which is going to have the letter C. And this one should be a button, not the div. So I'm going to create a button for it. So as you can see, we have the button now. Next things we need is a button. These uh, actually, the order of buttons is important to have the same structure. So we have C, we have forward slash for the division. Then we have for the multiplication, we have star. Uh, we should just do it like this. It goes this way. Okay. Even after six, uh, we see the uh, equal. And then one, two, three, zero, and the decimal point. 
So the order should be like that. So in order to achieve the same result, so this button is going to have a class of operator. And uh, this is going to be forward slash for division. We're going to have two more operators. So I'm going to copy this one using Alt Shift Arrow done. The second one is the multiplication sign, the star sign, and then we have minus. Okay. After that, we're going to have the seven, eight, and nine, which would be a button with a class of a number. and just the number seven and then we can copy this one two more times using alt shift arrow done and then this is going to be eight and this is going to be nine okay after that we have the plus sign which is a operator as well so we're just gonna add a button with a class of operator and this is going to be the equal sign. Then we have four, five. Uh, sorry, this one is plus sign. Because uh, after nine, we have plus. Then we have three more button uh, numbers. So we're going to have a button with a class of number again. So number. This is going to be four. Copy. Let's copy this one. And let's just say five. And this is six. After that, we have the equal sign, which is the a button with a class of operator again. So for the equal, we don't say operator, we say equals. Okay, and then this is going to be equal. And finally, we have numbers 1, 2, 3, and 0. As you can see here, 1, 2, 3, and 0. So we just will have to create another button with a class of number. And this is going to be one. Let's copy this one three more times. So one, two, three, and finally zero. And after that, we're going to have another button but this time with a class of decimal and this is going to be a dot a period okay so we have just created our html file with our buttons divs and uh, etc so uh, but the style is completely uh, just the HTML, pure HTML. We're going to create this amazing and beautiful modern design using CSS in the next section. So in the next section, we're going to work on the a styling part of the project using CSS. So see you in the next section. All right, in the last section, we have completed the HTML part of the project. We have, we just created these buttons, the numbers, the equals, the clear sign. And in this section, we're going to create and install our project using uh, CSS. If you look at the final version, you can see that we have kind of modern design with some shadow effect for the input but uh, inside 
for the buttons we have also some hover effect some transition and also we have some shadow effect as well so we're going to create and achieve this one using CSS so first things we need to do is to create a CSS file so we, we need to go to Visual Studio Code and we can just open the Explorer section using Ctrl Shift E and here we just create a new file and we just uh, name the file style.css and before using the CSS file we need to add a link to the CSS file inside the HTML file here at the top so after the title we're going to have a link tag so the link tag is going to be just uh, we just write link and then we click on this third author suggestion the one with the CSS this is going to automatically create the link tag for us for this file a style of CSS and uh, here href is just an address of the this file because both files are inside a same directory which is the basic calculator so for the address we just need to have a style.css and this is just a relationship between the HTML and the style sheet here so now we can start a styling our project using CSS the things I want to do first is just the uh, first I want to uh, some basic styling add to everything here you just add a, a star sign what I want to do is to change the box sizing to border box what this one does is by setting box setting this border box is going to ensure that the padding and the borders that borders that we have we add to the elements will be included in the total size if we don't have this one we're going to have problem uh, styling our inputs so later I'm going to show you if you don't have that one what what happens to our uh, styling and also we want to remove the just the basic margin of the page and we set it to be zero in this case we're going to remove the margin around the elements so let's bring this one to the right side so you can see the changes simultaneously and here we can just close the explorer section so we have more space after the basic styling we're going to start with the calculator div which, which we have here the div that is covering everything we're going to style that one we just can target that one by just writing it on dot calculator because this is a class we're going we can simply target this class using dot calculator inside the CSS so what I want to do is first I want to change the background color to be a light gray color which is with this code F2 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 as you can see the, the color is a bit different now then we're going to have some padding so this is going to push everything inside we just set, set the padding to be 20 pixels and then we're going to have some margin first we want to set the maximum width to be 400 pixels which is going to as you can see limit the size to be 400 pixels but we want to center this we want to bring this one to the center here so what we do here it's very simple we just change the margin the top and bottom to zero but we add auto to left and right which is going to make a equal margin to the left and right for us which which, which we are going to uh, which can be 
centered easily here. So after the margin and bring this container to the center, let's add some border to it. So what border we want to add is going to be a solid border, which is just a line. And then it's going to be one pixels. And the color for that one is going to be CCC, which is a darker gray than the background color. And we want to add some box shadow as well. The box, what, uh, what box shadow does is we want to just have zero for the X axis shadow, two pixels for the Y axis. So you see the Y axis, we have shadow, five pixels for blurness of the shadow. And then we want to have some RGBA because we don't want to have a dark color. We want to have some RGBA is a combination of colors, which is, which is red, green, and blue alpha. So we're going to set these values and this is going to give us a color and alpha is a transparency level, the op opacity level. So zero, 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 zero for the black color and 0 0.3 for opacity. So RGPA, not RPG, RGPA, this is correct. So red, green, blue, alpha. So we have now a beautiful shadow effect. And also we want to have some border radius. We want to make the corners to be rounded. So which is going to be more beautiful. So we are going to have some border radius and this is going to be, for example, five pixels. So you should see the border radius here if I zoom it. And uh, that's it for the calculator. So we just want to, the another thing so I want to add is the margin top. So we want to add some space at the top. Uh, this is going to be 30 or 40 pixels. That would be enough. So that's it for the calculator container. Now we want to style this input here. We can target the input by its ID because it has the ID of result. We can target that one here by using a pound sign and we just say result. And we open a set of curly braces and here what I want to do is to set the width to be 100% like this and uh, we add some padding of 10 pixels so it's gonna have more space inside and uh, let's change the font size to be 24 pixels maybe make it's it's going to make the size of the text to be bigger but we don't see anything because we haven't apply the JavaScript, which is going to get all these buttons and show it here. And uh, we want to remove the border. We set the border to be none. But instead of the border, we want to have some shadow effects. So it's going to be like a, it has a shadow, but the shadow is going to be inside, not outside. So we add some box shadow similar to here. Actually, we can use the same color. So I'm going to copy this one. So we get the zero for the X axis, two pixels for the Y axis, five pixels for blurness and this color. But this, as you can see, the shadow is outside, but I want the shadow to be inside. So we just add here inset. As you can see now, the shadow went inside. That's 
going to sh just show like depth for our uh, styling and also we can add some border radius of 5 pixels which is going to have some uh, corner border for the design so that's it for the input section and I want to show you if you don't have that box sizing what happens so if you remove the box sizing as you can see the input is going to be the padding is going to be applied extra for the so this box sizing was very important for styling something like the input so let's bring back the box sizing for the box so and let's continue styling now the buttons so first thing first we want to uh, target this div which is uh, covering all the buttons the div with a class of buttons so here we just say dot buttons we open a set of curly braces and here uh, I want to use the display grid so we make this one grid what the display grid does so it's going to make a grid for us first it's just a grid with the each button went to a one row completely but we're gonna design it in a different way we want to change the display sorry the grid template columns we want to repeat it four times and this is going to be one if r so one fr what is the meaning of one fr i'm going to explain you here so this one this total grid template columns repeat for one a is a css property that sets the size of the each column in a grid container so in this case in our case the repeat for one fr value creates a grid with four equal size columns as you can see we have four equal columns and what if r means here if r unit stands for fractional unit and is used to divide the available space so whatever available space we have here it is going to be for us so it's going to uh, calculate the available space and it's going to create four columns based on this available space for us. So with this one, we are going to have a, a grid container. This grid, con uh, this grid is going to divide into four equal size columns, which is what we want for our calculator layout so all right so now we want to have some a space between the buttons so we're going to have a grid gap let me find it so we just say grid dash gap which is going to be equal to 10 pixels we're going to have some 10 pixel between the uh, gaps okay and also we want to add some margin at the top for 20 pixels okay so it looks better than before but we're gonna style each button separately first we're gonna style the button all of all the buttons and then we're gonna have some special buttons like the clear or and etc so we're gonna have a different color for for example the equal but just first install each of them so we're gonna target this button so the button is the tag is button so we can simply target that one without any dot or pound sign we just write down button so this is going to target all the buttons and let's add some padding to the button of 10 pixels and uh, let's change the font size to be 24 pixels so make them bigger 
let's remove the border. So this is the things we want to do. Remove the border, but we want to add some box shadow. So this is a trick we do to make a beautiful design. We remove the border, but instead we add box shadow. The same system to, uh, sorry, Z for the horizontal onset, uh, offset. Two pixels for vertical offset. Five pixels for blurness radius, and then we have RGBA of 000, 000 for black color and 30% transparency, which is going to give us this design. Let's add some border radius of five pixels, so it we're going to be consistent in all design. Let's set the cursor to be pointer so when we hover over the button we see a pointing hand and uh, let's uh, make this one uh, with it uh, I want to just what I want to do is to create a hover effect In the final version, when we hover over it, we see a different color. So how we achieve this one, it's uh, just uh, we add a button and we just say hover and we can just change the background color to be this color, DDD, which is a um, darker gray color. But this is going to change the color very fast. So in order to prevent that one, we're going to use the transition on the background color. So background dash color. And then the transition duration is going to be 3.3 seconds and with the ease effect. So this is going to change it. A little bit more smooth. So that's it for creating and styling all the buttons. Now we want to set uh, individually target each button. The first things I want to apply is the clear button. The clear button has the class of clear. So we can target that one using dot clear. We're going to open a set of curly braces. We just change the background color to be FF41. FF 36, which is kind of uh, red color. For the color of the text, we're going to use the white color, which is FFS. Okay. This is similar to the final version. I see okay, the equal sign is bigger, so we're going to fix it soon. Next, we want to apply the and uh, style the numbers. So the numbers had the class of numbers, so we just write down number here. As you can see inside the index.html, that all the numbers has the class of numbers, so we can target all of them using dot number. So background color for them is different. They are going to be FF41, 36, F, sorry, FF. Sorry, this one going to be white, FFF. So that was for the clear. And uh, so we're going to have a white color for the buttons. So for, actually the decimal is similar to that one too. So for decimal, actually maybe we don't need to have a different class. Uh, we can just 
we can just say dot main number and dot decimal so we can just target both of them and on also we want to have we want to change the color of the text to be 333 three, three, which is kind of dark gray and then we want to apply the operators we just say dot operator because uh, more, all of the, the operators like uh, minus division they have the class of operator so we can simply uh, style them we want to change the background color to be if if so let me check 0074 D9 which is a blue color and the color of the text is white which is FFS so finally we wanna install the equal sign the equal was equals So the equal sign has the class of equals. We target that one. The background color is going to be green, which is uh, 0, 1, FF, 70. The grid row, because we want to have this one to, to be extended in three rows, so what we do here, we just write down grid dash row and then we just say span. So just this expand this one for three rows. This is going to expand it so three rows as you can see. It's very simple to work with the display grid for design something like a calculator. Then we have the color which is white color FSF so that's it that's it for the styling of the our calculator and this is going to be actually responsive as well we have mobile size and our big size we have the same design as you can see it has its nice in different zoom level we can actually have this design. So that was it for creating and styling our projects using CSS. In the next section we're going to add the functionality to the project using JavaScript. We're going to have some add event listener to this each of these buttons. So we're going to get all this information and we're going to trigger a function which is going to calculate the result and show it here at the top. And also we're going to add some clearing effect here using this C button. So this is going to be very si simple but uh, we're going to use a new method from JavaScript called uh, this is uh, for calculating we're going to use a function called eval so i don't think uh, most of the calculator i see on the internet they just calculated manu manually themselves but there is a new javascript method for calculating operations which i'm going to show you in the next section so see you in the next section for the javascript part of the project Alright, in the last section we have completed the CSS section of our project. We have a styled up project like this. In this section we are going to add more functionality to our project using JavaScript. We are going to add the functionality of calculating the numbers, multiplication, division, 
and etc. So the first things we need to do is to create a JavaScript file inside our project. So we come back to Visual Studio Code and simply we open the Explorer section using Ctrl Shift E and here on the left side in the Explorer section which is in our uh, projects folder basic calculator we're going to create another file and we're going to call it for example script.js or index.js or uh, the most common naming convention is index.js or script.js or some people they call it app.js it's totally up to you so i'm going to call it index.js and like this the things we did for this install CSS, we need to add a link to this file within the HTML code. So we need to come back to HTML file. This time, instead of adding it to the head section, we need to add it at the end of the body section because we need all these elements to be loaded first inside the browser and then we can have access to them using JavaScript. So we need to add the JavaScript at the end of the browser at the end of the body section. So we're going to call it, we just write down SC and we click on the second auto suggestion, the one with the SRC. This is an, a script tag, which is going to connect us to the, um, any scripts like a JavaScript file. And SRC here is the destination of the file. And for us, because both files are located at the same directory, the SRC would be index.js, which is the name of the file. And that is enough for the destination of the file. Now we can use the JavaScript in our projects. The first things we need to do is to bring the elements inside the JavaScript so we can have access to them to add some functionality there. For example, these buttons, we want to add the uh, and add event listener to each of them using JavaScript. So we need to have access to this div with a class of buttons. So we can add actually individually and add event listener to all of them, but there is a simpler way. For example, we can make it for loop inside this div and we can simply just target each of them inside here. So what we do here is uh, we can select all the elements with the, uh, with the tag of button. For example, here inside the index.js, we just create a constant and we call it buttons. Plur plural button, just we just say buttons, elements, we want to get all of them. So we can target the document because we want to check all the document, all the browser, and then we can use the query selector all because we want to select everything with the tag of button. Okay. So now if we, for example, console log buttons element, I'll copy this one, put it here. And if we just open the console using F12, and then if you refresh the page, we can see that we got all the buttons here, which is 17 node list. So we got all the 17 buttons. As you can see, this is just, uh, uh, we have 10 numbers plus four operators, 14 and 15 is 16. Oh, it's 11 numbers, so 70. Because uh, we need to include decimal as well. So we have all the buttons now, we can have access to them. So each of them, 
as you can see, some of them, they have a class of clear. Some of them, they have a class of operator. So what we do here, we add an event listener to each of them. So let's delete this console log. And instead, I'm going to create a for loop. The fourth loop, we're going to create a variable called i which is going to start from zero and then this i is going to continue until the end of the buttons which is 17 but we can just say buttons element dot length so we get the length of this button element which is 17. so this one should be less than this so buttons element that is correct and we want to add this one actually should be a semicolon and then we get another semicolon and then we just say increase the i each time only one so we just say i plus plus so i starts from zero goes one two three until the length of these buttons which is 17 so it's it start from 0 goes to 16 so totally we have 17 iteration so it start from 0 goes until 16 and we have totally 17 iteration and in each iteration we want to add to each button an events listener so we just target this buttons element we want to target each of them so we just say we added set of we add a bracket and then we just add i we got the i element which can be 0 1 2 until 16. so and then we're gonna add an event listener using add event listener method the event listener we want to add is click. So each, each time a person click, we want to trigger a function. So we're going to create a function here. So each time someone click on a button, we want to trigger a function. And then we want to set the, get the value of the button. For example, what we want to do here is, for example, if we console log button this button element i dot text content the text which is inside it for example in index.html the text inside the clear button is c for this one is a division and then multiplication and that's seven eight so now we're gonna console log that so let's open the console again we go to console here. So now each time I click on a button, for example, I click on zero, we get zero because we are getting the text content of that button. So two, three, we can get the equal sign, plus, minus, all of them are working, even the C we get. So we have the value of them. We have the value of them. So instead of console logging, I'm going to, set this one equal to and just call it button value equal to this so we have the button value and then we're gonna add some condition we just say if the button value is equal for example to c just call a function called clear for example results so each time someone press and c call this function but we have to create this function so we're going to create a function And the function's name is going to be clear result. 
for now we just uh, just create the function so we don't get an error but later we're going to add the functionality inside the function so let's continue and complete this uh, if a statement the other condition I want to add we just say else if else if so another condition is if the button's value is equal to equal size equal if this one happens call another function which is calculate calculate results let's create the function here again so we don't get an error so let's create the function and we call it calculate result and just keep continue for the if a statement the next one is otherwise so it can be a number okay otherwise can be zero one two or decimal in this case just add this result at this value this button's value to the uh, to the display so we want to show it inside the display here and also we want to append it there so we're going to call it this function append value and we're going to pass this button value and let's create this function as well here so we're going to create another function called append value okay so we have these three conditions if the value is c we're going to clear the result if it is uh, equal we're going to calculate the result otherwise we want to append the value so so first we start with the append value so the append value we're going to get the value the button value here we're going to get it as an input of the function because we are passing it here we get it as an input and this time we need to have access to this input so we can write it inside the input so if you look at the index.html the input is uh, just a, an input tag with an id of result we can target this one using this id so at the top we're going to target and get that element and bring bring it here so I'm going to call this one input field element and this is going to be equal to document we want to target all the browser and then we can use the method called get element by id and the id of this input was result so the the id is, is result so we can simply target that on just writing down result so now we have access to this one inside the append value we want to uh, target that result result uh, what's what we call it result field in a, uh, sorry input field element and then we got to set the value value of this button value of this input equal to this button value we get but we don't want to make it equal to this one we want to add the new value to the previous one so what we do here we add a plus equal size so for example this value is 2 and the next value is 3 this is going to be 2 3 so I'm going to show you now inside our application if we just write down 1 we see 1 here so 1 is going to stay here 
And then when we press 2, 2 is going to be added to the 1. So 1, 2. So, uh, otherwise, if you just write down equal, this is going to be 4. If you write down 5, it's going to be replaced by the 4. 6, 3. So, in order to keep the previous one, we, get, we add the plus sign. So, this is kind of similar to, we just say, equal this value plus this. So this is a shortcut for this one. This is going to work the similar way. Say one, five, two. So I'm going to just uh, copy this one. And then I show you the both way. So plus equal. And then I'm going to just comment this one for your reference. So you know that this is similar to this one. Okay, so now we have the value, the input field value. What we want to do is to, when we click on the plus sign, we want to evaluate, we want to calculate the result. So inside the calculate result function, we're going to use, uh, we want to, Instead, we want to just say that input field element dot value. We want to replace this one with something called evaluate. Evaluate is a function, is a built-in function of JavaScript that evaluates a string as if it's like a JavaScript code. For example, if we evaluate, for example, 2 multiplied by 5, and if we come back here and we press equal, we get 10. So we get the result of this, uh, uh, like a, we just get the result of this string, whatever it is. So for example, this one plus 1, we get 11, okay? So what we want to calculate is this input field value. Whatever is inside the input, we want to evaluate it and show it inside this input field value. So for example, we just write 45 plus, for example, five. If we click on now equal, we get 50 instead, all right? So, and then for example, now we have the 50 multiplied to five, for example, we get 250. So this equal sign is going to evaluate whatever inside this. Is. So evaluate is actually can be used to evaluate an arithmetic expression entered by the user and return the result. So I give you an example too. So now you understand the evaluate. Some people, they want to create the calculator. I saw online that they calculate each of them separately. For example, they add a condition. They said if, the is, if this operator is multiplication, you multiply it, man, just, uh, just a nonsense, too many uh, if they add, but they can simply use eval to evaluate the whatever inside this. So this was the trick I show you. And the final things is left is this C button. When we click on the C button, we want to clear this input. So inside the clear result, we're going to just set this input field element dot value. We want to set this one to an empty string. So we want to set it to an empty string. So for example, if we now have something, we press C, we completely remove it. So now we calculate something. We see the result. 
and then we can just simply clear that. So that was a very simple calculator. This is very simple. You can add parentheses, for example. If you have parentheses, you, you can have more complex things. And you can add, a, for example, deleting the last letter. So that is the last number. That is very simple too. For example, we write down 45. We can delete only 5, but we added another button. We add a function. And instead of uh, adding that button value, we want to remove the last button value. So you can just do that one as your practice. And you can share it with me as well. So that was it for our projects, creating a simple and basic calculator. I hope you enjoyed and learned many things. So we have learned the function eval. We have learned how to add an event listener to a bunch of buttons using for loop and how to clear, calculate and append a value. So, see you in the next section for another project. Welcome back to another project. In this project, we are going to create a stopwatch. As you can see from the final version of the project, we have a timer at the top and three buttons. A start, a stop and reset. So when we click on start, the type is going to start. We are going to show the milliseconds, seconds, minutes, and hours. And when we press on a stop, this is going to stop the timer using a method in JavaScript called setInterval. And we clear that uh, method using clear interval. Then we have another button called reset which is going to set the timer to zero so we can start from zero. And also, if we press a stop and we press a start again, it's going to continue the time from the previous elapsed time. So we're going to firstly uh, install this project using CSS with this design and hovering effect, as you can see from the buttons. And then we're going to use JavaScript to get the time of the browser, set the uh, elapsed time, and also we're going to manipulate this content and replace it with the time that we are calculating. And also we're going to have these three functionality of a start, a stop, and reset using JavaScript. In the next section, we're going to start with the HTML part of the project. So see you in the next section. All right, let's start our project. So I have put the final version here for our comparison. As you can see, we have this uh, time here and three buttons. And we're going to design the HTML part of this in this section. The first thing we need to do is to create an HTML file. So I'm going to go to my desktop and I, I'm going to open my Visual Studio code. This is the text editor I'm going to use. But you're free to use any text editor that you're familiar with. After closing the Welcome tab, you can just go to the file and click on open folder and here we can cl uh, create a new folder for our project and we can start creating the files inside inside this folder i would like to create the folder in my desktop so i go to my desktop here and here we can create a new folder and we can call the folder the name of our project which is stopwatch so now we have the folder we can click on the select folder to select this folder and this is going to be the default folder of the visual studio go 
And here you can see inside the Explorer section that the folder stopwatch is being opened and we can start creating our files here inside this folder. So let's close the Welcome tab again and here we can click on this icon to create a new file or you can right click and click on New File. And here we can just name the file index.html and we can, uh, we can press enter. Now the file is created. It is completely empty, but we can use an exclamation mark to get an HTML boilerplate, which is suggesting by emit abbreviation, as you can see here in the preview of the boilerplate. So if we can press tab or enter or even click on this first auto suggestion to get this boilerplate. So let me explain this one real quick if you this is your first project. So we have a doc type here which is which tells the browser which version of HTML we are using. As we are using the latest version the HTML5, we can just leave HTML here. And after that we have an HTML tag which is covering both of the head and the body section. The length attribute inside the opening tag of the HTML sets the language of the page and tells the browser the, which language is the page is written in. And in our case the language is English. So we just write down here EN. Then we have the head tag, which includes the metadata tag and the title tag. The first metadata tag defines the charted attributes and tells the browser to use UTF-8. UTF-8 is recommended by HTML5 because it nearly contains all the characters and symbols and the person who is using our website won't have any problem seeing the content inside our website and can see all the characters and symbols. The, ne the next one is the compatibility metadata tag, which tells the Internet Explorer browser to use the most recent rendering engine, which is Microsoft Edge. So this is just for the users who are still using Internet Explorer. Then we have the viewport metadata tag, which sets the width of the screen to device's width. So if you're using, for example, the mobile screen, your width of the screen would be smaller than when you're using, for example, the tablet. So this is always check your width device width and set it to be the width of the browser. So this, in this way, you, you're going to pass the, for example, the SEO of the Google, the, your website would, would be mobile friendly as well. Of course, you have to work more on the mobile friendly section, but this is an essential part of the making a mobile friendly website. And then we have the initial zoom level of the browser, which is 100% by default. And we just set it to be one for 100% of the zoom level. The next tag is the title tag, which is the title of the page. Let's check it inside the browser. I have a, an extension called live server so if you you haven't installed it you just go to your ex, uh, extension part using Ctrl shift x you can search for the live server extension and install this extension if you have this one you're gonna have this go live at the bottom of your page so when you click on it this is going to open your uh, website inside the browser, uh, your default browser, my default browser is Chrome 
and the title as you can see it's document and here we go we can just change the document title and we set it to the name of our project which is stop watch so now if you check the browser we can see that the title is changed to a stopwatch now we can just add other things so as you can see from the final version we have a uh, two parts in our website the first one is going to be a div with the numbers inside it and then we have another div which includes three uh, simple buttons one two three and this is they're going to be next to each other okay and then we bring the visual studio code on the left side so we put the browser on the right side and this one on the left side this let's close the explorer section so we have more space here and let's start creating these two sections inside our website and we should put it inside the body section as I mentioned first we have a div with the number inside it so I'm going to add a div with the ID of we can just say it now, uh, uh, for example timer as you can see I just write down a pound sign with timer and the um, emit abbreviation suggested me a div with the ID of timer so now if I press on tab I get the div with the ID of timer this is a shortcut for creating a div so later on we can use this ID to target this div and manipulate it using JavaScript so we're gonna have a dynamic just time for example so inside this div I'm gonna have the just the time now this is hard-coded as you can see I have a zoom level of 3000 so you can see it better but actually this is this much small but later we're going to style it using CSS so I'm going to keep it uh, open, uh, zoomed, so you can see it better. After that, we're going to have another div with the, with the ID of buttons. So I just add a hashtag or pound sign with the name buttons. And you can see the suggestion here. And when we press enter or tap, you get this div with the ID of buttons. And here we're going to have three buttons. The first button is going to be a start button. So I'm going to add an ID of a start. So I just write down button hashtag start. So we get a button with the ID of start. And the text inside this one is going to be a start. As you can see, the button is created. So the next button is for the stop one. So I'm, this is going to have the ID of a stop and the text inside it would, would be a stop. So the next one is a button with the ID of reset so we're gonna create the reset button let's add this okay so we have now three buttons so let me remove the zoom level so you can see we have three buttons a start stop so let's make this stop uppercase too so we have start stop and reset but the styling is just a pure HTML. In the next section, we're going to work on the CSS and make it like this the, with the pink color and with the hover effect. And you can see that we have it disabled. When we have disabled, we have different styling. Okay, so in the next section, we're going to work on the CSS part. And in the following section, we're going to work on the JavaScript part of the project. 
So see you in the next section for the CSS part of the project. All right, in the last section, we have completed the HTML part of the project. In this section, we're going to work on the CSS part. I'm going to style this project like the one in the final version. We're going to bring them exactly in the center and a pink color, some uh, shadow effects, and also this kind of hovering effect for the buttons. So the first things we need to do is to create a CSS file inside our project. I'm going to open ex the Explorer section using Ctrl, Shift, E. And here we can click on this icon to create a new file and we're going to call it a style.css. And before using this file, we need to add a file, we need to add a link to this HTML file to this file. So we can just can have a connection between the HTML file and the CSS file. The way we do that is to add a link tag after the title. We just write down here link and we click on the third auto suggestion, the one with the CSS. So this is going to create a relationship between the HTML file and the CSS file. And we just write down in the href, which is, which is the address of the file, a solid CSS because both files are located at the same directory. I'm going to close this one. So now we can use the a style, the CSS. So let's start with the body section. So let's style the body section. So inside the HTML, we have the body tag, which is covering everything. And then we have the this div and the other one. So the body section, let's change first the background color. So the background color, I'm going to use a color co uh, with the code F0, 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 which is kind of a dark gray color and a light, light gray color. And then let's change the font of the website by just setting the font family to be Poppins. And then if this uh, font is not available, we can just use send serve. So first is they're going to use this font. If this one is not available for this person's browser, they're going to use Saint Serif, which is the most common one. And most of the browsers uh, understand this font. And then as I want to bring them in the center, all of them, I'm going to change the display to flex. So they're going to be next to each other first but we can change the flex direction to column. So we put them on top of each other. Now we can use justify content center to bring them to the center. Uh, firstly, horizontally, I guess you should see it. Justify content center. And for, for this one, as uh, we want it to be uh, working, because we have a flex direction column, we need to set the height of the, or mean height of the screen to be 100% of the viewport height. So whatever the height of the screen is, they're going to be uh, calculated with any zoom level, you can see they're going to be in the center. So we have now a big zoom level. So now they're in the center. But you can see this uh, actually uh, uh, they call it a scroll. You can see the scroll. If you want to remove this scroll, you can just remove the extra content by 
just saying overflow hidden. So this is going to remove this uh, scroll. Then for bringing it to the center, that was the vertically, this for the horizontally, we can just set the align items center. So this is going to bring them in the center like this. Okay. Now we have completed the body section. The next things we want to style is the this timer. So for the timer, if you remember, we have added the ID of timer. So we can target this div by just saying hashtag timer. If we target that ID. And now what I want to do is to change the font size. Let's remove the zoom level so we can see. Now this is the actual size of the website. Now I want to change the font size to be seven times of the normal size. So se seven REM. So the normal size of the screen, the normal uh, pixels is 16 pixels. But if you use this 7 REM, it means 7 times of the 16 pixels. If the default uh, font level is 16. It's, uh, because this is the default one. But you can change the so size of the font in the setting of the browser. But whatever the setting is, we're going to... Multiply it to 7 to show it. So this is the for the big size. For the mobile size, I want to style it later using media query for making it responsive. So this is going to be smaller later. But for now, we just leave it like that. And then the next things I want to change is the font weight. I want to set the font weight to be uh, the thickness of the font to be 700 so make it thicker let's add some text shadow text shadow is going to add a shadow to this one so how this one works is we just added two pixels shadow for the x-axis you cannot see it because the, both the shadow and the color of the text is black. So let's actually change the color of the text first so you can see the changes in a better way. I want to uh, make the color to be this color. F9, 26, 72. This pink color. Now we can should we should see the text shadow better. So we have the text shadow two pixels in the x axis, two pixels in the y axis, and the color of the shadow I want it to be F eight A five C two. So we can't see it yet. We have to fix this one. This one should be 2 pixels, not 2x. As you can see now, we have a shadow, pink shadow. So if I zoom more, you see it better. We have a shadow. But this color is less pinky than the other one. This is a lighter and this is darker. So it's the beautiful shadow. Okay, so... And then... What I want to do, I want to add a width for this one. I'm going to tell you later why I'm adding a width. Uh, if, if I show you in the final version, when we start, you can see that this number is changing. If we don't add the width, this is going to move too much because the, the length of the uh, length is always changing because the each number has different width. For example, one is a smaller than two. So we're going to set a 
width for this one to always keep this one at the same position. The width I want to add is 600 pixels. And then we want to bring everything to the center using text align center. And also we want to add some margin of 40 pixels for top and bottom and auto for the left and right to always keep everything to the center. So as you can see here, so you don't see it completely in the center. I tell you the reason for that, but uh, let's keep continue and install these buttons first. So for the buttons, we're going to first target this div with the ID of buttons. So we want to bring them, uh, we want to change the display to flex for the buttons. And then we bring them to the center using justify content center. They are already in the center, but just in case, if the size of the screen is bigger, they're going to be, when the buttons are bigger, sometimes they come to the left side. So we just add the justify content center here for this reason. And then we're going to target this buttons, button here, all of them. So we're going to target the button tag. We just say button. So this is going to target all the buttons. Let's change the background color to be uh, this color. I'm going to show you F9, F9 2672, the same color of this. And then we can change the color of the text to be white. We just said text white. Let's remove the border by just saying border and uh, none. And let's increase the size by font size two REM this time. So make them bigger and let's uh, make the font to be font weight to be bold. So they're going to have the uh, a bold text, a thicker text, and then we can add some padding of 1.5 REM for the top and bottom and 4 REM for the left and right. So as you can see, the buttons are bigger now. So let's add some margin so they, ha they have some space between them. This is going to be one REM, as you can see now. We cannot see it in the mobile size properly because we're going to style it for the mobile size separately. And then we want to add some border radius. So we want to make the corners, corners to be rounded. So we, I want to add some 30 pixels border. Uh, so we're going to make it rounded 30 pixels and then we want to set the cursor to be pointer. So when we hover over it, we see a pointing hand like this. And finally, we're going to have some box shadow. Box shadow, we want to add some shadow effect to this one. So two pixels for the x-axis, two pixels for the y-axis, and 10 pixels for blurness. And the color is going to be dark. So we're going to use RGBA, which is the red, green, blue, and alpha. For the red, I'm going to set zero, zero, zero for red, green, and blue. And for the alpha, which is the transparency, is point uh three which is 30 percent transparency you can see the shadow now 
And then when we hover over the button, so for the button, when we hover over it, it means when, uh, when we have a mouse over it, we want to have different background color. So the background color is going to be if 44, 58, 3. So it's a lighter pink. And then what we want to do, we want to change the box shadow. It, it, this is going to be 2 pixels, 2 pixels, and 10 pixels. The same values, but the RGBA is going to be different. Instead of 30%, I'm going to make 50%. So this is going to be darker when we hover over it. But this is going to happen very fast, so we can just add a transition to make it like a, a smoother. So we just add a transition. Transition of, for example, but we we add a transition transition to to the everything, and then we set it to be 0 0.2 second. So this is going to have a transition for the color and the shadow effect. Okay, that was it for the button section. Now we, what we want to do is to, when we have a disabled button, we want to have a different call. In the final version, as you can see, if we stop this, so when we the button is disabled, it has a different color. We can do that by just saying button. We add a bracket and then we just say disabled. Disabled, and then we just change the opacity to be 50%, and then we set the cursor to be default instead of the pointer. So now we don't have any disabled. If I add a disabled to one of them, for example, the uh, stop one, we just say disabled. Now, as you can see, the mouse is different and then has a opacity of 50%. Okay, so let's remove this disabled for now. So after this one, we're going to make it responsive. We're going to add a media query. And then for the media query, we just, we just say if the size If the max width is equal to 800 pixels or more or less, for example, the max width is this one. We're going to have a different a styling for the timer. For example, we want the font size to be 4 REM instead of 7 REM. So this is going to be smaller, as you can see. And then the width is going to be 350 pixels instead. And then for the button, for the all the button, I want to change the font size to be 1.5 and then padding of 1 REM at 2 REM. As you can see, the buttons got smaller. In the mobile size, we can see that. So I'm going to show you. So when we pass the 800 pixels, now this is just uh, less than 800. 
after 800, they get bigger like this. So we have a trigger point of 800 pixels here. After that, less than 800 pixels, we have these extra stylings. Okay. This is you, the way you make a responsive website. Okay. So that was it for the CSS part of the project. In the next section, we're going to add the functionality of a start, a stop and reset buttons. And we're going to work on the functionality and make it like a final version. So it has like a start, stop, reset. So in the next section, we're going to work on the JavaScript part of the project. So see you in the next section. All right, in the last section, we have completed the CSS part of the project. In this section, we're going to work on the functionalities by adding the JavaScript file. First things we need to do is to create a JavaScript file. So I'm gonna open the Explorer section using Ctrl Shift E. And here we can just click on this icon to create a new file. I'm going to call it, we can call it, for example, app.js, index.js. Uh, so I'm just going to call it index.js. And we need to add a link to this file inside the HTML file as well. So we go to the index.html and just at the end of the body section, we add a script tag. We just choose the second auto suggestion, the one with the SRC and the uh, the destination would be index.js because both files are located at the same directory. So the address would be index.js. And the reason we put this script tag at the end of the body section, because we need the browser to actually load all the elements first and then call the JavaScript. Otherwise, we don't have access to these buttons or this timer to manipulate. So we you always have to add the in, script tag at the end, or if you add it at the top, you need to prioritize it to, to be loaded at the end. Okay. So now we just have the script tag at the end. Now we can use the JavaScript file. So let's close this section and we go to index.js. The first things we need to do is to get the reference to this uh, timer and the buttons. So we need to bring them here. So as you, as you have remember, now we have this timer with the idea of timer, and then we have the buttons, the start, the stop, and reset with these IDs. So we can bring them here. I can create a constant. For example, I call it timer element. And this is going to be equal to the document dot get element by ID timer. As you can see, we I'm getting this suggestion. We have I have a GitHub Copilot, but uh, I I recommend you don't use it for if you're a beginner because uh, it's 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 good to learn the basics first and then use this kind of extra AI assistant. So I'm going to stop it for suggestion. We have used the get element by ID method, which is going to target the element with the ID and the ID it was timer. So we have added timer here. After that, we're going to bring the other elements. Let's create another constant. This one is going to be the start button element and this is going to be equal to document dot get element by ID and the ID for this one is just a stop here you can see this is a stop a stop Sorry, this is a start, so we need to add the start here 
for the other ones, I'm just going to copy this one two more times. And then I just change the name, a start here to, for example, stop. Uh, you can use Ctrl D to select both of the start and then you just say stop. Okay. You can do this for this one as well. You just mark it, use Ctrl D to both both of them, and then we just say, for example, reset. Okay. Now we have access to all these four items. Now we can manipulate them. The first things I want to do, I want to add some events listener to this button. So for example, if we click on this start, we're going to trigger a function called a start timer and then a stop timer, reset timer. So we're going to have to target that one. We just say a start button element. We add an event listener. We just say add event listener. The event we want to add is click because when we click on it, we want to trigger a function. And the function we want to call is going to be a start timer. But we need to create this function here. So I'm going to create in a, in a function. I call it a start timer. And this is going to we just for now we just console log a start so if we open the console using f12 inside the browser we just say f12 and let me bring this one at the bottom so if we go to console here if we press on the start, we see the start here. Okay, so we're gonna we are calling this function, which is console logging a start. And uh, let's do the same things for the a stop and reset timer. So I'm gonna copy this one using Alt Shift arrow down two times. For the start, we just lose uh, Ctrl D to use uh, start, and then make this one. Uh, stop. The next one is going to be reset. Okay. And then we're going to create two more uh, functions. The, this one is going to be a stop. And this one is going to be reset. So now if I click on the start, I see start, a stop. Oh, I have to change this one too. So this one is going to be a stop and this one is going to be reset. Okay. A start, a stop, reset. So yeah, we are calling the correct function now. Now we can just uh, create a variable for having a reference and track the time the time that is passed and also the time intervals. So we, if you look at the final version, when we press on the start, the time starts. So we have a start time, but uh, a start time is different. When we click now on the start, the start time is uh, four seconds and 94 milliseconds. But when it's reset, the start time is zero. So we have to define the elapsed time as well, the time that is passed, so we can track both of them. So we, we're going to create two variables at the top using led. And I just call the variable, for example, a start time. And this is going to be zero by default. Then we have another one called elapsed time.
which is going to be zero as well. And then we have the another variable called time intervals, which is going to calculate these times every, for example, 10 seconds using a function called set intervals. So I'm going to call this one timer interval so this one we don't need to have any initial value so when we press on the start we want to firstly define the start time so we just say start time A start time should be calculated based on the time of your browser. So we can get using date.now. And as I mentioned before, sometimes it's zero because first is zero. But if I want to start again, it should be subtracted from the elapsed time. So this is elapsed time. So its start time should be date now minus elapsed time. So elapsed time ca uh, can be zero if uh, this one is uh, completely from beginning or someone comes in the website. But if the timer is already started, uh, the elapsed time should be calculated and be tracked. So now we have the start time. Now we should uh, use, we define the time interval and this is going to be equal to set interval, which is a function, built-in function from JavaScript, which is going to call a function every, for example, 10 milliseconds. So this is one millisecond 10 and if you want one second this is uh, this one because we want to show the milliseconds the best way is 10 milliseconds but you can use one millisecond but it's not necessary to actually increase the computation time of your browser and makes your website slow so 10 is better so this is going to call this function every 10 seconds so now, so we call this function and we're going to update the elapsed time every 10 milliseconds. So elapsed time is going to be equal to date dot now, which we can get from the browser minus the time of the start. So whatever the time start is, we do, uh, do subtract from the date now, and this is going to be elapsed time now that we calculated this one. We need to update the this value here, this zero. So we can simply update that using a method called text content. So we just said timer element which is we have uh, defined here we got it from the uh, our html so we are updating this part so we're going to just uh, say text content we want to change its content and we set it to be for now, we just say elapsed time. I want to show you what happens. So let's close the console. So now if we, let me decrease the size. If we press a start, then it should, uh, let's refresh the page. As you can see now, it's, updating every 10 milliseconds and showing the elapsed time. 
So this elapsed time is based on milliseconds now, but we want to show the hours, minutes, seconds, and milliseconds, not only the and then we have to refresh the page to stop it. Okay. So we are getting the elapsed time now. We are showing it inside the timer element. But now, instead of just elapsed time, we need to format this time. So we need to format it. So I'm going to create another function called uh, format time. So, and then I'm going to call this function and wrap it around this elapsed time. And this one is going to get this elapsed time as an input. And then we want to just update this one and format it to hours, minutes, and etc. So we're going to create another variable here. So we just create a cons uh, constant and we call it hours. Oh, first we get the milliseconds. That's fine. So we just say milli. We start from milliseconds. So milliseconds because that's the easiest one. This is going to be equal to whatever is the elapsed time is. We uh, we keep the remainder of this one the uh, by thousand. So we divided this elapsed time by thousand, and then we just keep the remainder. Okay, and this one should be. Divided by 10. And this is going to be milliseconds. And then we need to return. First, we need to just um, uh, make it uh, rounded by just because this is a mathematical e equation. So it's going to be not rounded. So we can just say uh, math.floor to make it rounded. And then we can just return milliseconds for now. Let's see what we get here. So when we start, we see the milliseconds. Uh, we didn't floor it completely. We see still this is only millisecond, but still we have one digit here. So I'm going to fix this one because we have to map floor all of them, not only the first part. So I'm going to wrap everything here. So now if we start, we just see the milliseconds now. Okay. But milliseconds, as you can see, it starts from uh, one and then we don't see the zero at the beginning. So we want it to be like the final version here. We should, we want to see that uh, this uh, time zero when we have like a zero one zero two. So this is going to be more clean. So we can just add a condition. We just say if the millisecond is more than nine, if this condition satisfied, just the uh, returns milliseconds. Otherwise, just add a one zero at the beginning of the milliseconds. Like this. So now, we should see a zero at the beginning when it's small.
Okay, we have just got the milliseconds. Let's continue, get the hours, minutes, and seconds as well. So let's do the seconds. This is going to be similar. The second is going to be uh let me copy this one so we just change this one. We have to floor it as well. And then this is going to be elapsed time. The remainder of the elapsed time of the divided by 1000 multiplied to 60. We have to add 60 to get the seconds. And then we divide it by 1000, not 10. So this is going to give us the seconds and then we need to return it here as well. So I'm going to wrap the return. Uh, let's bring this one down. So this is a millisecond and then we just add some dots here between the millisecond and second. And then at the top, let's close this one. We add the condition two. We just say if the seconds exist, if the seconds is not zero, then if the seconds is greater than nine, then just return the seconds. Otherwise, add, a z add the zero at the beginning of the second. Okay. But if the seconds is zero, this one is just a, if this one is n not zero, Add a zero at the beginning. If it's zero, just return zero, double zero. Seconds is different, so let's check it. Now we we are we are just saying I think both uh, milliseconds. Let's see. So the seconds uh, okay, this one actually this parenthesis shouldn't be here. Let's check. So it should be divided by 1000 multiplied to 60 and then divided by 1000. Uh, let's remove this parenthesis here. Let's test. Okay, we missed the parenthesis here. I think this, now it's working. So this is second now, milliseconds working too. Okay, now let's do the minutes. So the minutes is going to be similar. We just need to add 60 to the seconds. So I'm just copy seconds, I change it to minutes. Minutes, that in you here. And then this is going to be divided by 1000 multiplied to 60. And then we need to add another 60 and another 60 here. The 1000 multiplied to 60. And then we need to show it at the top. So this is going to be similar too. So I'm going to copy this. One, put it at the top. 
instead of that, I want to have a clone here. Just change this second to minutes. Okay. Uh, let's test this one too. So we see here, we have to wait 60 seconds this one until it goes. So until this one pass, I'm going to create the hours as well. This is similar. So I'm going to copy this. And this is going to be hours. So the hours is just the time. We don't need any remainder. We just said time, elapsed time divided by 1000 multiplied to 60 multiplied to 60. And we just need to remove this parenthesis. We don't need that parenthesis. Okay, that's. No, yes. Okay, that's fine. That is ours, and uh, let's add it at the top. So this is going to be. I'm gonna just choose it using Ctrl D. I just change it to ours. Okay. So milliseconds has double D. So I'm going to fix this. Okay. So now it's working. So that's uh, that. I think that's uh, that's working because I know the logic. I've tested it before. And uh, the other things we want to do. So let me explain it again. So we have calculated the milliseconds, seconds, minutes, and hours based on the elapsed time. And then we have just formatted them and add zero to, at the beginning if they are less than nine. If they are zero, we just add double zero. And now the when we created this in a start time, what we do when we press a start, I want to disable the start button. So here at the end of this uh, function, a start time, I'm going to target the start button. And then I want to disable it. So we just say dot disable is going to be equal to true. And then what I want to do, I want to make the a stop one false. So if the stop one is already disabled, I want to enable it. So now when we press on the start, we cannot press on the start again. It's disabled. So let's do complete the a stop function as well. So in the stop function, what we do is to clear the interval. So interval is working here. Time interval is working every 10 seconds. We need to stop that. There is a function in, uh, in JavaScript called clear interval. So we need to call this function and this is going to just clear the timer interval variable that we have created at the top. So now if we press start and then we press stop, this is going to stop the timer by clearing the time interval. And what we want to do, we want to enable the start button here. We want to just say a start button dot disabled. I just can I just can copy these two, but we have to do the opposite. So 
we have to enable the start button. So I'm going to make the disable false. And I want to disable the stop button by just setting the disable to true. So now we have this a start button is disabled. When we press on stop, this is going to disable the stop button and enable the start. Now we can start again. As you can see, it's working. So let's now work on the reset button. For the reset button, we have to do the, an extra things. We have to clear the interval. Let's copy this. So we need to clear the interval. We need to make the start button enabled. And uh, the other things we want to do is to set the elapsed time to zero. And also we want to so if this one, we press reset, uh, let's see, stop reset timer, it makes it this zero, if you start, it starts from zero, as you can see, it's resetted and it starts from zero, but we want the, this one to be shown zero as well, so we have to just change the timer element that text content to be zero. So we just say zero, zero, zero. So when we start, we can stop it. We can press on the reset to completely reset, set the elapsed time to zero and show the zero at the timer as well. Okay, let's review what we have done. So for the start time, we have calculated the start time based on the date in the current time of the browser using this dot now. And then we have declared a set interval, which is going to call this uh, function here every 10 milliseconds, which is going to update the elapsed time and also the content inside this element. Then we set the uh, button to true, the disable it, and also we enable the uh, stop button. We have format the time based on the elapsed time. And also we have a stop the timer using this function. We clear the interval. We set the button, uh, disable it. Uh, we, we enable the start button and disable the stop button. And finally, we have reset the timer by just calling the clear interval and also set the elapsed time to zero and the text content to this web string. All right, so that was it for our project. I hope you enjoyed and learned many things. See you in the next project. Welcome back to another project. In this project, we're going to create a rock, paper, scissors game. As you can see from the final version of the project, we have three choices to choose rock, paper, and scissor. And if we click, for example, on the rock symbol, we're going to see the result, which is in this case is a tie. And as you can see, the scores are still the same. For us, it's zero and the computer is zero. If we choose another choice, it's still we get the tie. Now we lost the game and uh, as you can see the rock beats the scissor because the computer choice was rock and our choice was scissor. So we lost the game and uh, the computer gained an, an, a score of one. So if you keep continue playing this, uh, this time we won and then rock beats scissors. So because the choice of us was rock and the choice of the computer was scissor. 
So we're going to firstly uh, create the projects using HTML and then we're going to style it using CSS with this modern design and then we're going to use JavaScript to randomly create some choices for computer and then compare it with the choice of us by tracking the uh, our choice and the computer and compare them. We can just uh, print some text here and also we're going to track the numbers and the scores of the user and the computer here at the bottom. So in the next section, we're going to start with the HTML part of the project. So see you in the next section. Welcome back to the project. In this section, we're going to create the HTML part of the project. As you can see, I have put the final version here for our comparison. As you can see, we have a title, we have three kind of emojis for rock, pepper, and scissors, and also we have the uh, scores. So we need to create an H1 tag for the title. We have a paragraph here, and also we have a div with three buttons. And finally, we have the scores at the bottom. So first things we need to do is to create an HTML file. So I'm going to create the project in my desktop. So I'm going to go to my desktop and I'm going to create a new folder. I'm going to call the folder the name of the project, which is rock, paper, and scissors. We just say rock, paper, and scissors game. And uh, when we create the folder, we can just right click on it and click on open with uh, code, which is, which is going to open it with Visual Studio Code. So I'm, I'm going to use Visual Studio Code. That is my favorite uh, text editor, but you are of course free to use any text editor that you are familiar with then uh, we have now visual studio code with the rock paper and scissors folder uh, open on it inside the explorer section and here now we can create a new file and we can call this file index.html so we have created the file now, it's completely empty, but we can use an exclamation mark to create an HTML boilerplate. So if you write down exclamation mark and just click on the first auto suggestion, do you get an HTML boilerplate, which, is, which includes the doc type, the HTML tag and the body and uh, hidden body sections. Let me explain this one real quick. If you're, this is your fir uh, first project. Here, doc type tells the browser which version of the HTML we are working on. As we are using HTML5, we just need to have HTML here to tell the browser that we are using HTML5. Then we have the HTML tag, which is covering both of the head and the body section. The lang attribute here defines the language of the page and in our case, the language is set to be English by just setting en. And uh, we have the head tag, which includes the metadata tags and also the title tag. The first metadata tag defines the char set attribute and UTF-8 is recommended by HTML5 because it nearly contains all the characters and symbols. For example, the users come to website and want to see these symbols, these uh, fonts. They won't have any problem seeing these characters and symbols because the UTF-8 is most common one. Then we have the 
compatibility metadata tag for the Internet Explorer browsers, which tells the Internet Explorer browser to use the most recent rendering engine, which is Microsoft Edge. After that, we have the viewport metadata tag, which sets the width of the screen, width of the browser to width of the device's screen. For example, if you have a mobile screen watching the website, you're going to have a smaller screen than the person is watching a tablet or a desktop computer. Here we have the initial scale, which is initial zoom level of the browser, which is 100% in our case by setting the default value to 1. Finally, we have the title, which is document. And uh, we can see the title inside the browser. If you open the browser, we, I'm going to use the, an ex extension called Live Server. So if you have installed this, otherwise you just go to your extension using Ctrl Shift X and just search for live server. And here you can just find this extension. I have already installed it. You can install this one, which is going to create a server, local cell server for you. And if you have installed this one, you can use this button here, go live or you can right click and use open with live server, which is going to open your website inside the browser. And this is going to refresh this website each time you save the browser, if you have already set the auto save for your uh, website, for your Visual Studio code. We have now the document as our title inside the website. Let's change this title to the name of our project, which is Rock Pepper Scissors Game. Now, if you look at our website, you can see that the title is changed to Rock Pepper Scissors Game. So let's bring the website on the right side by using where the start key in Windows and right arrow, arrow right key. And we can bring the Visual Studio Code on the left side so we can see the changes in real time. After that, we can just add our H1 tag with the name of our project. So you can see it inside the website, Rock Paper Scissor Game. So now we have the title, as you can see. After the title, we're gonna have a paragraph saying, choose your move. Then we have, we're going to have three buttons. So I'm going to put the three buttons here. Just uh, as you can see, we have three buttons, rock, paper, and scissors. So as I want to bring them next to each other, not on top of each other. That's why I put them inside a div. And then uh, we're gonna set the div with a class of buttons. And then here, I'm gonna press enter by just, for creating this div with a class of buttons, you just need to write down dot buttons and press enter. And here we can just have our first button. And then uh, as you can see, I'm getting a suggestion from GitHub Copilot. GitHub Copilot is not free. If you want to use GitHub Copilot, you need to pay $10 per month. But if you are a student, you can have this extension for free, which is going to suggest you 
some codes based on your uh, based on your previous codes and the codes online. So you can just search GitHub Copilot. So I have already installed it. I think it's not this it, GitHub Copilot. It is a AI pair programmer which is going which is using GPT uh, for suggesting a uh, real time in your internet uh, in your Visual Studio Code. But if you don't want to use it, it's totally up to you. You can just type whatever you want here. So I'm going to get the suggestion here. Three buttons, rock, paper, and scissors. The, each button has an ID. The first one is rock, paper, and scissors. But instead of just the text rock, I want to use the something called HTML entities. HTML entities, it's like uh, some symbols you can use inside your website, but they have some codes, so you have to write that. For example, for rock, you have to write down M and pound sign X one F 44 A. As you can see, we can just get the let me zoom. You can see the rock symbol emoji. For the paper, we have this emoji, which is an, a pound. It can be lowercase, it doesn't matter. 1F590. And then you you need to add a semicolon at the end too. Okay, for the scissors, and uh, I use end pound sign x two seven zero c and this. Okay, so now we have the three emojis by just writing down these HTML entities. If you don't know which a symbol you use, you just uh, search online HTML entities, for example, for a uh, rock hand symbol or paper hand symbol or something like that. You can find plenty of website that is showing you these symbols. You can copy and paste. Okay, after creating these buttons, we're going to have a paragraph here. Showing the results, I'm I'm just want to create a paragraph with the class with an ID of result. Which is just uh, we can just say for now hard coded U one. And then after that, you're going to have another paragraph with the idea of a score, a scores. Inside this one, you're going to have, uh, you're going to say your your score okay you can just say your score and then this id i want to set it to be for example your uh, player score or the user score after that we're going to have the computer score and then we have this span with the id of computer score so we're going to use this ID to target this uh, spam using JavaScript and then we're going to dynamically change this uh, score from 0, for example, to 1, 2, 3. 
But for now, we just uh, hard coded these values because we want to use CSS in the next section to style this uh, HTML tags and uh, text. So as you can see, we just have a paragraph with the idea of scores and then we're going to have this paragraph, your score zero and computer score zero. And then we have three buttons and the H1 tag and a paragraph saying choose your move. So that was it for the HTML part of the project. In the next section, we're going to work on the CSS part of the project and style it like this modern design using CSS. So see you in the next section. All right, in the last section, we have completed the HTML part of the project. In this section, we're going to work on the CSS part and style the project like the one in the final version with the background color. And also we're going to have some background colors for the emojis. We're going to bring everything to the center and etc. So the first things we need to do is to create an HTML uh, uh, we need to create a CSS file. We need to open the Explorer section and we just create a new file and we call it a style CSS. And we need to add a link for this file inside the HTML file. We can just go, let's close this one. You need to add it at the inside the head tag. You just need to add a link tag. You just write down link and click on the third auto suggestion, the one with the CSS. And here the href would be styled CSS because both files are located at the same directory. The destination would be solid CSS. And the, this is a relationship between the HTML file and this SL sheet. It's style.css. So now we can use the style.css for our project. The first of the the first part of the project we want to target is the body section. So inside the HTML we have a body section that is covering all the project. So I'm gonna uh, target the body tag. We're just writing body. And then we want to do some, you know, for example, I want to change the background color. The color I want to use is kind of a light gray, which has the number F1, F1, F1. You can see this color. After that, we're going to have a font family. I want to change the font of the text using font family. The font I want to use is uh, Arial. Uh, let's add the semicolon here. We forgot the semicolon. So I want to use the this font is a uh, Arial, and if the Arial is not, or Arial is not available, the send serif is going to be used inside the project. I want to remove the default margin and padding for the project as well. So this is going to connect this one to the wall. As you can see, we have removed the default margin. So we have finished with the body section. Now we're going to work on the H1 tag, this tag. So we're going to target this H1 tag. So what I want to do is uh, actually set the font size. to be, we can just choose 2REM. 2REM means 
two times of the default value of the REM is the default value of the font size, which is a 16 pixels. So we get a double of that. Let me remove the zoom level so you can see the changes uh, in a real way. And then I want to bring the, this one to the center using text align center. And let's add some padding at the top. of 100 pixels so it's going to push it a little bit down after the h1 tag we're going to target this paragraph the first paragraph choose your move and also i want to target the other paragraphs too so i'm going to just choose a p tag and uh, Let's change the font size. We could we get this suggestion that is okay. We we're gonna set this font size to 1.2 REM. We wanna bring it to the center using text align center. And after that, I'm gonna have some margin at the bottom of uh, for example just a 0.5 REM, which is eight pixels, which, which is going to add some space between them. So everything looks okay, but uh, I'm gonna just uh, style this button first. So first we target this div with the class of buttons. We're gonna bring the items in the center so we're going to use a button. We're going to target the, the div with a class of buttons. So we just write down the dot buttons because this is a class. We added dot at the beginning. So the display is going to be flex. Justify content center. We don't need this margin bottom here. So justify content center is going to bring everything to the center, as you can see, horizontally. Display flex is going to just, uh, in order to use justify content center, you need to ch change the display to flex. After that, we're going to target the button, each button. So because we want to target the button, and then we can just say button, we target the the button, sorry, the tag button. I want to remove the border. So I set the border to be none. Uh, let's uh, change the color. Uh, sorry, we don't need to change the color. We, uh, we just want to change the font size to be 3 REM. So we make them bigger. Let's add some margin. Uh, top and bottom zero. Left and right to be 0 0.5 REM, which is going to add some space between them. And then we have some padding of a 0.5 REM. You cannot see the padding, but when we add the background color, you can see the padding clearly. So now, uh, and then uh, when I hover over them, I want to see uh, the cursor to be pointer. So I'm going to change the cursor to be pointer. So when we hover over them, we see a pointing hand. So let's so let's add some background so you can see the changes more. For now, I just I want to add some background color. For example, this color. Now I want to just change the border radius to be 
five pixels, which is going to make it rounded in the corner. And then when we hover over these buttons, so we can just target this hover with a pseudo class of, uh, sorry, we, we just target these buttons with a pseudo class of hover. So when we hover over this button, I want to change the opacity to be, for example, 80% or 70%. So when we hover over them, we see uh, they are like a lighter color. So it's kind of hovering effect. And then this hovering effect is super fast. I want to add some transition. So it uh, looks like a smoother. So I'm going to uh, add a transition to all. 0.3 seconds with ease in and ease on effect. So when we just, uh, you see the transition here when we hover over them. So now let's, uh, we can just remove the background color. I want to choose a background, different background color for each of them. For example, I want to target the uh, rock. one and uh, let's see what's we just want to change the background color it's kind of red it is fine and then we want to target the pepper uh, this one looks okay too but i want to use the blue color which is 21 96 f3 and then we're going to have the scissors with the green color. That's the size. So as you can see, we are getting suggestion from GitHub Copilot. Before I have decided to not teach with the GitHub Copilot, but as the AI advances every day, I think it's essential to know how to use AI to code faster. So you can just uh, use code GitHub Copilot or any other AI assistant to code faster, but I think it's essential to understand each code. For example, what this one does and why we just could use, for example, pound sign. For example, we had this ID of the rock. We have used this pound sign or the hashtag for the targeting the rock. So these things you need to understand but uh, for coding faster you can use these assistants and finally we're going to just style this player a user score and the computer score i want to make the user score color to be uh, for example green and the computer to be red so we can just target that one using the pound sign. We just say user score. And then we can just. So we just change the color. Let's see what color suggestion we get. We get blue. That is fine. And then uh, we get the computer score, which is red. That's fine. So that's uh, that's that was it for creating our final version. As you can see, in the next section, we're going to work on the functionality using JavaScript. As you can see, now we are choosing the different things. We see, it, for example, this one is tie game, and then our score is going to be recorded here. As you can see, your score, the computer score as different and you can see it so in the next section we are going to okay i think our design is okay in the next section we're going to work on the javascript part of the project to add functionality like event listener to the buttons and then we're going to calculate who won the game and also we want to create some random 
variables which is going to create the computer decision on the rock, paper, and scissors. And based on these decisions, we're going to compare our decision, I mean the user's decision and the computer decision. And then finally, we decide who won the game and then we store the game inside here. So see you in the next section for the JavaScript part of the project. All right, in the last section, we have completed the CSS part of the project. In this section, we're going to work on the JavaScript part and add more functionalities to the project. The first things we need to do is to create the JavaScript file inside our folder. So we need to open the Explorer section using Ctrl Shift E. And here we can just create a new file and we, I'm going to call the file index.js, but you can call it, for example, script.js, app.js. It's totally up to you. And Similar to the one we have done for the CSS file, we need to add a link to this JavaScript file inside the JavaScript, inside the HTML file. So, but instead of just putting it inside the head section, we can, we have to put it at the end of the body section because we need this uh, file to be loaded and then we just uh, call the JavaScript file and add the functionality. Otherwise, the JavaScript cannot have access to these elements. So, the script tag we have, and then the, the file name is index.js in my case, and as are, they are on the same directory, we just need to write down index.js inside the SRC. So now we can use the in, uh, index.js inside our projects. So first things we need to do is to bring these buttons here. We need to have access to these buttons. So the buttons, they have the tag of button. So we can target that one using a method called query selector all. So we just create a constant and we call it buttons element. or we can just say button, I'll just say buttons, and then we just use, uh, we just target the document, which means all the browser, and then we use query selector all to select everything with the tag of the button here. So now we have access to the button. Now we can just, uh, add an event listener to the button so when we click on it we can just call a function or do some other stuff so we just say buttons and we add we can use for each method to target each button as you can see from the suggestion and then we can add an event listener so we get each button here for after using the for each gives you each button and then you can add an event listener to each button. The event listener we want to use is click. So when we click on the button, we're going to trigger a function. So for example, here we have console log, you clicked me. So, and then also where I want to show the which button we have clicked. So we just say button because we have the button ID and then the ID is rock. So we can target that one, we just say button dot ID. But uh, this is should be this should be outside this. Okay. So let's see uh, let's open the console using F12. Let's bring the console on the bottom here. Now we have the console. Let's. Now, yeah, let me bring this one a little bit upper. Okay. Let's clean the console. If I click on this rock symbol, uh, let's refresh the page. Let's 
when I click on the rock, we should see the rock being console lock. So we are, we are getting an error. Let's see. We I think we have missed some parentheses here. Okay, I think I yes, we need to add a parenthesis here. So now if I click on the rock, I get you got you clicked me rock. If I click on the just a hand sign, we just say you got uh, you click me paper and then scissors. So we have access to these IDs now. But instead of just console logging, I want to uh, create a function and compare this ID with the one that the computer chooses. So uh, first, I want to create a function that is going to create the. Let's create a function which is gonna call computer play. As you can see, we get the suggestion. So computer play, what he does, we have some choices, rock, paper, and scissors inside this array. And we put it inside this constant called choices. We want to use a random choice. We use a method called random to create a number between 0 and 1. And then we're going to uh, multiply this one to the, the length of this array which is now uh, 3 okay but uh, the array starts from 0 1 2 okay so this is going to cre create some number between 0 1 and 2 and then we get this number and we put it inside this array is a choice. For example, if the number is calculated 1, we get pepper. If it's 2, we get uh, scissors. And if we choose a 0, we get rock. So this is going to return that one. Return that choice. And then uh, here the math.floor actually, because the random number is between 0 and 1, and it can be 0, it can be 0 0.1, 0 0.2, but we want to just make it rounded to the floor using math.floor. So now we, we can calculate the player, the computer. We can just create, uh, we can just get this choice and put it here. For example, I want to console log and this is our choice, the first one. We can just call it user choice. And then we can just console log computer choice as well. And then we can just uh, call this function. So now if I click on the rock, so let's refresh the page. When I click on the rock, user choice is rock, the computer choice is paper. Paper. So each time we get a random computer choice and then we can choose. For example, I choose the this uh, scissor. So you user choice is scissor and the computer one is rock. So now we have this system, but we have to compare this one and uh, decides who wins the game okay so instead of just console logging i want to create another function i just want to create a function a call a function called play round and this function is going to pass two things the one, the choice that we have, and also the choice of the computer. So play round, uh, let's make it a camel case. So now we need to create this function. 
So I'm going to create this function play round, which is going to get the player selection and the computer selection. And also you can see from the suggestion, let me just paste the suggestion. But I just choose tab to accept the copilot suggestion. As you can see, if the player selection and the computer selection is equal, for example, I use rock, the computer uh, choice was rock, it's going to return it's a tie. But if the player is rock and the computer is scissor or the player is paper, paper and the computer is rock, and then if the player selection is scissors and the uh, computer uh, selection is paper, this is going to return you win. And this is going to show the player selection, which is yeah, rock, for example. We just say rock beats, for example, the scissor. Otherwise, we, we're just going to say you lose and the computer selection which is, for example, scissor is going to beat the player scissor, uh, player selection, which is, for example, anything. For example, now let's see you and what we get here. So now we get the player play round. So we get the both of the input. So we pass this input button ID and the computer play. So when we just pass this one and we get it here inside this function, we use these two inputs to calculate who wins the game. And we're going to return this text. You win, you lose, or it's a tie. So now I think we can, let me console log this one. So after the player, let's console log. I think they, uh, we can uh, we, we set this one to something like a result and then we can just console log result so let's see if I choose this rock, so we're getting an error. Log is not defined. Okay, we are we are returning. Uh, and it should be fine. Let me refresh the page. Okay. So I choose the paper, and then I lost. Paper beats rock because the choice of the computer was rock. My choice was paper, so I lost the game. If I choose the scissor, as if I choose this uh, paper, this time I lost too because the computer. Oh, sorry, the, that was my my choice. Rock was my choice. Paper was computer choice, so I lost the game. So I want to win one time. So this is a tie, two times tie. I lost. I'm not going to win. Oh, okay, I won. So I choose the scissor and scissor beats paper. So computer choice was paper. So now we are getting this result and we are console logging the result. But I'm the, I'm, I don't want to console log the result. I want to instead uh, change this u1 which is hard coded for now here this result with this uh, result section so uh, we're going to after this after the play round we calculate this one uh, we return everything here now instead of console logging we got the result i want to just uh, 
I want to bring that this ID, the result, this paragraph, and uh, change it here. So I'm going to bring this paragraph. I just want to call it uh, result element. And this is going to be, uh, we can just target that one using query selector. And then we just target this uh, result. This is one way. The other way is use the get element by ID method. And then we can just pass the ID, which is result. Now we have this result element. Uh, we can just uh, change its value. We just say result element dot text content. We set it to be this result. Text content is going to change the content inside that value. So now if I choose, for example, rock, I lost the game because the computer choice was paper. So paper beats rock. So I choose again. It's a tie. This one tie, tie. And then now uh, again, I lost. So as you can see, it's working and showing the result here. But we are not tracking the a score here. It's, a score is always zero for the user and the computer. So we're going to uh, track the a score as well. So we have just uh, returned something here, but we haven't calculated else uh, actually the the score of the player. So I'm going to create two variables here using let the 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 variable the first one is player score and then the other one is computer score. And then we want to update each, these things each time each of them win the game. For example, here uh, we are returning just the, it's a tie. But we want to change the value of the uh, score as well. For example, here it's a tie, so the uh, score is not going to change. But this side, uh, this side, we're going to increase the player score one. The uh, plus plus means increase one. For example, it's one, we, it's going to be two. If it's two, it's going to be three. So plus plus is going to add a number to this variable. And then if the, we lose, we're going to increase the computer score. And also we need to uh, just, now we are updating these uh, scores. When we update these uh, scores, we want to update these numbers here as well. So we need to bring these uh, elements. The first element is user score. The other one is computer score. So I'm going to bring these two here as well. So I'm going to create a constant. This is going to be the player score element, which the ID is player score. Uh, the player score is actually it's called user score here. So I'm going to just change this one to user score. And then for the computer score, we have this get element ID that uh, we have, we are targeting this ID of the computer score. So now we have these two elements. Now we can just change their value. So here, when we increase the size, uh, uh, I think, here we can change it. Just say player player score. The text content is going to be this player score. And then here we're going to update the computer score. So let's try. Text content is going to change the text inside this element. 
and we're going to set it to this computer score. So let's try. So I lost the game, so computer gained one score. So you see the computer is one. So let me zoom this. So now I I won. So scissors bit paper paper, and then the score is one for me. It's tied. Doesn't have any change as long as you're tied. So I won again. As you can see, it's going and keep continue changing these values. So you can keep track of your gaming scores here. All right. So and then if the new person counts, or if you want to just uh, ref, uh, just see and start a new game, you just need to refresh the page, and the scores bit will be zero. And as you can see now, the hard coded value is still here. You won. We can remove that one inside here. So I'm going to remove this one. So there, there will be no, uh, nothing here except when we press, we see the use lose and then we just change, see the changes inside the game. All right. So that was it for the creating this uh, uh, project using JavaScript, HTML, CSS and JavaScript. In this section, we ha you have learned how to get the elements using these methods query selector all for all of the buttons get element by id by for targeting the ids we have just created two variables to track the changes inside the player and the computer score we have added an event listener to each buttons using add event listener method and then we have called a function called play round by passing the the our choice and the computer choice, which is going to ca be calculated here. Also, we have the we have created the play round function, which is going to get the our choice and the computer choice, compare them, and return the the value of tie or lost or win. And then uh, we have updated this computer score and the player score by changing their takes content all right so that was it for the javascript part i hope you enjoyed and learned many things let me know your opinion about using github copilot to uh, make the process of creating these projects faster and, and also i have saved time to teach these projects you let me know if you want to me to use it or completely uh, type everything from scratch. So, see you in the next project. Welcome back to another project. In this project, we are going to create a Pomodoro timer. As you can see from the final version of the project, we have a timer at the middle and three buttons a start, a stop, and reset. If we click on the start, this is going to start the timer backward from 25 minutes. And when we click on the stop, this is going to stop the timer. We can start it again by clicking on the start. And also we can reset it by clicking on the reset button and also we're going to have an alert when the timer is up so the pomodoro timer is useful for people who wants to study after 25 minutes they can have some rest so this pomodoro concept is for creating a timer for people who wants to work and focus on a job for 25 minutes so in this project, we're going to firstly learn how to style it using CSS and also we're going to learn how to add event listener to the buttons using JavaScript and how to create a timer using set interval method of JavaScript. In the next section, we're going to start with the HTML part of the project. So see you in the next section.
All right, let's start our project. In this section, we're going to create the HTML parts of the project. And also I have put the final version here for our comparison. As you can see, we have the title, we have a timer at the middle and also three buttons. So we're going to create these uh, elements using HTML first. And then we're going to style them using CSS. And finally, we're going to add some functionalities to them using JavaScript. The first things we need to do is to create a folder. And also, we're going to open that folder inside the Visual Studio Code. So let me go to my desktop. I create a folder here in my desktop. I'm going to call this folder the name of our project, which is Poma Doro Timer. So once you cre uh, create the folder, you can just right click and click on open with a uh, code, which is going to open it with Visual Studio Code. And the default folder for you is going to be Pomodoro Timer. And you can just create your files here to use it for your website. So you're going to create the first file, which is index.html. Let's close the welcome tab. And here we can just now close this section to have more space. Then we can use an exclamation mark to create an HTML5 boilerplate. So we just can click on the first auto suggestion, the one that is showing the exclamation mark. And now we have our HTML5 boilerplate, which includes the doctor doc type tag at the top of the code, which is telling the browser which version of HTML we are using. And as we are using HTML5, we just need to have HTML here. After that, we have the HTML tag. And inside here, we have the lang attribute, which sets the language of the page for the browser, which is, uh, we are, as we are using English, we just set it to be EN, which stands for English. Then we have the head tag, which is inside this HTML tag. Then we have the metadata tags and also the title tag. The first metadata tag sets a trusted attribute and we set it to be UTF-8, which is recommended by HTML5. This uh, trusted attribute uh, nearly contains all the characters and symbols, so the users won't have any problem seeing the characters and symbols of the website if you use UTF-8. Then we have the compatibility metadata tag, which sets the Internet Explorer, tells the Internet Explorer to use the most recent rendering engine, which is Edge. Then we have the viewport metadata tag, which sets the width of the screen to devices with so the browser is going to adjust itself by the device's size for example if you're using mobile screen and looking at the bra website inside any browsers you see that the width is smaller than when you are using for example a tablet or a desktop computer and here initial scale is the initial zoom level of the browser which is set to be 100% by setting it to be one. And finally, we have the title tag, which sets the title of the page. So we can just check that one by clicking on the live server extension here. As you can see, the go live. If you have installed, let's check the, if you open the uh, extensions using Ctrl Shift X, you have to install this server, this one, live server. You can just search here, live server. And here you can just 
find this live server and you can just install it. After installation, you can just uh, you just click on this button here to open the server and open this website inside the browser. So let's just click on the go live. This is going to open this one inside the, our default browser, which in my case is Chrome. So the title is document. Let's change the title to the name of the project, which is Pomodoro Timer. And then we can just Let's bring this one to the left side and the uh, browser on the right side so you can see the changes in real time. Let's decrease the size of the browser. So inside the body, we're going to start and add our containers, head tags, headers, heading tags, and buttons. For example, here I'm going to add a div with a class of container which is going to cover all the website. And uh, for just creating a div with a class of container, you just have to write down dot container. And then here you can just add the H1 tag with the class of title. And here we just write down the name of the project, Pomodoro Timer. We see it here, let's increase the size. So as you can see, we have the this title inside the website now. After the title, we're going to have a paragraph with the class of uh, timer and also with the ID of timer. So for the ID, we add hashtag. For the class, we add dot. So this is going to give us a class and ID. Class we usually use for styling and ID for targeting, targeting them using JavaScript later on. So here I'm just going to hard code now 25 minutes. After the paragraph, we're going to have our buttons. So I'm going to put all the buttons inside a, a button wrapper. So I'm going to create a div with a class of button wrapper. Inside this div, we're going to have three buttons. The first one, has the ID of a start and it's just going to say a start. We can see it here. Let me zoom this a little bit. You can see it better. And then after that, we're going to have another button with the ID of a stop and which is going to say just a stop. And finally, we're going to have another button with the ID of reset. So now we have all the elements we need to create our website. In the next section, we're going to start styling this website using CSS and make it like the final version. We bring everything to the center. We create these buttons with different colors and also we make some uh, the text bigger. So see you in the next section for the CSS part of the project. All right, in the last section, we have completed the HTML part of the project. In this section, we're going to style the project using CSS. So if you look at the final version here, you can see that we have 
uh, our container in the center. We have different colors with the buttons and also we have a bigger text in the center. So the first things we need to do is to create an, a CSS file inside our project. So let me open the Explorer section using Ctrl Shift E. And here we can create a new file. We just call it a style.css. And uh, before styling and using the CSS file, we need to add a link to this file within the HTML code. So inside the index.html, we need to add a link at the inside the head tag after the title tag we just add the link we just write down link and then we can click on the third auto suggestion the one with the css so this is going to create a relationship between the style sheet and this uh, html file and the destination address is style.css because both files are located at the same directory now we can start styling our project using CSS. The first things I want to do is to target this div with a class of container. So the, the div with a class of container, we can target that one. We just use dot container because it's a class. We just target it using dot. And then uh, I want to change, remove the margin. We just say margin zero for the top and bottom and auto for the left and right. So the auto is going to bring it to the center, but because it doesn't have a, a width still, we cannot see, see the uh, margin auto. So we're going to set the maximum width to 400 pixels this is going to set the width and then in this case it's going to set the maximum width to 400 and bring it to the center and then uh, what i want to do is to we can bring the text inside this container to the center using text align center. So this is going to bring everything to the center inside the container. Then uh, let's add some padding of 20 pixels, which is going to add some space er inside the element, inside the container around the elements. And also we want to change the font family to Robo Roboto. And if this font is not available, I want to use Sans Serif instead. Okay. So the font is looking good. After the container, we're going to target this title. The title was the, an H1 tag with the class of title. So here I'm going to add that class. So let's change the font size to be 36 pixels. So it, which uh, makes it bigger and then add some margin at the bottom of 10 pixels, which is going to have some space between the title and the next things. And then let's set the color of the title to be this color, 2C3E50, which is kind of a dark gray, very dark gray. So after that, we're going to target this timer. 
So the timer is a paragraph with a class of timer. So we can target that one here using dot timer. So let's change the font size to be 72 pixels. So we have the zoom here. Let's remove the zoom so you can see the real sizes. And then let's change the color of this the same as the color of the title. Now we have the buttons. As you can see, they are in the center and everything looks okay. But we want to target the button because the button here, we can target this tag using button. So button, okay. So we have the button. I want to change this button size and make it bigger. So we change the font size to be 18 pixels. We add some padding in the top and bottom of 10 pixels and 20 pixels for the left and right. Let's add some margin. of 10 pixels so they have some space between them let's change the color of the text to be white so you cannot see it now but I want to change the color of these buttons to green red and gray so we're gonna see it later clearly so let's for now we just add some background color so you can see it better. I just choose the same background color black. But I'm going to remove this background color later. So let's uh, remove the border. So we just say border none. And then we set the border radius to be 4 pixels. This is going to make the buttons around it so this is going to have some rounded corner and then let's add some let's make the cursor to be pointed so when we hover over the buttons we see a pointing hand okay the mouse cursor is going to change to po pointer and then uh, let's so I think that's it for the button. Let's target each. Uh, let's add some hover effect. Or let's uh, just target each button. So the button, each of them has an ID of a start, a stop, and reset. We can target that one using pound sign, for example, start. So to target the start button, Let's change the background color to be 27AE60. Okay. And then uh, let's also make this text to be uppercase. So we just use text transform. uppercase so make the text uppercase and when when we hover over them over the buttons we just say button hover suited class we use so when we hover over them I want to change the opacity to be 70% so it becomes like this so you know that something happened and also we want to add some transition as you can see this is very fast 
I want to add some transition to opacity. And then just point three seconds with ease and in and ease in and out effect. Now, as you can see, it's kind of more nice. And then let's target the other buttons. So we just say stop button, for example, the, let's change the background color to be C0 39B, which is kind of C0 39 2B, which is a red color. And then finally, we're going to target this reset button. We change the background color to be kind of gray color. So it's going to be 7 F 8 C 8 D. And then now we can just remove this background color here. So let's remove the zoom level. So we have a style is like this. Okay. So that was it for the CSS part of the project. In the next section, we're going to work on the JavaScript part, and we're going to add some functionality. As you can see from the final version, when we press on the start, as you can see, the timer is going to uh, count down from 25 minutes. And then we go, and then when we reach to the zero, we're going to have some alert saying the time's up. And then we can stop the timer, and also we can reset the timer. So, See you in the next section for the JavaScript part of the project. All right, in the last section, we have completed the CSS part of the project. In this section, we're going to add functionality to the project using JavaScript. So the first things we need to do is to create a JavaScript file inside our a folder that we have created. Let me open the Explorer section using Ctrl Shift E. And here we can just create a new file and we call it, for example, index.js. And before using it, we need to add a link to this file within the HTML file. And the link file, the if you remember for style.css, we have added in the head section, but for JavaScript, we have, we should add it at the end of the body section because we need all these elements to be loaded first in the browser, and then we can add the functionality using JavaScript. So here we can just add a script tag. We just write down SC and we can click on the second auto suggestion, the one with the SRC. And the SRC, which is the source address, is index.js because both files are located at the same directory. Now we can use JavaScript in our projects. What we want to do first is to bring these elements, these three buttons, and also this timer because we want to change the value of the timer and also we want to add some event listener to these buttons. So uh, let's bring these elements inside the JavaScript. We just create a constant and we call it uh, a start element. And we set it to be equal to, because we want to target the browser, we just say document dot get element by ID, because this is the, it has the ID of a start. So we just, inside the parentheses, we just say start, okay? 
So we can do the same things for the stop and reset button and also the timer. So I've just copied this one using Alt Shift arrow down three more times. The second one, I want to change this start to stop. I can just use Ctrl D to choose both of them. And then I just say stop. And then here, use Ctrl D, make it reset. And this one is going to be timer. So we have access to this timer, a start, a stop and reset. Let's add the event listener to the three buttons. So we, we just add the start element. We add an event listener. The event listener we want to add is click because when we click on the button, we want to trigger a function. I'm going to call the function uh, a start timer. Let's remove this. So start timer, I'm going to call the function a start timer and then let's create the function at the top. So we create a function and we call it a start timer. And for now we just console log a start. Okay, so now if you open the console using F12, Let's clear the console and then let me decrease the size. So if I click on start, so before that you have to refresh the page. If we click on a start, we see a start in the console. Okay, so let's do the same things for the other buttons, a stop and reset. So I'm going to copy this one using Alt Shift arrow done. And also, let's copy this function two more times. So this start is going to be a stop. This two is going to be a stop. This one should be stop too. And this one should be reset. 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 This one too. Okay. So now if we check the console, if we click on start, we see start, a stop, and reset. As you can see, we are console logging these three terms based on the based on the button that we have we are uh, clicking. Now just we have created this, we want to start working on the start timer function. So instead of console logging, we want to create an interval. So every one minute, every one second, we want to update a timer. Okay. So we want to create an interval. I'm going to call it interval. And then we have to just define it at the top by a variable called interval. And then we set this interval to a function called set interval, which is a built-in JavaScript function, which is going to trigger a function every, they're going to trigger this function every, for example, this is one millisecond. But we want to call this one every one second, which is thousand milliseconds. So every thousand milliseconds, we are going to trigger this function. So, for example, here we're going to trigger the function. We just console log, for example. Uh, we just console log something like uh, 
timer and then let's clean the now we just call this function we as you can see every second we are calling this timer you see the timer six seven eight nine so this console log is getting uh, triggered every one second but instead of doing that we're going to update this timer so let's create a variable at the top first and we call this variable time left. So we just create a variable called time left. And for now, I just want to set it to be 1500 means uh, 25 minutes. Okay. This is based on seconds. So 1500 seconds is equal to 25 minutes. Now, that we have created this one. So this is second, but we want to convert this one to minutes and seconds. So I'm going to create a function here. I'm going to call it update function, uh, update timer, for example. And this one is going to create the minutes seconds from the time left so we just say let minutes minutes and this minutes is going to be equal to math dot floor because we want to set it and uh, set that one to be rounded to the lower so returns a greatest integer less or equal to its numeric argument. For example, if you have 2.1 is going to be 2. Okay. Or 2 point. Uh, so floor is going to do that. So, on. so we want to just whatever time left is. For example, is whatever time, time to, uh, left is. We want to divide this one to 60. And this is going to be minutes. And then. The seconds is different. The seconds is equal to time left. Whatever you divide to 60, the remainder is going to be seconds. So the first one is minute. Whatever the remainder is, is seconds. This is the remainder sign. It means time left divided by 60. Whatever the remainder would be this one. Okay. Now we have the minutes and seconds. We want to create it exactly like this time. But first, me, first uh, let me show it inside the timer. So we have the timer element. We want to change its inner HTML to equal to uh, formatted time. which we are going to create here. The formatted time, let's create the formatted time. So the formatted time is equal to minutes plus this one, this sign, and then seconds. Okay. So let's seconds we are getting ah, we have to add a plus here too. Okay. So now we have this formatted time. Now we need to call this function to update timer here in that inside this function every one second. So here I'm gonna call this update timer so if you now press on the start this is going to update the timer to this one but uh, we want to decrease the time every one second so we want to decrease the time left 
we just add double minus to each time decrease it one second. So if I now press start, this is going to decrease uh, from top to bottom every one second. But uh, I just want to show you some problem we have here. For example, if we time instead of just this 1500, we make it, for example, 120 second. If we start now, you can see it's 158, 57, but I want to show 0, 1 instead of 1. So it's going to be formatted. So there is a method to, that we can use in JavaScript. It's called uh, pad start. But first we need to convert this one to a string. So we need to make a template here, like this. Uh, the back tag here is uh, it's located over the tab key. This is this uh, this one allows us to have a variable inside here. So I'm gonna add a variable using dollar sign and a curly braces. So what we do, first we convert this one to a string, because this is a number. And then after converting it to a string, we want to add some zero using pad start, which is going to add, I want to say, just make it two digits. And then if this first digit is not existed, make it zero. Or even if, if it's not existed, we just make it zero. For example, if I start now, this one is zero one instead of one. Okay. So now let's do the same things for the seconds. So we're going to have the, so let's remove this plus stuff because we are making a variable. We don't need to have that one. And then we, we want to add another variable or seconds. First, we convert the seconds to a string by using to a string. And then we want to use a pad start. For two digits, we want to add zero. Okay, so let's start now. Uh, we have some extra things. Uh, we don't need this one as well. Let's start. Now, as you can see, 0, 1, 57. And then if this one decreases to, for example, if we have, for example, 6, 70 second, let's uh, start this one. You can see 0, 0, 8, 0, 7, 0, 6. And then if this one finished, the minute is going to be double zero because we need two digits with zero. So this is the way you format your numbers using JavaScript. Okay, so now it's working. Uh, let, let's just bring this one. Uh, let's leave it there. Let's. I want to make it 10 seconds because I want to show you an alert. So each time this time finish, I want to uh, create an alert. So here, after the update timer, I just say if the time left is equal to zero, let's uh, make an alert saying time time's up or time is up okay now let's try it so it starts from 10 seconds and when the 10 seconds finish we want to see an alert saying time's up you can see the alert time's up 
and if you press OK, you see the time is still going. And uh, as you can see, it's going backward. So we need to clear the interval as well. So we need to clear interval. And which interval we want to clear is this interval that we have. OK, now let's try it again. So after 10 seconds, it's going, this is going to create an alert and then set the time to zero so we can uh, so we clear this one and then if you start again okay it's going to backward again so uh, we need to set the time again after the alert is we set the alert to OK. OK, so we can here, we just uh, set the time left. We set it to be again to, for example, 1500. So let's try again. Now we have 10 seconds when it's finished. This is going to clear after the OK. Clear the interval. And if you start again, it's going to start from 25. But uh, let's uh, work on the stop and the reset button. So when we click on a stop timer, we want to clear the interval too. So we just say clear interval and then we're going to clear the interval. So when we start, when we press stop, it's going to, it is going to stop the timer at 7 and if you start again, this is going to continue. So this is for the stop timer. For the reset timer, we want to clear it and also we want to set the time left to the 1500, which is 25 minutes. And also we want to update timer. And also we can call the update timer here after the time left as well. So now if we create, press on the start, it starts from 10 seconds. We can stop it. We can reset. As you can see, it goes to the 25 here. We can start it again. Now let's uh, set the time left to 1500. So this is 225. Let's increase the size. So now if you press start, it's going to start from 25 to 0. And when we reach the 0, we get an uh, alert. We can stop it and start again. And also we can reset the timer. All right, so that was it for creating this Pomodoro timer using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. We also have learned how to bring the data, the elements inside the JavaScript, how to create an interval and update the timer based on the minutes and seconds and how to format them uh, using pad start at the zero if the timer is uh, less than nine or even it's zero. And finally, we, we have learned how to clear the interval using a stop and the reset timer. So that was it for the projects. I hope to, you learn many things. See you in the next project. Welcome back to another project. In this project, we're going to create a dice roll simulator. As you can see from the final version of the project, we have a dice at the middle and we have a button saying roll dice. If you click on this button, this is going to create an animation first and then create a random dice and show it here in the middle. And also we, we have added this 
roll dice inside this list, the history list. So let's do it again. This time we got five and we have added to the list as well. So as you can see, we have just styled this one using CSS with a modern design. And also we have used JavaScript to add an events listener to this button, which is going to create and simulate a dice roll by creating a random number. And also we're going to save these numbers inside an array and show it here in the history of the roll dice. So in the next section, we're going to firstly start with the HTML part of the project. And then we're going to work on the CSS. And after that, we're going to work and add functionality to this project using JavaScript. So see you in the next section. All right, let's start our project. In this section, we're going to work on the HTML part of the project. As you can see, I have put the final version here for our comparison. Uh, as you can see, we have to add a heading, a roller dice here, and also we have a button for rolling the dice. And finally, we have the roll uh, history. So we're going to save this one here in the history. So the first things we need to do is to create an HTML file. So I'm going to create the project in my desktop. So I'm going to create a folder here. So I'm going to create a new folder. I'm going to call this folder the name of our project, which is dice A role simulator. And once you create this folder, you can just right click and click on open with code. This is going to open it inside the Visual Studio code. Uh, otherwise, you can just come to the Visual Studio Code and just click on the Open and click on that folder that you have created by clicking on the Open folder. So now the Visual Studio Code is uh, having this dice roll simulator folder as a default folder. Now we can create a new file here by clicking on this icon and just we call that file index.html and now we have the HTML file but it is completely empty. Let me close this. But now we can use an exclamation mark to have an HTML boilerplate as you can see from the emit abbreviation. We get this suggestion by just writing down an exclamation mark and then when you click on the first auto suggestion, you get the HTML5 boilerplate. So let me explain this one uh, real quick is if this is your first project. So we have here doc type, which tells the browser which version of HTML we are using. As we are using HTML5, we just need to have HTML here. And after that, we have an HTML tag, which covers the head and the body section. The length attribute here inside the opening tag of the HTML sets the language of the page and tell the browser which uh, language the page is written in. And in our case is English. And then we have the head tag, which covers three metadata tags and also a title tag. The first metadata tag sets the charted attributes, which tells the browser to use UTF-8. And UTF-8 is recommended by HTML5 because it nearly contains all the characters and symbols so the, the users inside our website won't have any problem seeing the characters or symbols or unicodes that we have we are using 
And then we have the compatibility metadata, metadata tag, which tells the Internet Br Explorer browser to use the most recent rendering engine, which is Edge. Then we have the viewport metadata tag, which tells the browser to set the width of the screen to device's width. For example, if you're using mobile screen, the device, the width is going to be a smaller. So you can have a responsive website by setting this metadata tag and it's necessary to have a responsive behavior. And then finally, we have the initial zoom level of the browser, which is 100%. Then we have set the title to be document. This is the title of the page. And let me show you the title. If you have installed the live server extension in your Visual Studio code, you have this button go live so you can click on go live and this is going to open the website inside the default browser which in our case is Google Chrome as you can see we have the document here as our title and then we can just change this title to the name of the project which is Dice Pro Simulator. So now if you check the browser, the title is going to be Dice Row Simulator. So now let's uh, bring the website to the right side. And then the Visual Studio Code on the left side so you can see the changes in real time. Because we have, uh, we are using the live server extension, anything we write here we're going to see in real time on the right side. So inside the body section we're going to have an H1 tag saying dice Role simulator. So after just a few seconds and auto saving the project, you can see the dice roll simulator heading inside the website. And after this H1 tag, we're going to have a div with the class of dice and also with the idea of dice. So for adding the class, you just need to have dot and for the ID, you just need to write down a pound sign and then you get the auto suggestion of from emit abbreviation, a div with the class of dice and an ID of dice. If you press enter, you get that div. Now inside this div, I'm going to add this uh, icon, which is the dice face uh, one. So for in order to find this, uh, they have some uh, Unicode. If you search on Google, let me search for you. So we just say, for example, dice Unicode. Dice Unicode. There are plenty of websites showing you the Unicode characters of this. You can just go, for example, this compare, compare.com. As you can see, we have, for example, Unicode for the uh, five. So for the HTML entity, the code is this. So just if you copy this code, for example, you just put it inside your this div. This is going to show the five uh, dice. 
So you don't need to just get the icon. You just need to have this kind of HTML unities. And if you want, for example, for the, this is for dive phase five, you can just copy this and search for dive phase one, for example, and then you just click here and then get the code from here. Okay, so let's continue. So let's remove the zoom level. So the icon is here, but we cannot see it yet. But later you using the CSS, we're going to increase the size of these things and make them more beautiful. Then we have a button. The button has an ID of role button. And inside the button, we're going to say roll dice. So you can see the button here. And after the button, we're going to have the history like the here. We have the history. I'm going to just create a UL unordered list with the ID of roll dash history. So we're going to use these ID or classes to later using CSS or JavaScript to manipulate the website and style it. So we have the UL with the ID of role history and then we have an LI here. I just want to hard code some LI. For example, the first one, we just want to say rule one and then we just have a span. This span is going to have that, for example, this, uh, this code here. And then we can just have another one, for example, roll two. And we just, for example, get the five one. So we have one and five. This is just hard coded because we want to style this one using CSS in the next section. We need some data here to uh, style it. But later we're going to create this one using JavaScript. So if we roll more dice and then we can just see the history here, for example, like the one here. So you see that each time you, you see it, new history data and add it here. So that was it for the HTML part of the project. In the next section, we're going to work on the CSS and make the website as beautiful as the final version. As you can see here, we have a hover effect for the button and uh, we have this title and also we have this uh, style like a buck shadow effect for these role histories. So see you in the next section for the CSS part of the project. All right, in the last section, we have completed the HTML part of the project. In this section, we're going to style the project like the one in the final version using CSS. The first thing we need to do is to install the and uh, create a new CSS file inside our Explorer section. So I have to open the Explorer section using Ctrl Shift E and here inside the Explorer section inside our folder, which is called Dice Lore Simulator, we just create a new file and we call it a style .css and before using this file, we need to add a link to this file within the HTML code. So we need to come back to the index.html and then just after the title tag inside the head section, we need to add a link to the CSS file. As you can see from getting this suggestion, you just can write down link and then click on the third auto suggestion, the one with the CSS. 
let me turn off my GitHub Copilot. All right. So now we have a link, which is a relationship between the HTML file and the style sheet, style.css. And here, the style.css, the address of this file. And as both files are located at the same directory, we just need to have a style.css here. Now we can start styling our project here. Now I want to start with the body section. So which is covering everything. I want to change the font family to open sans. Should be capital. So open sense is like this. And if the open sense is not available, we're going to say use this sans serif instead. So this is a backup font. After that, I want to bring everything to the center using text align center like this. And then let's remove the default margin of the page. And we set it to be zero so we can style it better. So we have completed the body section. Let's move on and go to this H1 tag saying dice roll simulator. So we just target that one using H1 and open a set of curly braces. And here we just change the font size first to change the size of the font as we set it to be 3REM, which is three times of the uh, base sizing and mostly it's the def default sizing is 16 pixels but it depends on how you set your browser if i remove the re zoom level which is 200 percent now this is the size that we have created by creating three rem and then i want to add some margin at the top of two rem so we bring it a little bit down from the top. And uh, after the H1 tag, I want to target this dice here. This div with the class of dice, which is having this dice here. So let's target that one. Because this is a class, we can just say dot dice. And let's just change the font size to be 7 REM. So we make it bigger. Then let's add some margin of 5 pixels here. So you add some space around this dice. I'm going to add the animation later. As you can see from the final version, when we change the dice, some animation happens, but if you don't have uh, the ability to change the dice, we cannot see the animation. So I'm going to, after creating the JavaScript, I'm going to come back and create that animation. I'm going to teach you how to create a cool animation like this. So let's move on and uh, let's go to the next section, which is the button. So we target the button, we just say button. So the button, uh, we want to have the background color for that. The background color I want to add is this code 47A5C4, which is kind of bluish color. And then let's change the color of the text to be white. You can just simply write down white or Hashtag FFF would be similar. And then let's change the font size to be one and a half REM. And then let's add some padding. So padding in the top and bottom, I just write down one REM. And for the left and right, we just write down oh, 2 REM like this. And then we can just 
border, remove the border here because I don't want this black color around it. Instead, I want to add some uh, so you just remove the border for now. We add some border radius. We make it rounded in the corners by just adding a border radius. We set it to be 1 REM. Like this. And set the cursor to be pointer. So when we hover over it, we see a pointing hand. And... Uh, yeah, that was it for this creating this let's add some transition effect and hovering effect for it so we when we hover over the button we just add the pseudo class hover we just change the background color to be different which is 2 e 8 b a s And then we can add some transition. So when we hover over it, we don't see it suddenly. So we can add a transition on background color. With uh, 0.3 seconds and ease effect. So you can see now the changing is a little bit slower. So after that, we're going to target this UL here. This UL with the idea of role history, we can just target the UL. Let's remove these dots. So we just have to target the list style to be one and a half. REM. Sorry, this is the uh, list style should be none. So you remove that dot and then we add to remove the padding. We just say padding zero. So if they come in the center, when you remove the list style, you need to set the padding to zero and then we set some margin of two REM. So we add some space around it and we set the maximum width of that to be 600 pixels and we set the margin of left and right to be auto so we bring them exactly in the center. Okay, so now they were so at this one this one is less necessary we can just set this one to 2 rem for top and bottom okay now we just target the li the list each list so we target the li we set the font size first to one and a half rem so make it bigger we add some padding of 0.5 REM margin of 0.5 REM padding the space uh, inside and margin is, is the space outside the element and then we have some background color F2 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 which is kind of gray color we add some border radius, we make it rounded in the corner and then we set this one to 0.5 REM we also want to add some box shadow so we can see it better the box shadow is going to have a e 0 for the X axis 2 pixels for the Y Uns, uh, offset two pixels for the blurness and then we can have some rg ba color which is a red green and blue color for the red uh, i just set it to be zero 
green zero, blue zero. So this is going to give us a black color. For the alpha, which is the transparency, I just set it to be 0.3% transparent. As you can see, it's a beautiful now box shadow. And then we want to set the display to flex. So I want the rule one to be in the left on the left side and this icon on the right side. So I set the display to flex. And then I want to set the justify content to be a space between. So add a space between the two elements. And finally, we can use align item center to bring them to the center vertically like this inside the uh, container. And then finally, I want to make this uh, icon, this dice symbol to be bigger. So we can target that one, this is spam here. So we just target that one, we just say li span. Now we set the font size to be 3 REM. And then we just set some margin on the right side of 1 REM. Okay. It looks fine. Let's make it bigger. So as you can see, it has some maximum width of 600. So it never gets bigger than that. The button looks good and also this dice looks fine. All right, so that was it for the CSS part of the project. I hope you enjoyed and learned many things. In the next section, we're going to work on the functionality and we make it like the final version. So each time we add we click on the roll dice, we get the new roll dice randomly and then add it inside our list here. So see in the next section for the JavaScript part of the project. All right, in the last section, we have completed the CSS part of the project. We have styled the project. Now it's time to add functionality to the project using JavaScript. The first thing we need to do is to create a JavaScript file inside our Visual Studio code. So here I'm going to open the Explorer section using Ctrl Shift E. And here we can click on this icon to create a new file. I'm going to call the file index.js. Uh, similar to the one we did for the style CSS, we, add, we have to add a link to this file within the HTML code, but the link should be at the end of the body section as we need the file, the HTML to be loaded first, and then we need to add the, the functionality to it. So we need to add a script tag here. We just write down SC and we can click on the second of the suggestion, the one with the SRC and the address for this script tag would be index.js as both files are located at the same directory. So let's close this and let's start adding some functionality. The first things I want to do is to add the animation. So when I, in the final version, when we click on this rows dice, we have animation. So we want to add this one. First, we want to add an event listener to this button, which is going to trigger an animation. So let's bring this one to the right side and he, this one to the left side. So now, what we want to do, we go to uh, index.html
So what well, we want to add some add event listener to this button with the ID of role button. So when we click on it, something happens. So first thing first, we want to bring this button to the JavaScript. So we want to create a constant called button element, and this is going to be equal to document. Let me stop the copilot. So we just uh, target the document because we want to target all the browser and then we can use get element by ID method to target the ID that we have here, which is a role button. We can copy this and then paste it inside here. Now we have access to the button. Let's add the event listener to it. So we just say button element dot add event listener and the event we want to add is click because when we want to click, we want to trigger something. So what we want to do, we want to create a function here. So this function is going to be triggered once we click on it. For example, if I console log something here, for example, clicked, And now if you open the console using F12, let's bring this one down. So now if I click on the button, you see the clicked is logged inside the console. But instead of clicking, I want to add an, anima an animation to this element, to this dice element here. So first we need to add the animation inside the CSS. So if you remember inside the dice, we didn't add any animation, but we have to create an animation here and we need to name an animation. So I'm going to create an animation class. We just call it role dash animation and this one is going to have an animation name which is going to be row and now we create this animation with keyframe so we add a keyframe this keyframe is going to be the name of that we have created here row and it starts from 0 to 100%. For the 0%, we're going to have a transform, which is going to have some uh, change inside the, like a, in the x-axis, in the y-axis, but we want to rotate it in y-axis. So we just say rotate y. First, we start with 0 degree, and we for this rotate x, we start from zero degree two. Then when we reach to the hundred percent, we want to have the transform, but this time instead of zero degree, we want to have seven hundred and twenty degree. in both sides. Y-axis and X-axis, we're going to have these two. So we have this animation now. We want to add it to the dice now. So to the dice, we want to have some animation duration for one second. But we want this one to be infinite. So we want to just say any animation fill mode to be four words which is going to be infinite, but in JavaScript, we want to remove this animation after a uh, few seconds. So I'm going to show you how to do it. So now we have this animation inside the CSS. Let's add it using JavaScript. So inside the JavaScript, we have to add that animation 
this is very simple. We just need to bring this uh, dice element inside the HTML. We know that the dice element it's a it's a div with the ID of dice. So we can bring it here at the top. We create a constant. Call it dice element and this is going to be equal to similar to the above like a document dot get element by id and the id is called dice so now we have this element we just can add that animation to it by using dot class list dot add this is going to add that class list which was role animation. Role dot uh, dash animation. So basically we have added this role animation class to this element now. So if you now press this button, we see the animation. Okay. But this is only working one time. So we want to add this and after a few, uh, one second, we want to remove that. So we can just add a set timeout here, which is going to trigger this function after one second, which is thousand milliseconds. And this function is going to, we just copy this one. And instead of add, we want to remove it. So we just say remove. After one second, we're going to remove that. So if I click, it's going to remove it. And then we can just click again, click again, click again. As you can see, now we have the animation in our uh, dice. But we want to just randomly change this dice. So we got to call a function after removing this called roll dice. And we need to create this function here at the top. So we create a function called roll dice. So this is uh, how we do it. We create a random number between one and six each time. And then we're going to, based on this number, we're going to show different dice face. So this is just a five. For example, if the next number is four, we're going to show the die face four. So first we create the random number. So we create We just call it, uh, we create a constant, we call it ro uh, role result, which is going to be, we just create a random number first. This is going to create a random number between one and zero, but we can multiply this one to 60, so sorry, six, so which is going to be from zero and six. But we don't want the numbers like 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 or 1.5. We want a, a rounded number. So we can just cover this one inside a parenthesis and then just use a method called math.floor. So this is going to create a number between 0 and 5, actually. So this is going to create, a, because floor is going to bring it to the bottom. Now we just need to add 1 to it to create the number between 1 and 6. This is the one way. The other way was we use math.seal. So this is going to create one, two, six. So math.floor is going to round it to the lower number 
and then we just need to add one to it to create a random number between one and six. So we can console log now the roll result. So let's see if we click on this, we're going to see a number. Then now we got two. Next time we get three, four, five. It's going to be always between one and six. Okay. So we are creating this number now. Now we want to, based on this number, change the dice face. So I'm going to create another constant called dice face, which is going to call a function called get dice face. And we want to pass this number, rolled res uh, result. So let's create this function. We create a function here called get dice face, which is going to get this number. And based on this number, is going to change and uh, return that, uh, that face, that uh, dice face. So we need to create a switch here. I, I want to show you how to use the switch. So the switch is going to get an input. And based on the input, we're going to have an output. So here we have the switch in case the number is one. This is going to return the one, which is uh, here. If you remember, we, we need to have the Unicode. So for the phase one, let's search here. So die phase five, let's search for die phase one. So the Unicode for this one is this for HTML. I'm going to return this. Okay. And in case of two, we're going to return two. So I'm going to paste the, so let's search for the days die phase two. Okay. So we just need to Keep going, create this until six. So for the, in case we have three, we're going to return the dice three. So let's search for dice three. I'm going to use my control V dice three. So let's continue for the case four. We're going to return K okay, four is this one. So two more left. Case five, we're going to return dice face five. And finally, let's for the case six, we're going to return the six one. So I'm going to just search for the six.
Okay, so this is uh, the six. And for the default, you need to add a default if you want to use a uh, switch. So any other cases, we're going to return just uh, an empty string. Okay, so this is how the way the switch works. So based on the input, we're going to return an output. So it can be one to six and we return different faces here. So now we have this one. Now we we have the dice face. So if I console log dice face here. So each time we roll a dice, we, we return a dice face instead of number now, as you can see. Okay. So we got this dice face. Now we want to change this this dice element takes content to dice face so we just say dice element dot text content we want to change it to this dice face so now if i change this one we see this number okay But we want to see the actually the the I think we need to instead of this one we use inner HTML. So let's check. Okay, now we see the die face. So the instead of text uh, content you use inner HTML. So each time we see a different dice. So we have done this part, but we haven't completed this history yet because the history is always the same. So we need to change the history and save the each, uh, each dice roll. So I'm going to create a constant, uh, create a variable here called history list. And this is going to be an empty array and we go to update this empty array each time we click on this one and we're going to add the information we have so each time we change the inner html of this one we're going to update the history list so we just say history list we're going to add the new one by just saying dot push and we add this role result. Okay. Which is which can be one, two, three, or anything like that. And then we can just uh, update, create a function called update role. history okay now let's create this function so we're going to create a function called update history so the function name is update history update role history i put it here So update history is going to first thing first make this one completely empty. So we're going to have this role history first. So this role history we need to bring it inside the JavaScript which is which includes all the list. So here at the top I'm going to bring that one using a constant and we call that one role history. element and this is going to be equal to document dot get element by id and the id for this one is ray dash history 
So first thing first, we're going to empty that one. So here inside this function, we're going to say role history element dot inner HTML is going to be empty first. So each time we click, we're going to empty this one first. Okay. And then we're going to fill it with the all everything we have inside the history list, which is going to save here each time. Okay. So we create a for loop. We just create a for loop. We create a variable called i here, which is going to start from zero. And this is going to continue until the this history list length. For example, it can be one, we can be two, three, and etc. And then we're going to increase this i one each time for this loop. And for this loop, we're going to create the list item. So we're going to create this list item here in each loop. So we're going to say list item, which is going to be equal to, we, we, we can create it using a method called create element. So we just target the document and then we just say create element. And the elements we want to create is li, which is the list. Now we have created, we want to change the inner HTML of it. So we just say list item dot inner HTML, and this is going to be dynamic. So we need to add a backtick. Backtick is located on the uh, tab key. It's not the single quote actually. Okay. It's backtick. So we're going to say roll. We want to say roll one, roll two, but the roll one and roll two is going to be based on this I. Okay. Because I starts from zero, we need to add one to it. So we just create a variable. We just say I plus one because I starts from zero. Now we want to start from one. And after that, we're going to have a spam and inside this spam, we're going to have that, uh, this face, which we can get from creating, getting from this get dice face. So we're going to create another variable. We just say get, we call this get dice face function and we're going to pass this, uh, we have the, the, the number here, history list. We have saved all the numbers inside the history list by just passing the role result. So we're going to just say history list, but we want the number I. For example, the first one, second one, the third one, we pass this I. And then we get the face and then show it inside this span. So I'm going to create, close this span now. So add the closing tag here. Now we have created the list item. So we need to add it to the role history. So we, we just made the role history empty. Now we can just add this element to it by just using append child. So append child is going to add this element. So we add this element to role history elements, which is this element here. We have, uh, we have this element here. We have added, appended these childs to this element. So now we done it, we've done it using JavaScript. So if I click now, we see that the first, now we have two. If we, if I click again, we can, we can see the next one is added to the list. Now the th third one, this just, we can keep going, see the each one. And then the number is updated here as well using the role number. And uh, the other thing is when we refresh the page first, we see these two. We can just delete these two now 
or we just say comment it using control control forward slash so now we don't see any list but when we click on the roll dice we see the first one second one and third one so what we do here i'm going to explain again we just created an empty array called history list each time we create a random number we're going to add that number to this a variable inside its array by using dot push and then we're going to create the element li element here based on that number and add it as a child to the unordered list item so that was it for the javascript part of the project i hope you enjoyed and learned many things in this project uh, we have work on the uh, some dif difficult task like updating the history creating an animation and how to add and uh, use the append child to add some element to it, another element so i hope you enjoyed and learned many things see you in the next project Welcome back to another project. In this project, we're going to create a recipe book application. As you can see from the final version of the project, we have a page containing different recipes, which we are going to get from an API. A recipe API, which is free to use, but we need to get an API key. I'm gonna teach you how to get an API key from this free API. And each time here, when we refresh the page, we get different recipes with different ingredients. And also we have here a link to go to that website. In the next section, we're going to work on the HTML part of the project. So see you in the next section. All right, welcome back. In this section, we're going to create our HTML file. As you can see, I have put the final version here for our comparison. And we can just compare the final version and create it, create the HTML parts in this section. The first thing we need to do is to create an HTML file and open it inside the Visual Studio code. So I'm going to open the, go to my desktop, create a new folder here i'm going to call the folder the name of our project which is recipe book app and we just right click on it and click on open with code which is which is going to open it with visual studio code now here we can close the welcome tab and then as you can see we have the folder been open inside the Visual Studio code so now we can start creating our files here so I'm gonna click here on this icon I'm gonna cre create a new file called index.html and here we can see that we have an empty HTML file but we can just use an exclamation mark as you can see to get the emit abbreviation so this suggestion you can get uh, uh, if you have the image abbreviation enabled in your Visual Studio code, which is enabled by default. So I'm going to click here to accept the author suggestion. Now we have this HTML file. So we have doc type, which is the type of the document we are working on and tells the browser which version of HTML we are working. As we are using HTML5, we have HTML here. Then we have, after that, we have an HTML tag, which has the language in the opening tag. And it sets to be English and tells the browser the language of the website is English. Then we have the head tag, which has three metadata tags. The first one is sets the charted attribute, UTF-8. UTF-8 is recommended by HTML5 because it nearly contains all the characters and symbols. Then we have the uh, this metadata tag which tells the Internet Explorer 
browser to use the most recent rendering engine, which is Edge. Then we have the viewport metadata tag, which sets the width of the browser's browser to the device's screen's width. And finally, we have the initial zoom level of the browser, which is set to be 100%. And then we have the title of the browser, which is document. So let's open the our website by using the live server extension. If you haven't installed the live server extension, you can find it inside extensions by searching live server. And this is the extension I'm using, live server. You can just click on it and install it. And then after installation, you can have this icon here, go live. And if, if you click on it, this is going to open it inside your default browser, which is in my case is a uh, Google Chrome. So now we have the website open and the title is document. Let's bring the website on the right side and the coding on the left side so we can see the changes in real time. So the first things I wanna add inside the body section, I wanna add a header tag. And inside the header, I'm gonna have an H1 tag saying recipe take app all uppercase and uh, like uh, capitalize. As you can see, we we are seeing the changes in real time because using we are using that extension. And also we are using something called GitHub Copilot, which is going to suggest you code. It's not free. Uh, you have to pay $10 per month, but it's free for students to use. This is the extension I'm talking. If you open here, you can just search GitHub Copilot. So this extension. If you install this one, this is going to suggest you with AI. As you can see, when you write down, they give you a suggestion. And if you press tap, you're going to accept the suggestion. This is this is going to help you to code faster. And uh, we this is going to save us some time in, inside our coding tutorial. So I'm going to type faster the codes. But I'm going to explain them all. So now we're going to have a container. I'm going to have a div with a class of container. We just say container So for having a div with a class of container, you just need to write down dot container and here inside the container, I'm going to have a ul ul tag with the ID of uh, recipe item. Uh, sorry, recipe list. And then inside this one, we're going to have a list. So in my case, I'm going to have a list with the class of recipe item okay and then inside the list as you can see we got the list we're going to have a an image tag and for now we're going to hard code some images for our recipes which is i'm going to get from https clone forward slash spawn uh, spoonicular spoonicular dot com let me check that if I didn't make any spelling mistake so that sounds good dot com forward slash recipe images forward slash for example we just put some random number one two three four 
five, and then just say dash 312 multiply by just adding it x two three one dot jpg so you, sh you can see the image now it's just a random image i just can change this random for example i just change this four to two we get a different image okay so now we have the image and the alternative will be for this one is going to be recipe number one okay so I'm going to do the hard-coded image first, and then we are going to just uh, use JavaScript to randomly get this uh, information from the Spunicular API and show it each time uh, 10, 10 of these recipes. So for now, I'm going to hard-code it because we want to style it later using CSS. We need some data. And then I want to have some uh, h2 tag saying recipe one. After that, we're going to have a paragraph. And inside this paragraph, we're going to have a strong tag. A strong tag is actually makes it kind of uh, bold. So I'm going to say ingredient Okay, ingredients as you can see and then double clone and after that we're going to have our ingredients after the strong tag which is going to be ingredient for example ingredient one two three like this so later is going to be real ingredient like the final version you see ingredients one ingredients a real ingredients and a real title but now we just hard code something so we can style it using css after that we're going to have an an anchor tag which it's not going anywhere now, but inside is going to say view recipe. Okay. So that's it for the first item. Uh, we can just copy this one two more times and then just change the things. Using Alt Shift Arrow done, I can copy it two more times. And just change the images for example the uh, this is the first one the second one is going to just change this number to something else we get a different image recipe 2 recipe 2 and ingredients can be the same and then for the third one we get the different number to get a different image recipe three recipe three and then that's it so we have now three samples for our html tag so we can start assigning this one in the next section using css and then we may we make it like the final version responsive and then it looks like this so I'm going to work, we're going to work on the CSS in the next section. We make the website responsive like this. So see you in the next section for the CSS part of the project. All right, in the last section, we have completed the HTML part of the project. In this section, we're going to work on the CSS and install the project like the one in the final version, we're going to have a header with a different background color. And also we have items, different items with the box shadow, which each item has a different length, like ingredients is longer. Then we have an image and on the left side, and also we have a hovering effect for the 
button. The first things we need to do is to create a CSS file inside our project. So we go back to our code and we can open the Explorer section using Ctrl Shift E. And here we can click on this icon to create a new file and we can call it a style dot CSS. Uh, the file is created, but it is completely empty. And also before using it, we need to add a link to this file within the HTML code. So we need to come back to HTML file and at the top, under the title tag, we need to add a link tag. And uh, the link tag is going to be a relationship between the HTML file and the style.css. And the href attribute is the address of the file. And in this case, it's a style.css because the files are located at the same directory. So now we can start styling our project. Let's bring the Visual Studio Code on the left side and our website on the right side so we can code and see it on the real time. First, we start with the body section. I want to remove the default margin. And uh, let's create set the margin to zero and also padding to zero because we have a default margin and padding. Now uh, let's change the font family. I want the font family to be Arial, but if the Arial is not available, we want to use sans serif. It should be Arial. Okay. As you can see, the font is changed. And we can just use it like that. After the body section, we're going to work on the header. If you look at the final version, you can see that we have a header and inside the header, we have H1 tag. So we just target the header first. And we change the background color. Now let's accept these things actually. These are these suggestions are coming from GitHub Copilot. As you can see, we got this suggestion and they brought it in the center and also add some padding of 20 pixels around the element and bring it to the center using text align center. But well, let's change the background color to 0 C2461. And uh, after the header, we just let's target the H1 tag. I want to make the max width. Sorry, the margin. I want to set the margin to zero. And also I want to set the font size to 36 pixels. Okay, so this one looks okay. Now let's uh, install this container. We have a container in the HTML file that is covering everything. There is a container here, as you can see, which if you look at the final version, it has a maximum width, so it never goes more than that. And also it's different, it has a different behavior in different sizes. So now we just uh, target that container here. We just say dot container. And uh, the one of the things I want to do, uh, the margin is fine. Uh, the, I want to make the margin zero and left and right to be auto. And also I want to set the max width to be 1200 pixels. So this way, it's always going to be in the middle with this much size in the left and right. And then let's add some padding of 20 
pixels to push everything inside for 20 pixels. After that, we're going to target the recipe uh, list. This one, UL tag. It has an ID. Let's see. Yeah, it has an ID. We can add a class name too. We can add a class of recipe list. So we can target this one using dot recipe list. And this is going to... Uh, first thing first, I want to remove the list style. Because we have a dot here, as you can see, dot, dot, dot. We want to set it to be none. So we, we remove these dots. And we set the margin and padding to zero. So we don't have any space around it. And then let's style the li inside it. This li, which is the recipe item. So we can target the recipe item. Recipe dash item. So what we want to do here, we want to set the display to flex. So bring everything next to each other like this. And then we want to bring them to the center using align item center. This is going to bring them in the center vertically. And then we want to add a space between them. So we just say justify content, a space between. And uh, let's add some margin at the bottom. Margin bottom. This is going to be 20 pixels. And then let's add some box shadow. The box shadow, we want to add some shadow effect. Zero for the X, X, 12 pixels for the Y set. Five pixels for blurness. And we use RGBA to have some shadow effect like this. RGBA stands for red, green, blue, and alpha. So for the red, we set zero, zero for green, uh, for blue, zero. And we just set 20% uh, transparency for the uh, black color because 000 gives us black. And then we just add this kind of shadow now. We can, now we have the shadow. Let's add some border radius, for example, five pixels. And uh, in order to see the effects of the border radius in the corners, we can just remove the overflow and we just set the overflow to hidden as, as you can see now the image has the corner as well okay so that was it for the recipe item now we want to install the image inside it so we just say recipe item image as you can see we got the suggestion so we're going to make the image a smaller uh, instead of 100 i want to make it 150 and then object fix uh, cover is going to uh, make a uh, stretch the image so it can be always at the same spec ratio and after that we're going to install this uh, h2 tag the recipe one recipe two so we're going to just target the recipe item H2 and here we're going to remove the margin that's just fine so margin 0 
we set the font size to be 20 pixels and then we add some 10 pixels padding so as you can see and also we want to set the mean width to uh, sorry mean width minimum width to be 200 pixels so add some space you know in case we have a longer uh, recipe name and then we're going to target the paragraphs that we have so we just a dot recipe item paragraph So we remove the margin, we set some, the, as you can see, 10 pixels padding, we set the font size to be 16, we don't need it because 16 is a default font size, and the color is this color, uh, we can remove the color too, but it looks good too, we can just keep the color, okay. And then the, finally, we want to target the anchor tag, this tag, the button. So let's accept the suggestion, see the, uh, what we can do with that. So the background color is good. We have a color of white. We have some padding, 10 pixels and 20 pixels for the left and right. Instead of this, we can just add a minimal width. So we can just say minimum width. And we set this stone to be, for example, 150 pixels. And we set the padding of 10 pixels as well. It looks like that. And uh, we have used the text decoration none to remove some uh, underlying effect, text ref, which make it the uppercase. We set the font size to be 14. And also we have added a, pr a transition on the background color that we haven't applied yet. So we need to add the hover effect so hover effect is going to change the color of this background uh, for example we make it a different color of 1e3799 which is a brighter color and also the, ch the color is already white we don't need it this transition is going to add some smooth effect on this changing color. Okay. So now we have this one. It looks like this in the uh, big size. But we want to make this one responsive on the smaller size. This was for the larger screen. Now we want to target the a smaller size so we need to add a media query which is going to target the sizes like the less than 768 pixels and uh, for the recipe item we want to change the flex direction to column or we can just change the flex wrap to wrap this is going to bring everything based on the size on top of each other as you can see so the bigger size we have they go on top of each other but we can use the flex direction column this is going to bring everything on top of each other no matter of the size of the screen it's up to you, you can use 
different methods. I think we have an extra. Let's uh, remove it. So after the recipe item, let's target the image. We want to set the image, the width to be 100% and height to be, I set it to be auto actually, it's nicer. It's bigger. And then we set some margin bottom of 10 pixels. Okay. Then uh, after the image, we're going to set the H2 tag, we set the font size to be 20 pixels, padding of 0, and we add some margin at the bottom of 10 pixels. Finally, let's uh, install the paragraph, which is going to have margin bottom of 10 pixels and font size to be 14 pixels. And the anchor tag is going to have a width of 100%, so the this one is going to be 100%. And in order to bring this text to the center, uh, we can just, uh, we can remove the margin bottom. And then we can use text align center to bring the text in the center like this. But for the, for example, title, we can just set the text align. Instead of center, we just say a start. I, th I think it's already a start, but it has some weird padding, actually. Let's see the final version. So yeah, let's go apply this one to the container too. So for the container, I want to set the max width to be 90%. Okay, so this is going to add some 10% left and right. The reason you see this uh, recipe is because the title actually it has the, because it's a small title, it looks like this. If you, the title is a real title, you can see it completely come to the left side. So let's con uh, complete this website using JavaScript. If we see any problem with the CSS, we can come back and fix it. But for now, this one looks good. And this is a small size, the big size looks like this. As you can see the transition between the small and big size. Great. So that was it for styling the project using CSS. We have a style it first for the big size and then for the mobile size we have added a media query and set it the maximum width to be 768 pixels. And then based on that we have just a, a style everything based on the mobile size that we prefer. So that was it for the CSS section. In the next section, we're going to work on the uh, JavaScript part and we're going to fetch data from an API called, I think it's called Espanicular, something like that. I'm, I'm going to teach you how to 
get the API key from this website and uh, get the information and show it inside the website based on that I'm going to and and then it's, this is going to be random and each time you refresh the page you said and you get different elements and also you're going to learn how to create an element how to add the element to another element using JavaScript so see in the next section for the JavaScript part of the project All right, in the last section, we have completed the CSS part of the project. In this section, we're going to work on the JavaScript part and add functionality to the website and get the real data instead of these hard-coded values that we have created inside the index.html file. So the first thing we need to do is to create a JavaScript file inside our project. So we go back to Visual Studio Code and we can open the Explorer section using Ctrl Shift E. And here we can just create a new file and we call it index.js. And we need to add a link to this file within the HTML code. So we need to come back to index.html and just at the end of the body tag, we need to add a script tag with the address of index.js because both files are located at the same tree, uh, same directory we have put the src index.js and also we have put the in the script tag at the end of the body tag because we need all elements of the HTML to be loaded first and then we add functionality to them so the first things we need to do is to uh, create and initialize a function. So we're going to create a function and we call it init. And we're going to call this function here. So once the person come to the website, this is going to trigger this function and this is going to fetch new data from the API. So here we're going to create a constant and we call it recipe recipes. And this is going to be equal to wait because we want to wait for the result and then show it. So we just say get recipes. We create a call a function called get recipes. And as we are using await, we need to change this function to asynchronous, which means that this part is going to be weighted. And then we go to the next line. And then now we have to create this function, which is going to be asynchronous as well, because we need to use asyncs here too. So asynchronous function called get recipes which is going to get the information from the API. So what the API we, we want to use is there is a website called Spunicular. Spunicular. You just search Spunicular on the Google and in the search results you see a website called Spunicular and this is a food API and recipe API. We need to sign up for the API to get the API key. So I'm just going to uh, go and start now. Just create an email. Enter your email. I'm going to enter my email. Create a password for it. And then by checking the their terms of service, we can just sign up. So we now we got sign up to this website. 
we can just go and uh, uh, we need to confirm our email so we go to gmail i think came here to the promotion you just uh, click here to confirm your account so the now it's confirmed i just need to put my email again and go to the website Okay. So after logging in, we go to our dashboard, as you can see. And then here, we see that we have uh, our profile here. And then we can get our API key here inside the profile. So we can just uh, generate a new one. Uh, we can click here we just copy this api key and we go back to our website and here at the top i'm gonna create a new constant called api underline key up uppercase and this is going to be equal to that API key that we have copied. We just need to put it inside a double quote. Now we can just fetch the data from this API. We just say const response. We create a response constant. Response. And this is going to be equal to await because we need to wait for the result and we need uh, to use a method called fetch. And inside this fetch, we, we are going to put our API URL, which is going to be as follows, HTTPS clone forward slash API dot exponentular. dot com forward slash recipes and then forward slash random because we want to get the random result and the number of things we want to get so you add a question mark number equals 10 we want to get 10 results and then here we can just add our api key we just add an and here first is a question mark the first query and then we have the second query which is API key which is equal to the API key that we have created at the top we can add a variable here using dollar sign and a set of curly braces and just write down API key and you need to use a backtick here instead of single code this is backtick backtick is, backtick is located on the top of the tab key so once you create the fetch data we can just get the data we just create a constant called data and this is going to await and uh, we just convert this response to a json file so we can use it in our website so we just say json json is a method javascript method to convert a, a string to json and then now we can return the response data dot response is a recipes so we are, we're going to get the data and the recipes is inside this uh, array called recipes. So if we now console log this recipes here, so we just go here and console log recipes. And then 
if you go to our website let's close these things we don't need them anymore and open the console using F12 let's refresh the page as you can see we got 10 results here and each of them they have kind of information we let's review what they have for example they have ingredients so we need for our ingredient part we have an image for example if i copy this image and put it here we see the image so each recipe has an image it has a source so if you go for example to this source this is going to get the full information about the recipe if it's vegan, vegetarian, and everything else, you can see the, uh, for example, this is a vegetarian. And so we're going to use this kind of information to fill our website, the recipe name. We're going to fill the ingredients. Also, we want to uh, fill the uh, website URL. So when we click on it, we go to that particular website so instead of console logging we're going to display the recipe so I'm going to create a function I call it display recipe and then I'm going to pass this recipe data as an input of this function and let's create that function at the top uh, this function doesn't need to be asynchronous because it doesn't have any a weight inside it so I'm going to create the function call it display recipes we get the input which is recipes and here we're going to uh, create if you remember we have we have our recipe list UI which includes recipe item we want to fill this recipe list with a new list and each of them is going to be one of the uh, recipes we get from this uh, API so first the recipe list which we can get using a method called get element by ID so because it has an ID of recipe list we can just go here and just create a constant and we call it recipe list element and this is going to be equal to document because we want to target all the document all the browser and we use a method called get element by id and the id we want to get is recipe dash list so we have this element first we make it first we make it empty so we just say recipe place element dot enter html is going to be an empty string so if you go to our website now it's completely empty because it's a, an empty string after calling that function but we want to fill it with something else so this recipe that we get it's not only one it's 10 recipes so we can use for each method to get to get each of them so we use for each method for each method is going to give us each recipe so this is a singular recipes recipe and then when we have each recipe we're going to create the elements the li elements so we just say recipe item element this is going to be equal to document dot create this time we use create element and the elements we want to create is li so we created like this so we we create this li element but we want to add this class to it too the class of recipe item so what we do here we just say this element that is created let's uh, add a class list to it 
we just say class list dot add and then we add the a recipe item name as a class list and when we created this we can add it to this recipe list element okay so here at the end we just say recipe list element dot append child and the child we want to append is this recipe item element here so this is going to add this li with this class to this recipe list but this is completely empty we don't have anything else we have to add the image we have to add the other things as well so the first things i want to add so you can see the results is the image so after that we're going to create the recipe image element let's create it using the same method document.create element and instead of li we want to create img an image tag then we want to add the source to it if you remember in html we have the image and then we have the src it's which is the source first we hard coded a value but we want to give, put it a real value which is coming from the api and each of them the recipe dot image it has recipe dot image so now we have created this src we have created this image we have created its src uh, let's add the also the alt value alternative text and this is just uh, for now we just say recipe recipe image later we can make it dynamic and then now we want to add this one to this li we add it to this li element which is going to be added finally to the list which is a ul so let's add this recipe let's copy this and we use a pen child method sorry we have to append child to this one to this li which is recipe item element we want to append the child of this recipe image element so we use this recipe image element we have created that we had we have added the src we have added the alt tag now we have added that one to the recipe item element which is the li tag and then after that we have added the li tag to the this ul tag so now uh, let's see what we see what's this error let me check uh, there is a, a spelling mistake here recipe image element it looks okay for me that's fine let's check the website now we got the image of 10 uh, 10 of them uh, we have added that so if you refresh the page each time we get 10 new elements okay 10 new images because keep, keep going get the random images so we have created the image part we just can continue doing the same things for the ingredients we can do it for the title and also for the link so it is going to be very similar so i highly recommend you pause the video and do the rest of the projects yourself because you already know how to do it otherwise you just just uh, keep watching the video i'm gonna do all of them now okay so let's create the next element which is going to be recipe title 
element and this is going to be document dot create element and we're going to create an element of h2 tag so this element is going to be h2 and inside it this is going to be the we just if we want to change its inner we can just say in a text we're going to change the text inside it to be recipe dot title okay and then we want to uh, append it too so we're going to copy this one and i want to append this title as well to this a recipe item now we see the title too okay so we have the title we have the image and if you refresh the page each time we get a new title and image okay next we want to do the ingredients ingredient it, it's a bit different because ingredients it's not one it's uh, an array of ingredients so we need to map through the ingredients and then connect them together so we just say ingredient element or ingle ingredients element because it's plural and this is going to be equal to document dot create element and the elements we want to create is a paragraph now we want to change its inner html so we just say recipe ingredient in el dot inner html is going to be equal to because we want to make it dynamic we add a backtick and inside the backtick we're going to have if you remember we had a strong tag for the title we just say strong we, inside we're gonna say ingredient ingredients equal let's close this strong tag And then we're going to have the dynamic variable using dollar sign and a set of curly braces. And all the ingredients is inside recipe dot extended extended ingredients. So just make sure you don't make a spelling mistake. Ingredients. And then, as I mentioned before, because it's not only one ingredient, we need to map through it. So we just say dot map. You cannot use for each method because for each method does not return an array, but map method returns an array. So we get each ingredient here. And each ingredient inside it is inside ingredient dot original now that we got the tree together it's an array so we can just connect them together so when we get all of them we can just connect them together using dot join but we want to join them by comma and a space so if we now we have created this element let's add it here as a child so i'm going to paste this one here too so if you refresh the page so we are getting an error probably we made some a spelling mistake so i'm going to check again so this is going to be recipe dot extended in green the ends 
So that one looks good. Ingredients. And then we just map to it. We got each ingredient. And this is going to be ingredient dot original. That is fine. Uh, and then we join them together with uh, this one. And also we have closed this. Okay. So let's check the error view. Let's con open the console. Let's refresh the page. Cannot read the value on the find. Okay. So let me re remove this one for now. They say the, re uh, the error is related to that one or something else. Let's refresh. Now we are getting that error. I think I'm, I got the, I'm getting the 402 error. I think it's a too much request error. So let me check. Okay. So let me pause the video. I changed my API key and then I'm going to do it again because I have requested too many times. So they're going to block me for a while. So it happens sometimes. So you need to just change your API key or something like that. All right, so I have changed my API key. Now it's working. So what we do now is going to be, let's remove these comments so we can test the ingredient as well. So now we are getting the ingredients too. As you can see, for some of the some of the recipes they don't have an image, so it's gonna mess up. But now we have the ingredients, so it's working now. If it happens to you again, you can create another account or you can wait for another day because they have a limit of API requests daily, so you can just to, to try it another day. But because I'm teaching now, we are refreshed too much, it happens to me. But if you do it one time, never happens. All right, so let's keep continue. I'm just going to finish the project by adding the anchor tag too. So uh, we just create, uh, we can create another document. So let's copy this. Uh, so let's create the last one, which is recipe uh, link element which is going to be equal to document that create element. And this is going to be an anchor tag. And finally we have, we're going to add the href for this anchor tag, which is going to be equal to recipe dot source URL. And also we want to have the text inside it, which is going to be dot inner text, which is going to say view recipe. Okay. And then we're going to add it to this item. So I'm going to copy this one and put it here as a child of the item. So now we have this icon, it's this button too. So if you click on it, this is going to show you, let me find a website. Okay. Let's refresh the page. I want to find a good foot to show you. Okay, most of them is from this website for this stuff. For example, the first one, the 10 minutes brownie, you can just click on the on it and go for it. Some of the links are broken, but it is going to work anyway. So 
it's fine so you can you can see the link actually here at the bottom each of them has a different link all right so we have created this website let's now when you finish your uh, javascript you can just delete it all the hard-coded values for example this from here we can remove all these lists so i'm gonna just keep it for your reference so i'm gonna just uh, use control forward slash to comment it so now each time you come you don't see anything else you just uh, see an ingredient okay so that was it for our project i hope you enjoyed and learned many things we have work and learn how to get, grab some data from an api like the spoonicular website uh, and also we have learned how to create an element, how to add an element as a child of another element. And also we have learned how to uh, initialize a website, create a function and call another function inside another one. So here let's review what we have done. We have got the API key and also we have created the elements here. First, we have created the li element and we have added a class list to it. And then we have created an image element. We have added the src and all alternative tags. We have created an h2 tag, a paragraph, and also an anchor tag. And finally, we have added all of them to this recipe element recipe item and finally we have added the item to the ul which is a recipe list element and also we have learned how to fetch data using the fetch method so that was it for our project i hope you enjoyed see you in the next project welcome back to another project in this project, we are going to create a tip calculator. As you can see from the final version of the project, we have a container here with the title tip calculator. Then we have two inputs, including the bill amount and the tip percentage. For example, we can choose $100 bill amount and the tip percentage of 20%. And if we click on the calculate, this is going to calculate the total number of amount that the customer should pay to that uh, store for example so as you can see we have designed this ca calculator tip calculator using css in a modern design then we have used javascript to get these two elements the value of these two inputs and calculate the total amount based on these inputs and also we're going to add some event listener to this button to trigger function, which is going to calculate these amounts. In the next section, we're going to start with the HTML part of the project. So see you in the next section. All right, let's start our project. In this section, we're going to work on the HTML part of the project. As you can see, we have put the final version here for our comparison. As you can see, there is a container in the middle with the title tip calculator. Then we have two inputs. One is bill amount, one is tip percentage. And finally, we have a button to calculate this. The first things we need to do is to create a folder and we're going to open this folder inside the Visual Studio Code. So I'm going to create a new folder. I'm going to call it the name of our project, which is tip-calculator. And once we have created this folder, we can just open it inside the Visual Studio Code by right click and click on open with code so now we have this folder as a default folder of the explorer section of visual studio code as you can see tip calculator 
let's close the welcome tab and here we just create a new file and we call it index.html and once we have created the html file now we need to just create the html5 boilerplate which we can achieve by just adding an exclamation mark if you have uh, activated your emit abbreviation you you should see this suggestion and if you press on tab you're gonna get the html5 boilerplate let me explain this one real quick we have here doc type which is which tells the browser which version of html we are using as we are using html5 we just need to have html here in the opening tag then we have the HTML tag, which covers the head and the body section. The opening uh, tag of the HTML has a, a length attribute, which defines the language of the page. And as we are using English, we, ch we just need to write down EN for the language, which stands for English. Then we have the head tag, which covers the metadata tag and also the title tag. The metadata tags, the first one relates to the chart set attribute and for HTML5, UTF-8 is recommended because it nearly contains all the characters and symbols. Then we have the compatibility metadata tag, which tells the Internet Bro Explorer browser to use the most recent rendering engine, which is Edge. Then we have the viewport metadata tag, which sets the width of the screen, width of the browser to the device's width. For example, the person who is using mobile will have a smaller browser width than the person who is using desktop or tablet. And here the initial skill is, uh, is the initial zoom level of the browser, which is set to be 100% by default. And after that, we have the title document. So let's open the visual, uh, let's open this website inside the browser using the extension that we have installed and uh, which is called live server. So if you click on this go live, this is going to open it inside the visual, inside the browser, the default browser, which is in my case, Google Chrome. And uh, you can see that it is open in the port 5500 and the file is called index.html and then the title is document. Let's bring the website to the right side and the Visual Studio Code on the left side and let's change this title to the name of our project which is Tab Calculator. As you can see now the title is changed to Tab Calculator. After that we're going to have uh, inside the body section, we're going to have a container which is going to cover everything. So I'm going to add a div with a class of container by just writing down dot container. And if we press enter, we're going to create a div with a class of container. And here we're going to have an h1 tag saying tip calculator. After the H1 tag, as you can see, we're going to have a paragraph and inside the paragraph, we're going to say enter the fill amount and tip percentage to calculate the total. After the paragraph, we're going to have two inputs and each input is going to have a label. So I'm going to add a label and this is going to be for the bill. So we just say for bill and then the name uh, inside the label, we're going to say bill 
come out. After that, we're going to have a input with the type of numbers. So just say type number. And this input, as you can see, we can now change this value inside the input. After that, we're going to have a line break. We just say BR. We add a line break. This is, should be like that. And then we're going to have another uh, label. And this label is going to be for the tip, which is going to say tip percentage. And this is going to be number as well, the input with the type of number. So in order to uh, the distinguish between these inputs, you know, later using JavaScript, I'm going to add an ID for the first one and then call it build. And for the second one, I'm going to add an ID saying tip. And then after the inputs, the second input, I'm going to add another line break. And then we're going to add the button. So we're going to have a button with the ID of calculate. So I'm going to add a hashtag for the ID. We just say calculate and we press enter. This is going to create a button with the idea of calculate. And inside the button, we're going to say just calculate. So we see the button now. After the button, we're going to have another line break. So I'm going to copy this. And after the but here, we're going to have another label for the total. Saying total. And this is going to be an span, not an input, because we don't want to change its value. And it's, this is going to they just have an ID of total. Okay. Yeah, that was it for the HTML part of the project. As you can see, we have just added the H1 tag here. Paragraph. Two inputs with the labels. And a calcul calculate button. And finally, another label for total. In the next section, we're going to work on the CSS part of the project and we're going to style it like the one in the final version with this beautiful modern design with the box shadow. And uh, we're going to create these uh, beautiful hovering effect for the button. So see you in the next section for the CSS part of the project. All right, in the last section, we have completed the HTML parts of the project. In this section, we're going to start the project using CSS. The first thing we need to do is to create a CSS file here. So I'm going to create a new file here by opening the Explorer section using Ctrl Shift E. And here we can click on this icon to create a new file called style.css. Before using the CSS file, we need to add a link to this file within the HTML code. So we need to come back to index.html and inside the head tag, at the end of the title tag, we're going to add a link tag. We just write down link and then click on the one with the CSS. This is going to create a link tag with the relationship between the HTML file and the CSS style sheet. 
and the address is a solid CSS because the, the both files are located at the same directory. So now we can install our project. First, we start with the set the body style. We just, uh, because we want to install some input, when you have an input, you need to add this at the top of your CSS, which is box sizing, border box. This is going to help you to install the boxes like inputs better because this is going to calculate the extra borders and the space around this input. After that, we're going to target the body section. I'm going to change the background color to something like light gray, which is F2, F2, F2. As you can see, the color is changed. So the CSS file is working. And after that, we're going to change the font family to something called Hela Helvetica. Helvetica. And if this font is not available, I'm going to use sans serif instead. Okay. So we have just uh, installed the body section. Now we're going to start with the container. This container, this div with a class of container, which is going to be in all sections. So if you see the final version, this is the container we have. So for the container, because it has a class of container, we can target that one using dot container. We open a set of curly braces. First thing first, we're going to change its background color to white. Okay. And then we're going to set a maximum width of 600 pixels. As you can see, it's smaller now, but it's not in the center. So what I want to do here is to create a margin. So I just say margin 100 pixels, top and bottom and uh, left and right to be auto. So it's, this is going to have an equal margin to the left and right. And uh, if you remove the zoom level now, because it has 200 level percent zoom. So if you remove it, as you can see the box is this size. And then we're going to have some padding, which is the space inside and around the element inside this container, which is going to be 20 pixels. And let's add some box shadow. So let's add some shadow fact. So zero and zero for X and Y, but 10 pixels for blurness. So you can see we get the blurness in all direction. And let's change the color of the shadow to be R an RGBA, which is the red, green, blue, and alpha. And here we set the red to be zero, green zero, blue zero, which is stands for black. And for the alpha, I'm going to set it to be 0.2, which is 20% transparency. As you can see the shadow. And now we're going to change the border radius, and add some border around the corners of 10 pixels. Okay. Looks fine. In the mobile size, we have some margin too. That is nice. And uh, that's it for the container. Next things we want to style is this H1 tag. 
which is saying tip calculator. So I'm going to go outside this container. I'm going to target the H1 tag here. And then let's add the margin top of zero. We remove the margin at the top, connect it to the wall, and we bring it to the center using text align center. That's it. That's it for the what, H1. The next things we want to style is the input, these two inputs here. So we're going to target these two inputs by just saying input. So let's add some padding, padding of 10 pixels. Then we're going to have a border. of one pixels solid which is going to be a line and then the color would be CCC which is a kind of gray color after that let's add some border radius and we set it to be four pixels So we make it rounded in the corner and then we, let's add some margin of 10 pixels up and down and zero for left and right. And, so, and then I want it to be in the all direction, all the screen. So I'm gonna set the width to be 100%. Okay, as you can see, we have two beautiful inputs can change the numbers. Okay, and then the the next things we want to style the button is this button. We're going to target the button simply by just saying button. So let's change its background color. We just say background and the color I want to use is 4 C A F. 50 and then let's change the color of the text to be white we also want to add some padding of 10 pixels let's remove the border so we set the border to be none and uh, let's make the cursor to be pointers so when we hover over it we see a pointing hand in the mouse effect and then we're going to have some margin top and bottom 10 pixels and zero for left and right and we set the width to be 100 percent like this So we have all, I have added everything now. So we can just make the text bigger. For example, you can just change the font size to be 18 pixels. And then we can just make it uppercase. For example, we just say text transform to be uppercase. Okay, that's it for the button. The other thing you want to add to the button is when I hover over it, I want to see the color to be different. So I'm going to ch add a pseudo effect of hover pseudo effect. So we just say hover. And for the hover effect, I want to change its background color this time to 45049. 45A049. This color. So, and if you want it to be smooth, you can just add a transfer transition for the background 
color. So you just copy this. And then we just added 0.3 seconds with ease effect. You can see a little bit smoother. Okay. 0.2 would be enough. And the last things we want to install is this total. The total amount. And uh, we're going to target that. Because the total is inside an spam and the ID of total, we can target that one using the ID of total. We just want to change the font size to be 24 pixels and font weight to be bold. And finally, we set some margin top of 10 pixels. Okay. You cannot see it yet. We need to add some values here. For example, I just say 1000. We see the value here that's bold. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to delete this one because late in the next section, based on the input, we're going to calculate the total amount using JavaScript. So we're going to first thing first, we want to get the value of these two inputs. And then when we click on the button, we're going to calculate the a total amount and show it inside this span all using JavaScript. So see you in the next section for the JavaScript part of the project. All right, in the last section, we have completed the CSS part of the project. In this section, we're going to work on the JavaScript and add functionality to the to the project and just make it work with the inputs and show it uh, inside the total, like the one in the final version. For example, here, if you choose $1,000 bill with 20% tip, the total is going to be 1,200. So the first things we need to do is to create a JavaScript file. So I'm going to open the Explorer section using Ctrl Shift E. And here I'm going to write down index.js to create a J JavaScript file. Before using the JavaScript file, we need to add a link to this file inside the HTML code. It should be inside the body section and at the end of the body section because we all the contents need to be loaded first and then we're going to manipulate it using JavaScript. So I'm going to add a script tag. I just write down SC and I'm going to click on the second auto suggestion, the one with the SRC and the SRC, which is the source address is index.js because both files are at the same directory. So now let's close the Explorer section. The first things we need to do is to add an event listener to this button with the ID of calculate. So here I'm going to bring in, bring in the button. I'm just going to call it BTN element. And we're going to target that one inside the document because we want to target all the browser and then we're going to use a method called get element by ID. I'm going to pass the ID, which is calculate. Now we have this element. We can just add the event listener to it. So we're just going to target this BTN element we have and we add an add event listener to it. And the event we want to listen is click. So when we click on it, we want to trigger a function and uh, we can just create the function here or we can just call the function. For example, we're going to call the function a uh, calculate total. 
And then I'm going to call uh, create the function here. So I'm going to create the function. I'm going to call it calculate total. So for now, we just console log. For example, we just console log clicked. So let's open the console using F12. We go to console, let's clear the console. And now, let me, if I click on calculate, this is going to console log clicked. So this is working. After testing the function to be working, instead of just console logging, we're going to get the value of these elements like bill amount, tip percentage. First, we need to bring these elements. So they are inside an input. The first input is this input for the bill. It has an ID of bill. So I'm going to uh, go to the JavaScript and then I'm going to create a constant. And uh, first, I want to call it bill input. And this is going to be equal to similar document that get element by ID, but the ID is bill or bill. So we can copy this one and make it for the tip too. So we just say tip and the ID is tip. So we have access to these two inputs now. We can just uh, get their value. So I'm just going to say const bill value. This is going to be equal to this bill input and we target its value. So now if I console log, if I console log bill value and if I open the console again using F12, I just change the value here. For example, I just say 2000 something. If I click on calculate, we can get the value of this bill here. So whatever value we have, for example, 32 calculate, we get 32 because we are console logging the value of the bill. Let's do the same things for the tip. So I'm going to change this bill using control D to tip. So we get the value of the tip as well. Now we can calculate the total. We just say total value is going to be equal to this formula. We're just going to multiply this bill value to 1 plus tip value divided by 100. So whatever the tip value is, we divide it by 100 and uh, we add 1 to it and then we multiply it to bill value. So now if we console log total value, for example, we have a $100 bill with 20% tip, the total is going to be 120. So let's test it. So if we calculate, as you can see, the total value is 120. If the percentage is 10, this is going to be 110. But as you can see, we are getting some uh, weird numbers. This is the JavaScript problem. Uh, but we can fix this one as well because this is the base on the binary values. So now, instead of console logging, I'm going to bring the input as well, this uh, total at the top, I'm going to bring the total. So I'm going to copy this one. I want to change this to total a spam. And then this is going to be total. 
So now we have access to this element. So instead of just console logging, we can change the total spam inner text to be equal to this total value. Okay. So now if we change, to, for example, we just say 100 and we just say 20%, the total is 120. If it's 10, this is going to be 110, but some uh, values here. So we can fix this one. We just add uh, a method called to fixed. Okay, to fixed, and then we just fix it to two digits maximum. So I'm going to say again 100, 10. This is going to show it like this 110 and zero, for example, cents. If you do it, for example, 2.5%, this is going to be $102.50. All right, so that was it for our project. I hope you enjoyed and learned many things. We have learned how to bring the elements, how to add an event listener to it, and how to calculate the value based on the inputs and uh, how to print the value inside the output, which is our total span. So see you in the next project. Welcome back to another project. In this project, we're going to create an age calculator. As you can see from the final version of the project, we have a container here with the title age calculator with an input of a date. For example, if you click on here, we can choose the date of our birthday. For example, I choose so something in, in 2022. And if you click now, on calculate age you can see the age is calculated based on this date and saying your age is 21 years old what we want to do next firstly we want to create the html part of the project and then we're going to work on the css and make this modern design and finally using javascript we're going to dynamically create this age based on the input that the user provides so see you in the next section for the HTML part of the project. All right, let's start our project. In this section, we're going to work on the HTML part of the project. I also put the final version here for our comparison so we can we know what to do in each step. So the first things we need to do is to create a folder inside your computer. For in my case, I want to create it inside my desktop. So I'm going to create a folder. I'm going to call the folder the name of our project, which is age calculator. Once you created this folder, you can just right click and click on open with code to open it with your Visual Studio code. And here you can close the welcome tab. And as you can see, the age calculator folder is the default folder now for our Visual Studio code. Now we can just click here on this icon to create a new file or we can right click and click on new file. And we call the file index.html. So we have an empty file here. We can just use an exclamation mark to have an HTML5 boilerplate. So now, as you can see, we have doc type, which tells the browser which version of HTML we are using. As we are using HTML5, we just need to have HTML here. Then we have the HTML tag, which has the lang attribute, which sets the language of the page to English in our case. 
Then we have the head tag, which has the metadata tags and also the title tag. The first metadata tag sets the charts set attribute, and it is recommended to be UTF-8 by HTML5 because UTF-8 actually contains all the characters and symbols so the users won't have any problem seeing our website characters and symbols then we have the compatibility metadata tag which tells the internet explorer browser to to use the most recent rendering engine which is microsoft edge the next metadata tag is the viewport which sets the browser's width to device's width. For example, if you're using mobile screen, the, the width of the browser would be smaller than if you're using desktop or tablet, for example. And here the initial scale is the initial zoom level of the browser, which is set to be 100%. Then we have the title, which is document. In order to see this inside the browser, we can use the extension live server. If you haven't installed it, you just open the extension using Ctrl Shift X and just search for live server. And uh, this is the extension you need to install. You just click on it and click on install. I have already installed it, so I have it in my browser then we just click here and go live to open it inside the browser this is going to open it inside the, your default browser which is in my case is google chrome now let's bring the website on the left the right side and the visual studio code on the left side so you can see the changes in real time you can see the title is document we can change the title now to age calculator and you can see that it's changing because i have enabled my auto save so anytime i type something this is going to uh, save it and here show it simultaneously inside the browser after that we're going to go inside the body section and we add a container for example, in the final version, we have a container here, which has a white background, but the body is a gray. So we're gonna have this container by adding a div with a class of container. So if you just write down dot container, this is going to suggest you a div with a class of container. If you press tab or enter, you're gonna accept that suggestion after that, we have an H1 tag saying age calculator. And uh, after that, I don't know. We're going to have a div with a class of form. And inside this div we're going to have a label like this enter your date of birth and then we have an input and finally we have a button so we're going to have a label and this is going to be for the birthday And the labor is going to say enter your date of birth. After the labor, we're going to have the input, but the type of the input is going to be uh, date. So this is going to change the date. So you can just click here and change the date. As you can see, this is the HTML input with the type of date. And for the input, we're going to have an ID of birthday.
And also we're gonna have a name of birthday. Okay. So we have the input and finally we're going to have a paragraph with the idea of result which is going to show the results for us. For example, we just for now, we just hard code your age is, for example, 21 years old. Okay. So now we have just hard coded these things, but uh, later we're going to use JavaScript to calculate the age based on the birth birthday, and then we're going to neck in the next section we're going to style it and make it like the final version with the container in the center, with the hovering effect for the button, and also we're going to bring them on top of each other like this. So that was it for the HTML part of the project. In the next section, we're going to work on the CSS part. So see you in the next section. All right, in the last section, we have completed the HTML part of the project. In this section, we're going to style the project using CSS. So we're going to design it like the final version. We're going to create the container and bring it to the center. So the first things we need to do is to create a CSS file. So I'm going to open the, my Explorer section using Ctrl Shift E. And here we create a new file and we call it a style.css. Before using the CSS file, we need to add a link to the CSS file within the HTML code. So we need to go to the head tag and just put it somewhere in the head tag. For example, I put it at the end of the head tag after the title tag. I just write down link and I click on the third auto suggestion, the one with the CSS, which is going to give me a link tag with the relationship between the HTML file and the CSS style sheet with the address style.css for the href. So now we can just start styling our project using CSS. First, we start with the body section. First, I remove the default margin. I set it to be zero. So this is going to remove the default margin. Then we add some padding of 20 pixels, which is going to have some space. Let's change the font family to Mont. Serret We need to put this one in a double quote and if this uh, Font is not available. We're gonna use sans serif instead So now we're going to change the background color we're gonna change the background color to a light gray, which is F7, F7, F7. So we have done with the body section. Now we just let's start uh, styling this container, this div with a class of containers. So I'm going to just write down dot container to target that here inside the CSS. And I just want to change the background color to white. You can just write down white or FFF. Let's say, uh, let's add some box shadow. Zero, zero for the X and Y and 20 pixels for the 
Oh, the, I think 10 pixel would be nicer. 10 pixels blurness, and then we can use RGBA, which stands for read. Uh, sorry, red, green, blue, and alpha. And we can just choose zero for red, blue for zero for green and blue for black color, and for the alpha, I just choose. 0.2 which is 20% transparency now we can see the box shadow here then let's add some padding of 20 pixels to add some space inside it uh, let's remove the zoom level so you can see the real sizing and then we're going to have If you open it now, you can see this is all size. I'm going to set the maximum width to be 600 pixels, which is this side. And then from bringing it to the center, I want to add a um, margin of zero for top and bottom and auto for left and right which is going to bring it to the center like this and in the small size still we have the space because we have 20 pixels padding in the body section so that's it for the container now uh, before we forget uh, in the container i want to add some border radius as well so i'm going to add a border radius of five pixels which is going to add a rounded corner for the container after that we're going to style the h1 tag here the heading which is saying h calculator so we just say h1 so i'm going to change the font size to be 36 pixels So I don't know what happened to here. We can use text align center to bring it to the center. And then we can just remove the margin top to zero. And we add some margin bottom of 20 pixels. Okay, that was it for the H1 tag. The next things we want to style is this form. This div with a class of form. So we can target that one just saying dot form. We can change the display to flex to bring everything first next to each other and then we can change the flex direction to column to bring them on top of each other like this and then we can use align item center to align them and bring them to the center like that after the form we're going to target this label we have this label here so we can target that one here by just saying label and then we just say, uh, change the font weight to be bold and we just ch add some margin at the bottom of 20 pixels for example or 10 pixels Okay, that's it for the label and now we can style this input here. So we can target the input by just saying input and let's add some padding of 8 pixels. So we add a space around that. So for the border, I just want the 1 pixel border to be solid. 
it means that it's just a line and then we can use the color CCC which is kind of gray color after that we're going to we can just add a border radius of for example 5 pixels to add a rounded corner and then we can just set the width to be 100% which is going to be in the all here but I can just uh, set the maximum width to be 300 pixels it doesn't go more than 300 pixels so if it's less than 300 pixels it's going to be 100% if it's more than that, it's going to be 300 pixels. And then, uh, I think that's enough for this. Okay. So after this uh, input, we're going to style the button here I don't know I have added the button or not so we missed the button actually we have to add a button here after this input we're going to have a button and the button is going to say calculate H like this so now we can just style the button by just targeting the button and uh, let's add some background color the background color I want to add is 007 B FF let's change the color to be white the the text color to be white so we can see it better and then let's remove the border we just set the border to be none and then uh, we can just add some padding in the top and bottom of 10 pixels and left and right to be 20 pixels and then we can just set some border radius to be 5 pixels so we make it rounded in the corner we add some margin at the top of 10 pixels and we set the cursor to be pointer so when we hover over it we see a pointing hand and then also when we hover over the button so we can use the pseudo class hover so we want to have a different background color for example six six uh, sorry zero zero sixty two cc which is kind of darker color and also we can add some transition on the background color for example i want to have a transition of 0.3 seconds bit ease effect so you can see it is uh, smoother and uh, like a transition on it and finally we're going to style this result here which uh, it's a because it's a paragraph with the id of result we can target that one just targeting the id of result and then we just say margin top of 20 pixels we set the font size to be 24 pixels and then we set the font weight to be bold And also we want to, that's it. I think that's enough for this 
one. So now we have done with the, we can bring this one a little bit down by adding the container, uh, some uh, margin top here too, margin top, for example, 50 pixels. So this, this is the website we have built. As you can see, we have the title, we have the, now we have a style, the input, the button, and finally the result. In the next section, we're going to dynamically get the data from the input that we put, calculate the age, and then show it inside the results section using JavaScript. So see the next section for the JavaScript part of the project. All right, in the last section, we have completed the CSS part of the project. In this section, we're going to create and work on the JavaScript part of the project, and we're going to calculate the age based on the birthday of the person who put the information inside this input. So the first things we need to do is to create a JavaScript file. So I'm going to come back to Visual Studio Code. I'm going to open the Explorer section using Ctrl Shift E. And here we create a new file and we call it index.js. And we just need to add a link to it. Uh, let me close the style.css. So inside the index.html, we need to add a script tag, which it's going to call this JavaScript file. And we need to add it at the end of the body section. We just write down SC. We accept the script tag with the SRC of index. .js because the both files are located at the same directory the address would be the just the name of the file the reason we put it at the end is because we want all these things to be loaded first on the browser and then we call the javascript because otherwise we don't have access to these elements using javascript so now first things first we want to add an event listener to this button they calculate age so this button so we need to bring this button here so in order to bring the button to the here we just uh, target the button I can add a button uh, we can add a, an ID here we just say btn for the ID and here we just create a constant, we call it btn element. And this is going to be equal to document because we want to target all the browser. And then we just use get element by ID method. And we pass the name of the ID that we have passed to the button, which is btn. Now we have access to the element. We can just add the event listener to it. We just add an event listener add what is this we add an event listener to it and the event we want to listen is click and then we go we can just call a function after this uh, we can just call the function calculate age and then we can just create the function here we just create a function we call it calculate age just for now i'm going to console log we just console log clicked So now if we just bring this website to the right side and open the console using F12 and here let me clear the console and click on calculate age you see that we are console logging clicked. 
So instead of console logging, I want to calculate the age based on the input. So first things first, we want to get the input information. So the input here has an ID of birthday. So we can bring it here, similar to here. We're just going to copy this using Alt Shift arrow done. I want to change this BTN to using Ctrl D. I want to choose both of them and then just say birthday. This is going to choose this birthday, the ID, and then just put the constant birthday element to it. Now we have access to this. So here first I want to just uh, calculate the inside what we get. We just say birthday. Value. We get the value which is going to be equal to birthday element dot value. Let's uh, console log this birthday value. So now if I change this one, for example, to 4th of April, 4th of April 2023, and then we cal click on calculate age, we just get this 2023-4-4. And if you change, choose something else, you can just choose the any, for example, January 13, 2006. You, you can print it here because we are constantly logging. So we have the, we have calculated the value. And then if the, if no nothing is added as a value, for example, if the bath birthday value is equal to an empty string, we want to just alert please enter a valid of please enter your birthday. So now there is nothing here. If I click calculate age, there is an alert saying, please enter your birthday. So we are going, going to prevent calculating if there is nothing here. Otherwise, if there is something there, we're going to uh, calculate the age. We just say const age is going to be equal to we call a function called get h and then we're just going to pass this value. Okay, so we're going to create this function. Let's create this function get h, which is going to get the birthday value. So we're going to create this function. It is very simple too. So we're going to, uh, first thing first, we want to get the current date, today. Because we want to calculate, we need to subtract the birthday from the current date. So the current date is going to be equal to new date. This is the date is the constructor method from JavaScript. This is going to get the date from the browser. So if I now console log here current date let's remove this if i put something here calculate age as you can see we are getting this current date which is uh, even that gives us the time to 6th of april 2023 11 o'clock and then now Based on this one, if you, for example, you want to just get the year, we just say get full year. If we now console log, let's choose some date so we don't get an error. 
and then let's clear the console and then we just click on calculate age we get 2023 so the same method we can use to get the year from this birthday value so if i console log birthday value dot get full year and then we choose something here we don't get an error so we click on calculate age uh, we should uh, Oh, we, we need to get the, this is the current date. We can just get the birthday, sorry, birthday date to, we need to get it because this is, we need to create a new date, but we need to pass, instead of the date, we just need to pass the uh, birthday value. Now, if we just, uh, get the full year by just passing birthday date dot get full year let's test this one we get 2023 birthday but if you choose for example imagine 1985 if we just click on calculate age we get 1985 okay so now we have the year of this year current date which is here dot get full year and then also we have the birthday year so now we can just subtract that one and calculate the age so we just say const age is equal to current date dot get full year minus birthday date dot get full year okay now if we console log age for example i choose somewhere 1975 we get 48 years old okay but this one is actually not always correct because based on the months, for example, if you look at the time, for example, now it's April 2023 when I'm recording this video. If the uh, birthday is before the April, you're actually one year older than the person who, are, who is born after the April. So we need to calculate the months as well. And then we know that if the person is born after the today or before today. So if it's after today, we have to subtract one from the person. Sorry, before this date, we need to subtract the time. So I'm going to calculate the months too. So I'm going to say cons months. And this is going to be equal. So we, we, just, we just can copy this one. And instead of get full year, I want to use another method, which is get months. Okay. Now we have the months. Now we create a condition here. We just say if. If the months is less than zero for example if something happened and the month is less than zero because uh, this is uh, this if the current date is less than the birthday date so the month is going to be less than zero or if the month is equal to zero it means uh, for example the current date and the birthday is both april but now we have to calculate the day so so uh, after this condition we just say if this one happened and if the current date 
dot get date, which is going to give us the day, is less than the birthday date dot get date. So if the month is equal to zero, but the day is less than that, so in both condition, month less than zero or month equals zero or the day is less than, we're going to decrease the age by one. So we can do it by just saying age minus minus. So we have the age, for example, 24. Age minus minus is going to make it 23. So now this is going to solve the problem and then after that we're going to return return the age we just say return age so this is going to be output of this function get age and we get the age here inside the calculate age so now here we can console log age so let's calculate it for example uh, let's choose, for example, 2012, January 6, 11 years old. But if the, this is April, after April, for example, May, uh, Let's see the error. Oh, because we want to change the age, we cannot use constant. We need to use uh, let here. This should be a variable. Okay. So now uh, let's do it again. Let's test 2012. It was 2012, January. 6 was giving us 11. Now, if we choose after April, for example, October, gives us 10, 10 years old. So that guy is one year younger than the person who is born before the current date. So we are, we are getting a correct age. But we want to show it here inside this instead of just console logging it. So instead of console logging, we're going to get this element from the HTML. So we're going to get the element here because it's a paragraph with the idea of result. We can just target that one. We just create a constant. We call it, for example, result element, which is going to be equal to document dot get element by id and the id is result so now we can just change its text so we just say result element dot uh, inner text is going to be equal to for example we just make a dynamic we just say your age i added the backtick backtick is located on top of the tab key so we just say your age is and then we just add a dollar sign to make the variable we add the age here this variable here And then another dollar sign, because it can be year or years, because if a person is only one year old, you should say you, your age is one year old. But if it's more than one, we should be say your age is, for example, two years old. So I'm going to make a condition here. We just add here, we just say if the age is greater than one,
just to say years otherwise say year and then we add the old at the end okay so if the person is born for example last year February your age is one year old if it's uh, like a l l longer than that for example January 1990 your age is 33 years old okay so we have c accomplished this one using javascript so let's review what we have done so we have got the all the elements using the method called get element by id we have created an event listener here for the button if we click on it we're going to call a function called calculate age and here we just get the birthday value by just setting birthday element dot value if the value is empty, we're going to say enter your birthday. Otherwise, we're going to call another function called get age and pass this value. And uh, we're going to calculate the age based on the current date and the birthday. We're going to calculate the age and we got a condition if the month is less than zero or, or the day is less if the month is equal to zero. We're going to decrease the age by one and we're going to return the age, get the age here. We're going to put the, put this text inside the result element using inner text. And we just make a condition to always write down a correct sentences. All right, that was it for creating this project. I hope you enjoyed and learned many things. See you in the next project.